Chapter Nine, Part One of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Nine, Part One, in the field. Hamilcar had thought that the mercenaries would await him at Utica, or that they would return against him, and finding his forces insufficient to make or to sustain an attack he had struck southwards along the right bank of the river thus protecting himself immediately from a surprise he intended to wink at the revolt of the tribes and to detach them all from the cause of the barbarians then when they were quite isolated in the midst of the provinces he would fall upon them and exterminate them in fourteen days he pacified the region comprised between Tukaber and Utica, with the towns of Tignicaba, Tesura, Vaca, and others further to the west. Zungar built in the mountains, Asura celebrated for its temples, Gerardo fertile in junipers, Thapitis and hangor sent embassies to him the country people came with their hands full of provisions implored his protection kissed his feet and those of the soldiers and complained of the barbarians some came to offer him bags containing heads of mercenaries killed so they said by themselves but which they had cut off corpses for many had lost themselves in their flight and were found dead here and there beneath the olive trees and among the vines on the morrow of his victory hamilcar to dazzle the people had sent to carthage the two thousand captives taken on the battlefield they arrived in long companies of one hundred men each all with their arms fastened behind their backs with a bar of bronze which caught them at the nape of the neck and the wounded bleeding as they still were running also along horsemen followed them driving them on with blows of the whip then there was a delirium of joy people repeated that there were six thousand barbarians killed the others would not hold out and the war was finished they embraced one another in the streets and rubbed the faces of the partaic guards with butter and cinnamon to thank them these with their big eyes their big bodies and their arms raised as high as the shoulder seemed to live beneath their freshened paint and to participate in the cheerfulness of the people the rich left their doors open the city resounded with the noise of the timbrels the temples were illuminated every night and the servants of the goddess went down to malqua and set up stages of sycamore wood at the corners of the crossways and prostituted themselves there lands were voted to the conquerors holocausts to melkarth three hundred gold crowns to the suffet and his partisans proposed to decree him new prerogatives and honours he had begged the ancients to make overtures to Oteritus for exchanging all the barbarians if necessary for the aged giscal and the other carthaginians detained like him the libyans and nomads composing the army under Oteritus knew scarcely anything of these mercenaries who were men of italiot or greek race and the offer by the republic of so many barbarians for so few carthaginians showed that the value of the former was nothing and that of the latter considerable they dreaded a snare Oteritus refused then the ancients decreed the execution of the captives 
although the suffet had written to them not to put them to death he reckoned upon incorporating the best of them with his own troops and thus instigating defections but hatred swept away all circumspection the two thousand barbarians were tied to the stelae of the tombs in the mappalian quarter and traders scullions embroiderers and even women the widows of the dead with their children all who would came to kill them with arrows they aimed slowly at them the better to prolong their torture lowering the weapon and then raising it in turn and the multitude pressed forward howling paralytics had themselves brought thither in hand-barrows many took the precaution of bringing their food and remained on the spot until the evening others passed the night there tents had been set up in which drinking went on many gained large sums by hiring out boughs then all these crucified corpses were left upright looking like so many red statues on the tombs and the excitement even spread to the people of malqua who were the descendants of the aboriginal families and were usually indifferent to the affairs of their country out of gratitude for the pleasure it had been giving them they now interested themselves in its fortunes and felt that they were carthaginians and the ancients thought it a clever thing to have thus blended the entire people in a single act of vengeance the sanction of the gods was not wanting for crows alighted from all quarters of the sky they wheeled in the air as they flew with loud hoarse cries and formed a huge cloud rolling continually upon itself it was seen from clypea rhades and the promontory of hermaneum sometimes it would suddenly burst asunder its black spirals extending far away as in eagle clove the centre of it and then departed again here and there on the terraces the domes the peaks of the obelisks and the pediments of the temples there were big birds holding human fragments in their reddened beaks owing to the smell the carthaginians resigned themselves to unbind the corpses a few of them were burned the rest were thrown into the sea and the waves driven by the north wind deposited them on the shore at the end of the gulf before the camp of oteritus this punishment had no doubt terrified the barbarians for from the top of eskmoun they could be seen striking their tents collecting their flocks and hoisting their baggage upon asses and on the evening of the same day the entire army withdrew it was to march to and fro between the mountain of the hot springs and hipposaritus and so debar the suffet from approaching the tyrian towns and from the possibility of a return to carthage meanwhile the two other armies were to try to overtake him in the south spendius in the east and mato in the west in such a way that all three should unite to surprise and entangle him they then received a reinforcement which they had not looked for narr havas appeared with three hundred camels laden with bitumen twenty-five elephants and six thousand horsemen to weaken the mercenaries the suffet had judged it prudent to occupy his attention at a distance in his own kingdom from the heart of carthage he had come to an understanding with masgaba a gaetulian brigand who was seeking to found an empire strengthened by punic money 
the adventurer had raised the numidian states with promises of freedom but narhavas warned by his nurse's son had dropped into Serta, poisoned the conquerors with the water of the cisterns struck off a few heads set all right again and had just arrived against the suffet more furious than the barbarians the chiefs of the four armies concerted the arrangement for the war it would be a long one and everything must be foreseen it was agreed first to entreat the assistance of the romans and this mission was offered to spendius but as a fugitive he dared not undertake it twelve men from the greek colonies embarked at anaba in a sloop belonging to the numidians then the chiefs exacted an oath of complete obedience from all the barbarians every day the captains inspected clothes and boots the sentries were even forbidden to use a shield for they would often lean it against their lance and fall asleep as they stood those who had any baggage trailing after them were obliged to get rid of it everything was to be carried in roman fashion on the back as a precaution against the elephants mato instituted a corps of cataphract cavalry men and horses being hidden beneath cuirasses of hippototamus skin bristling with nails and to protect the horses hoofs boots of plaited esparto grass were made for them it was forbidden to pillage the villages or to tyrannize over the inhabitants who were not of punic race but as the country was becoming exhausted mato ordered the provisions to be served out to the soldiers individually without troubling about the women at first the men shared with them many grew weak for lack of food it was the occasion of many quarrels and invectives many drawing away the companions of the rest by the bait or even by the promise of their own portion mato commanded them all to be driven away pitilessly they took refuge in the camp of oteritus but the gaulish and libyan women forced them by their outrageous treatment to depart at last they came beneath the walls of carthage to implore the protection of ceres and proserpine for in Bizra there was a temple with priests consecrated to these goddesses in expiation of the horrors formerly committed at the siege of syracuse the Sicitia, alleging their right to waifs and strays claimed the youngest in order to sell them and some fair lacedaemonian women were taken by new carthaginians in marriage a few persisted in following the armies they ran on the flank of the syntagmata by the side of the captains they called to their husbands pulled them by the cloak cursed them as they beat their breasts and held out their little naked and weeping children at arm's length the sight of them was unmanning the barbarians they were an embarrassment and a peril several times they were repulsed but they came back again mato made the horsemen belonging to narhavas charge them with the point of the lance and on some balearians shouting out to him that they must have women he replied i have none just now he was invaded by the genius of moloch in spite of the rebellion of his conscience he performed terrible deeds imagining that he was thus obeying the voice of a god when he could not ravage the fields mato would cast stones into them to render them sterile he urged oteritus and spendius with repeated messages to make haste but the suffet's operations were incomprehensible he encamped at aides moncar and tehent successively 
some scouts believe that they saw him in the neighborhood of Iskiel, near the frontiers of Narhavas, and it was reported that he had crossed the river above the Tibura, as though to return to Carthage. Scarcely was he in one place when he removed to another. The routes that he followed always remained unknown. The Suffet preserved his advantages without offering battle, and while pursued by the barbarians, seemed to be leading them. These marches and countermarches were still more fatiguing to the Carthaginians, and Hamilcar's forces, receiving no reinforcements, diminished from day to day. The country people were now more backward in bringing him provisions. In every direction he encountered taciturn hesitation and hatred, and in spite of his entreaties to the great council, no succour came from Carthage. It was said, perhaps it was believed, that he had need of none. It was a trick, or his complaints were unnecessary, and Hanno's partisans, in order to do him an ill turn, exaggerated the importance of his victory. The troops which he commanded he was welcome to, but they were not going to supply his demands continually in that way. The war was quite burdensome enough. It had cost too much, and from pride the patricians belonging to his faction supported him but slackly. Then Hamilcar, despairing of the Republic, took by force from the tribes all that he wanted for the war grain oil wood cattle and men but the inhabitants were not long in taking flight the villages passed through were empty and the cabins were ransacked without anything being discerned in them the punic army was soon encompassed by a terrible solitude the carthaginians who were furious began to sack the provinces they filled up the cisterns and fired the houses. The sparks, being carried by the wind, were scattered far off, and whole forests were on fire on the mountains. They bordered the valleys with a crown of flames, and it was often necessary to wait in order to pass beyond them. Then the soldiers resumed their march over the warm ashes in the full glare of the sun sometimes they would see what looked like the eyes of a tiger-cat gleaming in a bush by the side of the road this was a barbarian crouching upon his heels and smeared with dust that he might not be distinguished from the colour of the foliage or perhaps when passing along a ravine those on the wings would suddenly hear the rolling of stones and raising their eyes would perceive a barefooted man bounding along through the openings of the gorge meanwhile Eudica and hippo Zaratus were free since the mercenaries were no longer besieging them hamilcar commanded them to come to his assistance but not caring to compromise themselves they answered him with vague words with compliments and excuses he went up again abruptly into the north determined to open up one of the turian towns though he were obliged to lay siege to it he required a station on the coast so as to be able to draw supplies and men from the islands or from cyrene and he coveted the harbour of utica as being the nearest to carthage the suffet therefore left zuitin and turned the lake of hipposaritus with circumspection but he was soon obliged to lengthen out his regiments into column in order to climb the mountain which separates the two valleys they were descending at sunset into its hollow funnel-shaped summit when they perceived on the level of the ground before them bronze she-wolves which seemed to be running across the grass 
suddenly large plumes arose and a terrible song burst forth accompanied by the rhythm of flutes it was the army under spendius for some campanians and greeks in their execration of carthage had assumed the ensigns of rome at the same time long pikes shields of leopard's skin linen cuirasses and naked shoulders were seen on the left these were the iberians under mato the lusitanians balearians and getulians the horses of narhavas were heard to nigh they spread around the hill then came the loose rebel commanded by autaritus gauls libyans and nomads while the eaters of uncleanness might be recognized among them by the fish bones which they wore in their hair thus the barbarians having contrived their marches with exactness had come together again but themselves surprised they remained motionless for some minutes in consultation End of chapter nine part one Chapter nine part two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter nine part two. The Suffet had collected his men into an obicular mass, in such a way as to offer an equal resistance in every direction. The infantry were surrounded by their tall, pointed shields fixed close to one another in the turf the cleaner barians were outside and the elephants at intervals further off the mercenaries were worn out with fatigue it was better to wait till next day and the barbarians feeling sure of their victory occupied themselves the whole night in eating they lighted large bright fires which while dazzling themselves left the punic army below them in the shade hamilcar caused a trench fifteen feet broad and ten cubits deep to be dug in roman fashion around his camp and the earth thrown out to be raised on the inside into a parapet on which sharp interlacing stakes were planted and at sunrise the mercenaries were amazed to perceive all the carthaginians thus entrenched as if in a fortress they could recognize hamilcar in the midst of the tents walking about and giving orders his person was clad in a brown cuirass cut in little scales he was followed by his horse and stopped from time to time to point out something with his right arm outstretched then more than one recalled similar mornings when amid the din of clarions he passed slowly before them and his looks strengthened them like cups of wine a kind of emotion overcame them those on the contrary who were not acquainted with hamilcar were mad with joy at having caught him nevertheless if all attacked at once they would do one another mutual injury in the insufficiency of space the numidians might dash through but the clinabarians who were protected by cuirasses would crush them and then how were the palisades to be crossed as to the elephants they were not sufficiently well trained you are all cowards exclaimed mato and with the best among them he rushed against the entrenchment they were repulsed by a volley of stones for the suffet had taken their abandoned catapults on the bridge this want of success produced an abrupt change in the fickle minds of the barbarians their extreme bravery disappeared 
they wished to conquer but with the smallest possible risk according to spendius they ought to maintain carefully the position that they held and starve out the punic army but the carthaginians began to dig wells and as there were mountains surrounding the hill they discovered water from the summit of their palisade they launched arrows earth dung and pebbles which they gathered from the ground while the six catapults rolled incessantly throughout the length of the terrace but the springs would dry up of themselves the provisions would be exhausted and the catapults worn out the mercenaries who were ten times as numerous would triumph in the end the suffet devised negotiations so as to gain time and one morning the barbarians found a sheep's skin covered with writing within their lines he justified himself for his victory the ancients had forced him into the war and to show them that he was keeping his word he offered them the pillaging of utica or hippo Zeritis at their choice in conclusion hamilcar declared that he did not fear them because he had won over some traitors and thanks to them would easily manage the rest the barbarians were disturbed this proposal of immediate booty made them consider they were apprehensive of treachery not suspecting a snare in the suffet's boasting and they began to look upon one another with mistrust words and steps were watched terrors awakened them in the night many forsook their companions and chose their army as fancy dictated and the gauls with autaritus went and joined themselves with the men of cisalpine gaul whose language they understood the four chiefs met together every evening in matto's tent and squatting around a shield attentively moved backwards and forwards the little wooden figures invented by pyrrhus for the representation of manoeuvres spendius would demonstrate hamilcar's resources and with oaths by all the gods entreat that the opportunity should not be wasted matho would walk about angry and gesticulating the war against carthage was his own personal affair he was indignant that the others should interfere in it without being willing to obey him Otaritus would divine his speech from his countenance and applaud narhavas would elevate his chin to mark his disdain and there was not a measure he did not consider fatal and he had ceased to smile sighs would escape him as though he were thrusting back sorrow for an impossible dream despair for an abortive enterprise while the barbarians deliberated in uncertainty the suffet increased his defences he had a second trench dug within the palisades a second wall raised and wooden towers constructed at the corners and his slaves went as far as the middle of the outposts to drive caltrops into the ground but the elephants whose allowances were lessened struggled in their shackles to economize the grass he ordered the clinabarians to kill the least strong among the stallions a few refused to do so and he had them decapitated the horses were eaten the recollection of this fresh meat was a source of great sadness to them in the days that followed from the bottom of the amphitheatre in which they were confined they would see the four bustling camps of the barbarians all around them on the heights women moved about with leathern bottles on their heads goats straight bleating beneath the piles of pikes sentries were being relieved 
and eating was going on around tripods in fact the tribes furnished them abundantly with provisions and they did not themselves suspect how much the inaction alarmed the punic army on the second day the carthaginians had remarked a troop of three hundred men apart from the rest in the camp of the nomads these were the rich who had been kept prisoners since the beginning of the war some libyans ranged them along the edge of the trench took their station behind them and hurled javelins making themselves a rampart of their bodies the wretched creatures could scarcely be recognized so completely were their faces covered with vermin and filth their hair had been plucked out in places leaving bare the ulcers on their heads and they were so lean and hideous that they were like mummies in tattered shrouds a few trembled and sobbed with a stupid look the rest cried out to their friends to fire upon the barbarians there was one who remained quite motionless with face cast down and without speaking his long white beard fell to his chain-covered hands and the carthaginians feeling as it were the downfall of the republic in the bottom of their hearts recognized gisco although the place was a dangerous one they pressed forward to see him on his head had been placed a grotesque tiara of hippopotamus leather encrusted with pebbles it was Oteritus's idea but it was displeasing to mato hamilcar in exasperation and resolved to cut his way through in one way or another had the palisades opened and the carthaginians went at a furious rate halfway up the hill or three hundred paces such a flood of barbarians descended upon them that they were driven back to their lines one of the guards of the legion who had remained outside was stumbling among the stones zaxas ran up to him knocked him down and plunged a dagger into his throat he drew it out threw himself upon the wound and gluing his lips to it with mutterings of joy and startings which shook him to the heels pumped up the blood by breastfuls then he quietly sat down upon the corpse raised his face with his neck thrown back the better to breathe in the air like a hind that has just drunk at a mountain stream and in a shrill voice began to sing a balearic song a vague melody full of prolonged modulations with interruptions and alternations like echoes answering one another in the mountains he called upon his dead brothers and invited them to a feast then he let his hands fall between his legs slowly bent his head and wept this atrocious occurrence horrified the barbarians especially the greeks from that time forth the carthaginians did not attempt to make any sally and they had no thought of surrender certain as they were that they would perish in tortures nevertheless the provisions in spite of hamilcar's carefulness diminished frightfully there was not left per man more than ten comers of wheat three hins of millet and twelve betzas of dried fruit no more meat no more oil no more salt food and not a grain of barley for the horses which might be seen stretching down their wasted necks seeking in the dust for blades of trampled straw often the sentries on vedette upon the terrace would see in the moonlight a dog belonging to the barbarians coming to prowl beneath the entrenchment among the heaps of filth 
it would be knocked down with a stone and then after a descent had been effected along the palisades by means of the straps of a shield it would be eaten without a word sometimes horrible barkings would be heard and the men would not come up again three phalangites in the fourth dilochia of the twelfth syntagmata killed one another with knives in a dispute about a rat all regretted their families and their houses the poor their hive-shaped huts with the shells on the threshold and the hanging net and the patricians their large halls filled with bluish shadows where at the most indolent hour of the day they used to rest listening to the vague noise of the streets mingled with the rustling of the leaves as they stirred in the gardens to go deeper into the thought of this and to enjoy it more they would half close their eyelids only to be roused by the shock of a wound every minute there was some engagement some fresh alarm the towers were burning the eaters of uncleanness were leaping across the palisades their hands would be struck off with axes others would hasten up an iron hail would fall upon the tents galleries of russian hurdles were raised as a protection against the projectiles the carthaginians shut themselves up within them and stirred out no more every day the sun coming over the hill used after the early hours to forsake the bottom of the gorge and leave them in the shade the grey slopes of the ground covered with flints spotted with scanty lichen ascended in front and in the rear and above their summits stretched the sky in its perpetual purity smoother and colder to the eye than a metal cupola hamilcar was so indignant with carthage that he felt inclined to throw himself among the barbarians and lead them against her moreover the porters sutlers and slaves were beginning to murmur while neither people nor great council nor any one sent as much as a hope the situation was intolerable especially owing to the thought that it would become worse at the news of the disaster carthage had leaped as it were with anger and hate the suffet would have been less execrated if he had allowed himself to be conquered from the first but time and money were lacking for the hire of other mercenaries as to a levy of soldiers in the town how were they to be equipped hamilcar had taken all the arms and then who was to command them the best captains were down yonder with him meanwhile some men dispatched by the suffet arrived in the streets with shouts the great council were roused by them and contrived to make them disappear it was an unnecessary precaution every one accused barca of having behaved with slackness he ought to have annihilated the mercenaries after his victory why had he ravaged the tribes the sacrifices already imposed had been heavy enough and the patricians deplored their contributions of fourteen shekels and the sicitia their two hundred and twenty-three thousand gold kikars those who had given nothing lamented like the rest the populace was jealous of the new carthaginians to whom he had promised full rights of citizenship and even the ligurians who had fought with such intrepidity were confounded with the barbarians and cursed like them their race became a crime the proof of complicity the traders on the thresholds of their shops the workmen passing plumb-line in hand the vendors of pickle rinsing their baskets the attendants in the vapour-baths and the retailers of hot drinks 
all discussed the operations of the campaign they would trace battle plans with their fingers in the dust and there was not a sorry rascal to be found who could not have corrected hamilcar's mistakes it was a punishment said the priests for his long-continued impiety he had offered no holocausts he had not purified his troops he had even refused to take augurs with him and the scandal of sacrilege strengthened the violence of restrained hate and the rage of betrayed hopes people recalled the sicilian disasters and all the burden of his pride that they had borne for so long the colleagues of the pontiffs could not forgive him for having seized their treasure and they demanded a pledge from the great council to crucify him should he ever return the heats of the month of elul which were excessive in that year were another calamity sickening smells rose from the borders of the lake and were wafted through the air together with the fumes of the aromatics that eddied at the corners of the streets the sounds of the hymns were constantly heard crowds of people occupied the staircases of the temples all the walls were covered with black veils tapers burned on the brows of the Pateik guards and the blood of camels slain for sacrifice ran along the flights of stairs forming red cascades upon the steps carthage was agitated with funeral delirium from the depths of the narrowest lanes and the blackest dens there issued pale faces men with viper-like profiles and grinding their teeth the houses were filled with the women's piercing shrieks which escaping through the gratings caused those who stood talking in the squares to turn round sometimes it was thought that the barbarians were arriving they had been seen behind the mountain of the hot springs they were encamped at tunis and the voices would multiply and swell and be blended into one single clamour then universal silence would reign some remaining where they had climbed upon the frontals of the buildings screening their eyes with their open hand while the rest lay flat on their faces at the foot of the ramparts straining their ears when their terror had passed off their anger would begin again but the conviction of their own impotence would soon sink them into the same sadness as before it increased every evening when all ascended the terraces and bowing down nine times uttered a loud cry in salutation of the sun as it sank slowly behind the lagoon and then suddenly disappeared among the mountains in the direction of the barbarians they were waiting for the thrice holy festival when from the summit of a funeral pile an eagle flew heavenwards as a symbol of the resurrection of the year and a message from the people to their baal they regarded it as a sort of union a method of connecting themselves with the might of the sun moreover filled as they now were with hatred they turned frankly towards homicidal moloch and all forsook tanith in fact rabetna having lost her veil was as if she had been despoiled of part of her virtue she denied the beneficence of her waters she had abandoned carthage she was a deserter an enemy some threw stones at her to insult her but many pitied her while they inveighed against her she was still beloved and perhaps more deeply than she had been all their misfortunes came therefore from the loss of the zaimph salambo had indirectly participated in it she was included in the same ill-will she must be punished a vague idea of emulation spread among the people to appease the balim 
it was without doubt necessary to offer them something of incalculable worth a being handsome young virgin of old family a descendant of the gods a human star every day the gardens of megara were invaded by strange men the slaves trembling on their own account dared not resist them nevertheless they did not pass beyond the galley staircase they remained below with their eyes raised to the highest terrace they were waiting for salambo and they would cry out for hours against her like dogs baying at the moon End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Ten, The Serpent. These clamourings of the populace did not alarm Hamilcar's daughter. She was disturbed by loftier anxieties. Her great serpent, the black python, was drooping and in the eyes of the carthaginians the serpent was at once a national and a private fetish it was believed to be the offspring of the dust of the earth since it emerges from its depth and has no need of feet to traverse it its mode of progression called to mind the undulations of rivers its temperature the ancient vicious and fecund darkness and the orbit which it describes when biting its tail the harmony of the planets and the intelligence of eskmoun salambo's serpent had several times already refused the four live sparrows which were offered to it at the full moon and at every new moon its handsome skin covered like the firmament with golden spots upon a perfectly black ground was now yellow relaxed wrinkled and too large for its body a cottony mouldiness extended around its head and in the corners of its eyelids might be seen little red specks which appeared to move salambo would approach its silver wire basket from time to time and would draw aside the purple curtains the lotus leaves and the birds down but it was continually rolled up upon itself more motionless than a withered bindweed and from looking at it she at last came to feel a kind of spiral within her heart another serpent as it were mounting up to her throat by degrees and strangling her she was in despair of having seen the zaimph and yet she felt a sort of joy an intimate pride at having done so a mystery shrank within the splendour of its folds it was the cloud that enveloped the gods and the secret of the universal existence and salambo horror-stricken at herself regretted that she had not raised it she was always crouching at the back of her apartment holding her bended left leg in her hands her mouth half open her chin sunk her eyes fixed she recollected her father's face with terror she wished to go away into the mountains of phoenicia on a pilgrimage to the temple of afaka where tamith descended in the form of a star all kinds of imaginings attracted her and terrified her moreover a solitude which every day became greater encompassed her she did not even know what hamilcar was about wearied at last with her thoughts she would rise and trailing along her little sandals whose soles clacked upon her heels at every step 
she would walk at random through the large silent room the amethysts and topazes of the ceiling made luminous spots quiver here and there and salambo as she walked would turn her head a little to see them she would go and take the hanging amphoras by the neck she would cool her bosom beneath the broad fans or perhaps amuse herself by burning cinnamomum in hollow pearls at sunset Tanach would draw back the black felt lozenges that closed the openings in the wall then her doves rubbed with musk like the doves of tanith suddenly entered and their pink feet glided over the glass pavement amid the grains of barley which she threw to them in handfuls like a sour in a field but on a sudden she would burst into sobs and lie stretched on the large bed of ox-leather straps without moving repeating a word that was ever the same with open eyes pale as one dead insensible cold and yet she could hear the cries of the apes in the tufts of the palm-trees with the continuous grinding of the great wheel which brought a flow of pure water through the stories into the porphyry centre basin sometimes for several days she would refuse to eat she could see in a dream troubled stars wandering beneath her feet she would call shahabarim and when he came she had nothing to say to him she could not live without the relief of his presence but she rebelled inwardly against this domination her feeling towards the priest was one at once of terror jealousy hatred and a species of love in gratitude for the singular voluptuousness which she experienced by his side he had recognized the influence of rabbit being skilful to discern the gods who sent diseases and to cure salambo he had her apartment watered with lotions of vervain and maidenhair she ate mandrakes every morning she slept with her head on a cushion filled with aromatics blended by the pontiffs he had even employed baras a fiery coloured root which drives back fatal geniuses into the north lastly turning towards the polar star he murmured thrice the mysterious name of tanith but salambo still suffered and her anguish deepened no one in carthage was so learned as he in his youth he had studied at the college of the mogbids at borsepa near babylon had then visited samothras pessinus ephesus thessaly judea and the temples of the nabathae which are lost in the sands and had travelled on foot along the banks of the nile from the cataracts to the sea shaking torches with veil-covered face he had cast a black cock upon a fire of sandarach before the breast of the sphinx the father of terra he had descended into the caverns of proserpine had seen the five hundred pillars of the labyrinth of lemnos revolve and the candelabrum of tarentum which bore as many sconces on its shaft as there are days in the year shine in its splendour at times he received greeks by night in order to question them the constitution of the world disquieted him no less than the nature of the gods he had observed the equinoxes with the armils placed in the portico of alexandria and accompanied the bimatists of evagites who measure the sky by calculating the number of their steps as far as serene so that there was now growing in his thoughts a religion of his own with no distinct formula and on that very account full of infatuation and fervour 
he no longer believed that the earth was formed like a fir cone he believed it to be round and eternally falling through immensity with such prodigious speed that its fall was not perceived from the position of the sun above the moon he inferred the predominance of baal of whom the planet itself is but the reflection and figure moreover all that he saw in terrestrial things compelled him to recognize the male exterminating principle as supreme and then he secretly charged rabbit with the misfortune of his life was it not for her that the grand pontiff had once advanced amid the tumult of cymbals and with a patera of boiling water taken from him his future virility and he followed with a melancholy gaze the men who were disappearing with the priestesses in the depth of the turpentine trees his days were spent in inspecting the censers the gold vases the tongs the rakes for the ashes of the altar and all the ropes of the statues down to the bronze bodkin that served to curl the hair of an old tanith in the third edicule near the emerald vine at the same hours he would raise the great hangings of the same swinging doors would remain with his arms outspread in the same attitude or prayed prostrate on the same flagstones while around him a people of priests moved barefooted through the passages filled with an eternal twilight but salambo was in the barrenness of his life like a flower in the cleft of a sepulchre nevertheless he was hard upon her and spared her neither penances nor bitter words his condition established as it were the equality of a common sex between them and he was less angry with the girl for his inability to possess her than for finding her so beautiful and above all so pure often he saw that she grew weary of following his thought then he would turn away sadder than before he would feel himself more forsaken more empty more alone strange words escaped him sometimes which passed before salambo like broad lightnings illuminating the abysses this would be at night on the terrace when both alone they gazed upon the stars and carthage spread below under their feet with the gulf and the open sea dimly lost in the colour of the darkness he would set forth to her the theory of the souls that descended upon the earth following the same route as the sun through the signs of the zodiac with outstretched arm he showed the gate of human generation in the ram and that of the return to the gods in capricorn and salambo strove to see them for she took these conceptions for realities she accepted pure symbols and even manners of speech as being true in themselves a distinction not always very clear even to the priest the souls of the dead said he resolve themselves into the moon as their bodies do into the earth their tears compose its humidity tis a dark abode full of mire and wreck and tempest she asked what would become of her then at first you will languish as light as vapour hovering upon the waves and after more lengthened ordeals and agonies you will pass into the forces of the sun the very source of intelligence he did not speak however of rabbit salambo imagined that it was through some shame for his vanquished goddess and calling her by a common name which designated the moon she launched into blessings upon the soft and fertile planet at last he exclaimed no no she draws all her fecundity from the other do you not see her hovering about him like an amorous woman running after a man in a field and he exalted the virtue of light unceasingly 
far from depressing her mystic desires he sought on the contrary to excite them and he even seemed to take joy in grieving her by the revelation of a pitiless doctrine in spite of the pains of her love salambo threw herself upon it with transport but the more that shahabarim felt himself in doubt about tanith the more he wished to believe in her at the bottom of his soul he was arrested by remorse he needed some proof some manifestation from the gods and in the hope of obtaining it the priest devised an enterprise which might save at once his country and his belief thenceforward he set himself to deplore before salambo the sacrilege and the misfortunes which resulted from it even in the regions of the sky then he suddenly announced the peril of the suffet who was assailed by three armies under the command of matho for on account of the veil matho was in the eyes of the carthaginians the king as it were of the barbarians and he added that the safety of the republic and of her father depended upon her alone upon me she exclaimed how can i but the priest with a smile of disdain said you will never consent she entreated him at last shahabarim said to her you must go to the barbarians and recover the zaimf she sank down upon the ebony stool and remained with her arms stretched out between her knees and shivering in all her limbs like a victim at the altar's foot awaiting the blow of the club her temples were ringing she could see fiery circles revolving and in her stupor she had lost the understanding of all things save one that she was certainly going to die soon but if rabetna triumphed if the zaimph were restored and carthage delivered what mattered a woman's life thought shahabarim moreover she would perhaps obtain the veil and not perish he stayed away for three days on the evening of the fourth she sent for him the better to inflame her heart he reported to her all the invectives howled against hamilcar in open council he told her that she had erred that she owed reparation for her crime and that rabetna commanded the sacrifice a great uproar came frequently across the mappalian district to megara shahabarim and salambo went out quickly and gazed from the top of the galley staircase there were people in the square of Kamon shouting for arms the ancients would not provide them esteeming such an effort useless others who had set out without a general had been massacred at last they were permitted to depart and as a sort of homage to moloch or from a vague need of destruction they tore up tall cypress trees in the woods of the temples and having kindled them at the torches of the kabiri were carrying them through the streets singing these monstrous flames advanced swaying gently they transmitted fires to the glass balls on the crests of the temples to the ornaments of the colossuses and the beaks of the ships passed beyond the terraces and formed suns as it were which rolled through the town they descended the acropolis the gate of malqua opened are you ready exclaimed shahabarim or have you asked them to tell your father that you abandoned him she hid her face in her veils and the great lights retired sinking gradually the while to the edge of the waves an indeterminate dread restrained her she was afraid of moloch and of matho this man with his giant stature who was master of the zaimph ruled rabetna as much as did baal and seemed to her to be surrounded by the same fulgurations and then 
the souls of the guards sometimes visited the bodies of men did not shahabarim speaking of him say that she was to vanquish moloch they were mingled with each other she confused them together both of them were pursuing her she wished to learn the future and approached the serpent for auguries were drawn from the attitudes of serpents but the basket was empty salambo was disturbed she found him with his tail rolled around one of the silver balustrades beside the hanging bed which he was rubbing in order to free himself from his old yellowish skin while his body stretched forth gleaming and clear like a sword half out of the sheath then on the days following in proportion as she allowed herself to be convinced and was more disposed to succour tanith the python recovered and grew he seemed to be reviving the certainty that salambo was giving expression to the will of the gods then became established in her conscience one morning she awoke resolved and asked what was necessary to make matto restore the veil to claim it said shahabarim but if he refuses she rejoined the priest scanned her fixedly with a smile such as she had never seen yes what is to be done repeated salambo he rolled between his fingers the extremities of the bands which fell from his tiara upon his shoulders standing motionless with eyes cast down at last seeing that she did not understand you will be alone with him well she said alone in his tent what then shahabarim bit his lips he sought for some phrase some circumlocution if you are to die that will be later he said later fear nothing and whatever he may undertake to do do not call out do not be frightened you will be humble you understand and submissive to his desire which is ordained of heaven but the veil the gods will take thought for it replied shahabarim suppose you were to accompany me o father she added no he made her kneel down and keeping his left hand raised and his right extended he swore in her behalf to bring back the mantle of tanith into carthage with terrible imprecations she devoted herself to the gods and each time that shahabarim pronounced a word she falteringly repeated it he indicated to her all the purifications and fastenings that she was to observe and how she was to reach matto moreover a man acquainted with the roads would accompany her she felt as if she had been set free she thought only of the happiness of seeing the zaimph again and she now blessed shahabarim for his exhortations it was the period at which the doves of carthage migrated to sicily to the mountain of eryx and the temple of venus for several days before their departure they sought out and called to one another so as to collect together at last one evening they flew away the wind blew them along and the big white cloud glided across the sky high above the sea the horizon was filled with the colour of blood they seemed to descend gradually to the waxes then they disappeared as though swallowed up and falling of themselves into the jaws of the sun salambo who watched them retiring bent her head and then tanach believing that she guessed her sorrow said gently to her but they will come back mistress yes i know and you will see them again perhaps she said sighing she had not confided her resolve to any one in order to carry it out with the greater discretion 
she sent tarnach to the suburb of Kinisto to buy all the things that she required instead of requesting them from the stewards vermilion aromatics a linen girdle and new garments the old slave was amazed at these preparations without daring however to ask any questions and the day which had been fixed by shahabarim arrived when salambo was to set out about the twelfth hour she perceived in the depth of the sycamore trees a blind old man with one hand resting on the shoulder of a child who walked before him while with the other he carried a kind of sathara of black wood against his hip the eunuchs slaves and women had been scrupulously sent away no one might know the mystery that was preparing tarnach kindled four tripods filled with strobus and cadamomum in the corners of the apartment then she unfolded large babylonian hangings and stretched them on cords all around the room for salambo did not wish to be seen even by the walls the kinner player squatted behind the door and the young boy standing upright applied a red flute to his lips in the distance the roar of the streets was growing feebler violet shadows were lengthening before the peristyles of the temples and on the other side of the gulf the mountain bases the fields of olive trees and the vague yellow lands undulated indefinitely and were blended together in a bluish haze not a sound was to be heard and an unspeakable depression weighed in the air salambo crouched down upon the onyx step on the edge of the basin she raised her ample sleeves fastening them behind her shoulders and began her ablutions in methodical fashion according to the sacred rites next tarnach brought her something liquid and coagulated in an alabaster phial it was the blood of a black dog slaughtered by barren women on a winter's night amid the rubbish of a sepulchre she rubbed it upon her ears her heels and the thumb of her right hand and even her nail remained somewhat red as if she had crushed a fruit the moon rose then the sithara and the flute began to play together salambo unfastened her earrings her necklace her bracelets and her long white simar she unknotted the band in her hair shaking the letter for a few minutes softly over her shoulders to cool herself by thus scattering it the music went on outside it consisted of three notes ever the same hurried and frenzied the strings grated the flute blew tarnach kept time by striking her hands salambo with a swaying of her whole body chanted prayers and her garments fell one after another around her the heavy tapestry trembled and the python's head appeared above the cord that supported it the serpent descended slowly like a drop of water flowing along a wall crawled among the scattered stuffs and then gluing its tail to the ground rose perfectly erect and his eyes more brilliant than carbuncles darted upon salambo a horror of cold or perhaps a feeling of shame at first made her hesitate but she recalled shahabarim's orders and advanced the python turned downwards and resting the centre of its body upon the nape of her neck allowed its head and tail to hang like a broken necklace with both ends trailing to the ground salambo rolled it around her sides under her arms and between her knees then taking it by the jaw she brought the little triangular mouth to the edge of her teeth and half shutting her eyes threw herself back beneath the rays of the moon 
the white light seemed to envelop her in a silver mist the prints of her humid steps shone upon the flagstones stars quivered in the depth of the water it tightened upon her its black rings that were spotted with scales of gold salambo panted beneath the excessive weight her loins yielded she felt herself dying and with the tip of its tail the serpent gently beat her thigh then the music becoming still it fell off again Tanach came back to her and after arranging two candelabra the lights of which burned in crystal balls filled with water she tinged the inside of her hands with lausonia spread vermilion upon her cheeks and antimony along the edge of her eyelids and lengthened her eyebrows with a mixture of gum musk ebony and crushed legs of flies salambo seated on a chair with ivory uprights gave herself up to the attentions of the slave but the touchings the odour of the aromatics and the fasts that she had undergone were enervating her she became so pale that tana stopped go on cried salambo and bearing up against herself she suddenly revived then she was seized with impatience she urged Tanach to make haste, and the old slave grumbled, "'Well, well, mistress, besides you have no one waiting for you.' "'Yes,' said Salambo, "'someone is waiting for me.' Tanach drew back in surprise, and in order to learn more about it, said, "'What orders do you give me, mistress, for if you are to remain away?' But Salambo was sobbing the slave exclaimed you are suffering what is the matter do not go away take me when you were quite little and used to cry i took you to my heart and made you laugh with the points of my breasts you have drained them mistress she struck herself upon her dried-up bosom now i am old i can do nothing for you you no longer love me you hide your griefs from me you despise the nurse and tears of tenderness and vexation flowed down her cheeks in the gashes of her tattooing no said salambo no i love you be comforted with a smile like the grimace of an old ape tanach resumed her task in accordance with Shahabarim's recommendations, Salambo had ordered the slave to make her magnificent, and she was obeying her mistress with barbaric taste, full at once of refinement and ingenuity. Over a first delicate and vinous-coloured tunic, she passed a second embroidered with birds' feathers golden scales clung to her hips and from this broad girdle descended her blue flowing silver starred trousers next tanach put upon her a long robe made of the cloth of the country of ceres white and streaked with green lines on the edge of her shoulder she fastened a square of purple weighed at the hem with grains of sandastrum and above all these garments she placed a black mantle with a flowing train then she gazed at her and proud of her work could not help saying you will not be more beautiful on the day of your bridal my bridal repeated salambo she was musing with her elbow resting upon the ivory chair but tanach set up before her a copper mirror which was so broad and high that she could see herself completely in it then she rose and with a light touch of her finger raised a lock of her hair which was falling too low her hair was covered with gold dust was crisped in front and hung down behind over her back in long twists ending in pearls the brightness of the candelabra heightened the paint on her cheeks the gold on her garments and the whiteness of her skin around her waist and on her arms hands and toes 
she had such a wealth of gems that the mirror sent back rays upon her like a sun and salambo standing by the side of tanach who leaned over to see her smiled amid this dazzling display then she walked to and fro embarrassed by the time that was still left suddenly the crow of a cock resounded she quickly pinned a long yellow veil upon her hair passed a scarf around her neck thrust her feet into blue leather boots and said to tanach go and see whether there is not a man with two horses beneath the myrtles tanach had scarcely re-entered when she was descending the galley staircase mistress cried the nurse salambo turned around with one finger on her mouth as a sign for discretion and immobility tanach stole softly along the prows to the foot of the terrace and from a distance she could distinguish by the light of the moon a gigantic shadow walking obliquely in the cypress avenue to the left of salambo a sign which presaged death tanach went up again into the chamber she threw herself upon the ground tearing her face with her nails she plucked out her hair and uttered piercing shrieks with all her might it occurred to her that they might be heard then she became silent sobbing quite softly with her head in the hands and her face on the pavement End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven, Part One of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Eleven, Part One. In the tent. The man who guided Salambo made her ascend again beyond the pharos in the direction of the catacombs, and then go down the long suburb of Moluya, which was full of steep lanes the sky was beginning to grow grey sometimes palm-wood beams jutting out from the walls obliged them to bend their heads the two horses which were at the walk would often slip and thus they reached the tivest gate its heavy leaves were half open they passed through and it closed behind them at first they followed the foot of the ramparts for a time and at the height of the cisterns they took their way along the tania a narrow strip of yellow earth separating the gulf from the lake and extending as far as rats no one was to be seen around carthage whether on the sea or in the country the slate-coloured waves chopped softly and the light wind blowing their foam hither and thither spotted them with white rents in spite of all her veils salambo shivered in the freshness of the morning the motion and the open air dazed her then the sun rose it preyed on the back of her head and she involuntarily dozed a little the two animals rambled along side by side their feet sinking into the silent sand when they had passed the mountain of the hot springs they went on at a more rapid rate the ground being firmer but although it was the season for sowing and ploughing the fields were as empty as the desert as far as the eye could reach here and there were scattered heaps of corn at other places the barley was shedding its reddened ears the villages showed black upon the clear horizon with shapes incoherently carved from time to time a half calcined piece of wall would be found standing on the edge of the road 
the roofs of the cottages were falling in and in the interiors might be distinguished fragments of pottery rags of clothing and all kinds of unrecognizable utensils and broken things often a creature clothed in tatters with earthy face and flaming eyes would emerge from these ruins but he would very quickly begin to run or would disappear into a hole salambo and her guide did not stop deserted plains succeeded one another charcoal dust which was raised by their feet behind them stretched in unequal trails over large spaces of perfectly white soil sometimes they came upon little peaceful spots where a brook flowed amid the long grass and as they ascended the other bank salambo would pluck damp leaves to cool her hands at the corner of a wood of rose bays her horse shied violently at the corpse of a man which lay extended on the ground the slave immediately settled her again on the cushions he was one of the servants of the temple a man whom shahabarim used to employ on perilous missions with extreme precaution he now went on foot beside her and between the horses he would whip the animals with the end of a leathern lace wound round his arm or would perhaps take balls made of wheat dates and yolks of eggs wrapped in lotus leaves from a scrip hanging against his breast and offer them to salambo without speaking and running all the time in the middle of the day three barbarians clad in animals skins crossed their path by degrees others appeared wandering in troops of ten twelve or twenty-five men many were driving goats or a limping cow their heavy sticks bristled with brass points cutlasses gleamed in their clothes which were savagely dirty and they opened their eyes with a look of menace and amazement as they passed some sent them a vulgar benediction others obscene jests and shahabarim's man replied to each in his own idiom he told them that this was a sick youth going to be cured at a distant temple however the day was closing in barkings were heard and they approached them then in the twilight they perceived an enclosure of dry stones shutting in a rambling edifice a dog was running along the top of the wall the slave threw some pebbles at him and they entered a lofty vaulted hall a woman was crouching in the centre warming herself at a fire of brushwood the smoke of which escaped through the holes in the ceiling she was half hidden by her white hair which fell to her knees and unwilling to answer she muttered with idiotic look words of vengeance against the barbarians and the carthaginians the runner ferreted right and left then he returned to her and demanded something to eat the woman shook her head and murmured with her eyes fixed upon the charcoal i was the hand the ten fingers are cut off the mouth eats no more the slave showed her a handful of gold pieces she rushed upon them but soon resumed her immobility at last he placed a dagger which he had in his girdle beneath her throat then trembling she went and raised a large stone and brought back an amphora of wine with fish from hipposaritis preserved in honey salambo turned away from this unclean food and fell asleep on the horses caparisons which were spread in a corner of the hall he awoke her before daylight the dog was howling the slave went up to it quietly and struck off its head with a single blow of his dagger then he rubbed the horse's nostrils with blood to revive them the old woman cast a malediction at him from behind salambo perceived this and pressed the amulet which she wore above her heart they resumed their journey 
from time to time she asked whether they would not arrive soon the road undulated over little hills nothing was to be heard but the grating of the grasshoppers the sun heated the yellowed grass the ground was all chinked with crevices which in dividing formed as it were monstrous paving stones sometimes a viper passed or eagles flew by the slave still continued running salambo mused beneath her veils and in spite of the heat did not lay them aside through fear of soiling her beautiful garments at regular distances stood towers built by the carthaginians for the purpose of keeping watch upon the tribes they entered these for the sake of the shade and then set out again for prudence's sake they had made a wide detour the day before but they met with no one just now the region being a sterile one the barbarians had not passed that way gradually the devastation began again sometimes a piece of mosaic would be displayed in the centre of a field the sole remnant of a vanished mansion and the leafless olive trees looked at a distance like large bushes of thorns they passed through a town in which houses were burnt to the ground human skeletons might be seen along the walls there were some too of dromedaries and mules half gnawed carrion blocked the streets night fell the sky was lowering and cloudy they ascended again for two hours in a westerly direction when suddenly they perceived a quantity of little flames before them these were shining at the bottom of an amphitheatre gold plates as they displaced one another glanced here and there these were the cuirasses of the clinabarians in the punic camp then in the neighbourhood they distinguished other and more numerous lights for the armies of the mercenaries now blended together extended over a great space salambo made a movement as though to advance but shahabarim's man took her further away and they passed along by the terrace which enclosed the camp of the barbarians a breach became visible in it and the slave disappeared a sentry was walking upon the top of the entrenchment with a bow in his hand and a pike on his shoulder salambo drew still nearer the barbarian knelt and a long arrow pierced the hem of her cloak then as she stood motionless and shrieking he asked her what she wanted to speak to matto she replied i am a fugitive from carthage he gave a whistle which was repeated at intervals further away salambo waited her frightened horse moved round and round sniffing when matto arrived the moon was rising behind her but she had a yellow veil with black flowers over her face and so many draperies about her person that it was impossible to make any guess about her from the top of the terrace he gazed upon this vague form standing up like a phantom in the penumbra of the evening at last she said to him lead me to your tent i wish it a recollection which he could not define passed through his memory he felt his heart beating the air of command intimidated him follow me he said the barrier was lowered and immediately she was in the camp of the barbarians it was filled with a great tumult and a great throng bright fires were burning beneath hanging pots and their purpled reflections illuminating some places left others completely in the dark there was shouting and calling shackled horses formed long straight lines amid the tents the latter were round and square of leather or of canvas there were huts of reeds and holes in the sand such as are made by dogs 
soldiers were carting faggots resting on their elbows on the ground or wrapping themselves up in mats and preparing to sleep and salambo's horse sometimes stretched out a leg and jumped in order to pass over them she remembered that she had seen them before but their beards were longer now their faces still blacker and their voices hoarser matho who walked before her waved them off with a gesture of his arm which raised his red mantle some kissed his hands others bending their spines approached him to ask for orders for he was now veritable and sole chief of the barbarians spendius oteritus and narhavas had become disheartened and he had displayed so much audacity and obstinacy that all obeyed him salambo followed him through the entire camp his tent was at the end three hundred feet from hamilcar's entrenchments she noticed a white pit on the right and it seemed to her that faces were resting against the edge of it on a level with the ground as decapitated heads might have done however their eyes moved and from these half-opened mouths groanings escaped in the punic tongue two negroes holding resin lights stood on both sides of the door matho drew the canvas abruptly aside she followed him it was a deep tent with a pole standing up in the centre it was lightened by a large lamp-holder shaped like a lotus and full of a yellow oil wherein floated handfuls of burning tow and military things might be distinguished gleaming in the shade a naked sword leaned against a stool by the side of a shield whips of hippopotamus leather cymbals bells and necklaces were displayed pall-mall on baskets of esparto grass a felt rug lay soiled with crumbs of black bread some copper money was carelessly heaped upon a round stone in a corner and through the rents in the canvas the wind brought the dust from without together with the smell of the elephants which might be heard eating and shaking their chains who are you said matho she looked slowly around her without replying then her eyes were arrested in the background where something bluish and sparkling fell upon a bed of palm branches she advanced quickly a cry escaped her matho stamped his foot behind her who brings you here why do you come to take it she replied pointing at the zaimph and with the other hand she tore the veils from her head he drew back with his elbows behind him gaping almost terrified she felt as if she were leaning on the might of the guards and looking at him face to face she asked him for the zaimph she demanded it in words abundant and superb matho did not hear he was gazing at her and in his eyes her garments were blended with her body the clouding of the stuffs like the splendour of her skin was something special and belonging to her alone her eyes and her diamonds sparkled the polish of her nails continued the delicacy of the stones which loaded her fingers the two clasps of her tunic raised her breasts somewhat and brought them closer together and he in thought lost himself in the narrow interval between them whence there fell a thread holding a plate of emeralds which could be seen lower down beneath the violet gauze she had as earrings two little sapphire scales each supporting a hollow pearl filled with liquid scent a little drop would fall every moment through the holes in the pearl and moisten her naked shoulder matho watched it fall he was carried away by ungovernable curiosity and like a child laying his hand upon a strange fruit he tremblingly and lightly touched the top of her chest with the tip of his finger 
the flesh which was somewhat cold yielded with an elastic resistance this contact though scarcely a sensible one shook matho to the very depths of his nature an uprising of his whole being urged him towards her he would fain have enveloped her absorbed her drunk her his bosom was panting his teeth were chattering taking her by the wrists he drew her gently to him and then sat down upon a cuirass beside the palm-tree bed which was covered with a lion's skin she was standing he looked up at her holding her thus between his knees and repeating how beautiful you are how beautiful you are his eyes which were continually fixed upon hers pained her and the uncomfortableness the repugnance increased in so acute a fashion that salammbo put a constraint upon herself not to cry out the thought of shahabarim came back to her and she resigned herself matho still kept her little hands in his own and from time to time in spite of the priest's command she turned away her face and tried to thrust him off by jerking her arms he opened his nostrils the better to breathe in her perfume which exhaled from her person it was a fresh indefinable emanation which nevertheless made him dizzy like the smoke from a perfuming pan she smelt of honey pepper incense roses with another odour still but how was she thus with him in his tent and at his disposal some one no doubt had urged her she had not come for the zaimph his arms fell and he bent his head whelmed in sudden reverie to soften him salammbo said to him in a plaintive voice what have i done to you that you should desire my death your death she resumed i saw you one evening by the light of my burning gardens amid fuming cups and my slaughtered slaves and your anger was so strong that you bounded towards me and i was obliged to fly then terror entered into carthage there were cries of the devastation of the towns the burning of the country seats the massacre of the soldiery it was you who had ruined them it was you who had murdered them i hate you your very name gnaws me like remorse you are execrated more than the plague and the roman war the provinces shudder at your fury the furrows are full of corpses i have followed the traces of your fires as though i were travelling behind moloch matho leaped up his heart was swelling with colossal pride he was raised to the stature of a god with quivering nostrils and clenched teeth she went on as if your sacrilege were not enough you came to me in my sleep covered with the zaimph your words i did not understand but i could see that you wished to drag me to some terrible thing at the bottom of an abyss matho writhing his arms exclaimed no no it was to give it to you to restore it to you it seemed to me that the goddess had left her garment for you and that it belonged to you in her temple or in your house what does it matter are you not all-powerful immaculate radiant and beautiful even as tanith and with a look of boundless adoration he added unless perhaps you are tanith i tanith said salammbo to herself they left off speaking the thunder rolled in the distance some sheep bleated frightened by the storm oh come near he went on come near fear nothing formerly i was only a soldier mingled with the common herd of the mercenaries i and so meek that i used to carry wood on my back for the others do i trouble myself about carthage the crowd of its people move as though lost in the dust of your sandals and all its treasures with the provinces fleets and islands 
do not raise my envy like the freshness of your lips and the turn of your shoulders but i waited to throw down its walls that i might reach you to possess you moreover i was revenging myself in the meantime at present i crush men like shells and i throw myself upon phalanxes i put aside the sarisay with my hands i check the stallions by the nostrils a catapult would not kill me oh if you knew how i think of you in the midst of war sometimes the memory of a gesture or of a fold of your garment suddenly seizes me and entwines me like a net i perceive your eyes in the flames of the phalaricas and on the gilding of the shields i hear your voice in the sounding of the cymbals i turn aside but you are not there and i plunge again into the battle he raised his arms whereon his veins crossed one another like ivy on the branches of a tree sweat flowed down his breast between his square muscles and his breathing shook his sides with his bronze girdle all garnished with thongs hanging down to his knees which were firmer than marble salambo who was accustomed to eunuchs yielded to amazement at the strength of this man it was the chastisement of the goddess or the influence of moloch in motion around her in the five armies she was overwhelmed with lassitude and she listened in a state of stupor to the intermittent shouts of the sentinels as they answered one another the flames of the lamp kindled in the squalls of hot air there came at times broad lightning flashes then the darkness increased and she could only see matho's eyeballs like two coals in the night however she felt that a fatality was surrounding her that she had reached a supreme and irrevocable moment and making an effort she went up again towards the zaimph and raised her hands to seize it what are you doing exclaimed matho i am going back to carthage she placidly replied he advanced folding his arms and with so terrible a look that her heels were immediately nailed as it were to the spot going back to carthage he stammered and grinding his teeth repeated going back to carthage ah you came to take the zaimph to conquer me and then disappear no no you belong to me and no one now shall tear you from here oh i have not forgotten the insolence of your large tranquil eyes and how you crushed me with the haughtiness of your beauty tis my turn now you are my captive my slave my servant call if you like on your father and his army the ancients the rich and your whole accursed people i am the master of three hundred thousand soldiers i will go and seek them in lusitania in the gauls and in the depths of the desert and i will overthrow your town and burn all its temples the triremes shall float on the waves of blood i will not have a house a stone or a palm tree remaining and if men fail me i will draw the bears from the mountains and urge on the lions seek not to fly or i kill you End of chapter eleven part one Chapter Eleven, Part Two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Eleven, Part Two. Pale and with clenched fists, he quavered like a harp whose strings are about to burst. Suddenly, sobs stifled him, and he sank down upon his hams. Ah, forgive me i am a scoundrel and viler than scorpions than mire and dust just now while you were speaking your breath passed across my face 
and i rejoiced like a dying man who drinks lying float on the edge of a stream crush me if only i feel your feet curse me if only i hear your voice do not go have pity i love you i love you he was on his knees on the ground before her and he encircled her form with both his arms his head thrown back and his hands wandering the gold discs hanging from his ears gleamed upon his bronzed neck big tears rolled in his eyes like silver globes he sighed caressingly and murmured vague words lighter than a breeze and sweet as a kiss salambo was invaded by a weakness in which she lost all consciousness of herself something at once inwardly and lofty a command from the gods obliged her to yield herself the clouds uplifted her and she fell back swooning upon the bed amid the lion's hair the zaimph fell and enveloped her she could see matho's face bending down above her breast moloch thou burnest me and the soldier's kisses more devouring than flames covered her she was as though swept away in a hurricane taken in the might of the sun he kissed all her fingers her arms her feet and the long tresses of her hair from one end to the other carry it off he said what do i care take me away with it i abandon the army i renounce everything beyond gates twenty days journey into the sea you come to an island covered with gold dust venger and birds on the mountains large flowers filled with smoking perfumes rock like eternal censers in the citron trees which are higher than cedars milk-coloured serpents cause the fruit to fall upon the turf with the diamonds in their jaws the air is so mild that it keeps you from dying oh i shall find it you will see we shall live in crystal grottoes cut out at the foot of the hills no one dwells in it yet or i shall become the king of the country he brushed the dust off her cothurni he wanted her to put a quarter of a pomegranate between her lips he heaped up garments behind her head to make a cushion for her he sought for means to serve her and to humble himself and he even spread the zaimph over her feet as if it were a mere rug have you still he said those little gazelles horns on which your necklaces hang you will give them to me i love them for he spoke as if the war were finished and joyful thoughts broke from him the mercenaries hamilcar every obstacle had now disappeared the moon was gliding between two clouds they could see it through an opening in the tent ah what nights have i spent gazing at her she seemed to me like a veil that hid your face you would look at me through her the memory of you was mingled with her beams then i could no longer distinguish you and with his head between her breasts he wept copiously and this she thought is the formidable man who makes carthage tremble he fell asleep then disengaging herself from his arm she put one foot to the ground and she perceived that her chainlet was broken the maidens of the great families were accustomed to respect these shackles as something that was almost religious and salambo blushing rolled the two pieces of the golden chain around her ankles carthage megara her house her room and the country that she had passed through whirled in tumultuous yet distinct images through her memory but an abyss had yawned and thrown them far back to an infinite distance from her the storm was departing drops of water splashing rarely one by one made the tent roof shake matho slept like a drunken man stretched on his side and with one arm over the edge of the couch his band of pearls was raised somewhat and uncovered his brow 
his teeth were parted in a smile they shone through his black beard and there was a silent and almost outrageous gaiety in his half-closed eyelids salambo looked at him motionless her head bent and her hands crossed a dagger was displayed on the table of cypress wood at the head of the bed the sight of the gleaming blade fired her with a sanguinary desire mournful voices lingered at a distance in the shade and like a chorus of geniuses urged her on she approached it she seized the steel by the handle at the rustling of her dress matho half opened his eyes putting forth his mouth upon her hands and the dagger fell shouts arose a terrible light flashed behind the canvas matho raised the letter they perceived a camp of the libyans enveloped in great flames their reed huts were burning and the twisting stems burst in the smoke and flew off like arrows black shadows ran about distractedly on the red horizon they could hear the shrieks of those who were in the huts the elephants oxen and horses plunged in the midst of the crowd crushing it together with the stores and baggage that were being rescued from the fire trumpets sounded there were calls of mato mato some people at the door tried to get in come along hamilcar is burning the camp of oteritus he made a spring she found herself quite alone then she examined the zaimph and when she had viewed it well she was surprised that she had not the happiness which she had once imagined to herself she stood with melancholy before her accomplished dream but the lower part of the tent was raised and a monstrous form appeared salambo could at first distinguish only the two eyes and a long white beard which hung down to the ground for the rest of the body which was cumbered with the rags of a tawny garment trailed along the earth and with every forward movement the hands passed into the beard and then fell again crawling in this way it reached her feet and salambo recognized the aged gisco in fact the mercenaries had broken the legs of the captive ancients with a brass bar to prevent them from taking to flight and they were all rotting pall-mall in a pit in the midst of filth but the sturdiest of them raised themselves and shouted when they heard the noise of platters and it was in this way that gisco had seen salambo he had guessed that she was a carthaginian woman by the little balls of sandastrum flapping against her cothurni and having a presentiment of an important mystery he had succeeded with the assistance of his companions in getting out of the pit then with elbows and hands he had dragged himself twenty paces further on as far as matho's tent two voices were speaking within it he had listened outside and had heard everything it is you she said at last almost terrified yes it is i he replied raising himself on to his wrists they think me dead do they not she bent her head he resumed ah why have the baals not granted me this mercy he approached so close he was touching her they would have spared me the pain of cursing you salambo sprang quickly back so much afraid was she of this unclean being who was as hideous as a larva and nearly as terrible as a phantom i am nearly one hundred years old he said i have seen agathocles i have seen regulus and the eagles of the romans passing over the harvests of the punic fields i have seen all the terrors of battles and the sea encumbered with the wrecks of our fleets barbarians whom i used to command have chained my four limbs like a slave that has committed murder my companions are dying around me one after the other the odour of their corpses awakes me in the night i drive away the birds that come to peck out their eyes 
and yet not for a single day have i despaired of carthage though i had seen all the armies of the earth against her and the flames of the siege overtop the height of the temples i should have still believed in her eternity but now it is over all is lost the gods execrate her a curse upon you who have quickened her ruin by your disgrace she opened her lips ah i was there he cried i heard you gurgling with love like a prostitute then he told you of his desire and you allowed him to kiss your hands but if the frenzy of your unchastity urged you to it you should at least have done as do the fellow deer which hide themselves in their copulations and not have displayed your shame beneath your father's very eyes what she said ah you did not know that the two entrenchments are sixty cubits from each other and that your motto in the excess of his pride has posted himself just in front of hamilcar your father is there behind you and could i climb the path which leads to the platform i should cry to him come and see your daughter in the barbarian's arms she has put on the garment of the goddess to please him and in yielding her body to him she surrenders with the glory of your name the majesty of the gods the vengeance of her country even the safety of carthage the motion of his toothless mouth moved his beard throughout its length his eyes were riveted upon her and devoured her panting in the dust he repeated ah sacrilegious one may you be accursed 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 salambo had drawn back the canvas she held it raised at arm's length and without answering him she looked in the direction of hamilcar it is this way is it not she said what matters it to you turn away be gone rather crush your face against the earth it is a holy spot which would be polluted by your gaze she threw the zaimph about her waist and quickly picked up her veils mantle and scarf i hasten thither she cried and making her escape salambo disappeared at first she walked through the darkness without meeting any one for all were betaking themselves to the fire the uproar was increasing and great flames purpled the sky behind a long terrace stopped her she turned around to right and left at random seeking for a ladder a rope a stone something in short to assist her she was afraid of gisco and it seemed to her that shouts and footsteps were pursuing her day was beginning to break she perceived a path in the thickness of the entrenchment she took the hem of her robe which impeded her in her teeth and in three bounds she was on the platform a sonorous shout burst forth beneath her in the shade the same which she had heard at the foot of the galley staircase and leaning over she recognized shahabarim's man with his coupled horses he had wandered all night between the two entrenchments then disquieted by the fire he had gone back again trying to see what was passing in matho's camp and knowing that this spot was nearest to his tent he had not stirred from it in obedience to the priest's command he stood up on one of the horses salambo let herself slide down to him and they fled at full gallop circling the punic camp in search of a gate matho had re-entered his tent the smoky lamp gave but little light but he also believed that salambo was asleep then he delicately touched the lion's skin on the palm-tree bed he called but she did not answer he quickly tore away a strip of the canvas to let in some light the zaimph was gone the earth trembled beneath thronging feet shouts neighings and clashing of armour rose in the air and clarion flourishes sounded the charge it was as though a hurricane were whirling around him 
a moderate frenzy made him leap upon his arms and he dashed outside the long files of the barbarians were descending the mountain at a run and the punic squares were advancing against them with a heavy and regular oscillation the mist rent by the rays of the sun formed little rocking clouds which as they rose gradually discovered standards helmets and points of pikes beneath the rapid evolutions portions of the earth which were still in the shadow seemed to be displaced bodily in other places it looked as if huge torrents were crossing one another while thorny masses stood motionless between them Mato could distinguish the captains, soldiers, heralds, and even the serving men, who were mounted on asses in the rear. But instead of maintaining his position in order to cover the foot-soldiers, Narhavas turned abruptly to the right, as though he wished himself to be crushed by Hamilcar. His horsemen outstripped the elephants, which were slackening their speed, and all the horses, stretching out their unbridled heads, galloped at so furious a rate that their bellies seemed to graze the earth. Then suddenly Narhavas went resolutely up to a sentry. He threw away his sword, lance, and javelins, and disappeared among the Carthaginians. The king of the Numidians reached Hamilcar's tent, and pointing to his men, who were standing still at a distance, he said, "'Barca, I bring them to you. They are yours.' Then he prostrated himself in token of bondage, and to prove his fidelity recalled all his conduct from the beginning of the war. First he had prevented the siege of Carthage and the massacre of the captives, then he had taken no advantage of the victory over hanno after the defeat at utica as to the tyrian towns they were on the frontiers of his kingdom finally he had not taken part in the battle of the macaras and he had even expressly absented himself in order to evade the obligation of fighting against the suffet narhavas had in fact wished to aggrandize himself by encroachments upon the punic provinces and had alternately assisted and forsaken the mercenaries according to the chances of victory but seeing that hamilcar would ultimately prove the stronger he had gone over to him and in his desertion there was perhaps something of a grudge against mato whether on account of the command or of his former love the suffet listened without interrupting him the man who thus presented himself with an army where vengeance was his due was not an auxiliary to be despised hamilcar at once divined the utility of such an alliance in his great projects with the numidians he would get rid of the libyans then he would draw off the west to the conquest of iberia and without asking narhavas why he had not come sooner or noticing any of his lies he kissed him striking his breast thrice against his own it was to bring matters to an end and in despair that he had fired the camp of the libyans this army came to him like a relief from the gods dissembling his joy he replied may the baals favour you i do not know what the republic will do for you but hamilcar is not ungrateful the tumult increased some captains entered he was arming himself as he spoke come return you will use your horsemen to beat down their infantry between your elephants and mine courage exterminate them and narhavas was rushing away when salambo appeared she leaped down quickly from her horse she opened her ample cloak and spreading out her arms displayed the zaimph the leathern tent which was raised at the corners left visible the entire circuit of the mountain with its thronging soldiers and as it was in the centre salambo could be seen on all sides an immense shouting burst forth a long cry of triumph and hope 
those who were marching stopped the dying leaned on their elbows and turned around to bless her all the barbarians knew now that she had recovered the zaimph they saw her or believed that they saw her from a distance and other cries but those of rage and vengeance resounded in spite of the plaudits of the carthaginians thus did the five armies in tears upon the mountain stamp and shriek around salambo hamilcar who was unable to speak nodded her his thanks his eyes were directed alternately upon the zaimph and upon her and he noticed that her chainlet was broken then he shivered being seized with a terrible suspicion but soon recovering his impassibility he looked sideways at narhavas without turning his face the king of the numidians held himself apart in a discreet attitude on his forehead he bore a little of the dust which he had touched when prostrating himself at last the suffet advanced towards him with a look full of gravity as a reward for the services which you have rendered me narhavas i give you my daughter be my son he added and defend your father narhavas gave a great gesture of surprise then he threw himself upon hamilcar's hands and covered them with kisses salambo calm as a statue did not seem to understand she blushed a little as she cast down her eyelids and her long curved lashes made shadows upon her cheeks hamilcar wished to unite them immediately in indissoluble betrothal a lance was placed in salambo's hands and by her offered to narhavas their thumbs were tied together with a thong of ox-leather then corn was poured upon their heads and the grains that fell around them rang like rebounding hail End of chapter eleven part two Chapter Twelve, Part One of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Twelve, Part One: The Aqueduct. Twelve hours afterwards, all that remained of the mercenaries was a heap of wounded, dead, and dying hamilcar had suddenly emerged from the bottom of the gorge and again descended the western slope that looked towards hippo Zaretus, and the space being broader at this spot he had taken care to draw the barbarians into it narhavas had encompassed them with his horse the suffet meanwhile drove them back and crushed them then too they were conquered beforehand by the loss of the zaimph even those who cared nothing about it had experienced anguish and something akin to enfeeblement hamilcar not indulging his pride by holding the field of battle had retired a little further off on the left to some heights from which he commanded them the shape of the camps could be recognized by their sloping palisades a long heap of black cinders was smoking on the side of the libyans the devastated soil showed undulations like the sea and the tents with their tattered canvas looked like dim ships half lost in the breakers cuirasses forks clarions pieces of wood iron and brass corn straw and garments were scattered about among the corpses here and there a phalarica on the point of extinction burned against a heap of baggage 
in some places the earth was hidden with shields horses carcasses succeeded one another like a series of hillocks legs sandals arms and coats of mail were to be seen with heads held in their helmets by the chin pieces and rolling about like balls heads of hair were hanging on the thorns elephants were lying with their towers in pools of blood with entrails exposed and gasping the foot trod on slimy things and there were swamps of mud although no rain had fallen this confusion of dead bodies covered the whole mountain from top to bottom those who survived stirred as little as the dead squatting in unequal groups they looked at one another scared and without speaking the lake of hippo Zaratis shone at the end of a long meadow beneath the setting sun to the right an agglomeration of white horses extended beyond a girdle of walls then the sea spread out indefinitely and the barbarians with their chins in their hands sighed as they thought of their native lands a cloud of grey dust was falling the evening wind blew then every breast dilated and as the freshness increased the vermin might be seen to forsake the dead who were colder now and to run over the hot sand crows looking towards the dying rested motionless on the tops of the big stones when night had fallen yellow-haired dogs those unclean beasts which followed the armies came quite softly into the midst of the barbarians at first they licked the clots of blood on the still tepid stumps and soon they began to devour the corpses biting into the stomachs first of all the fugitives reappeared one by one like shadows the women also ventured to return for there were still some of them left especially among the libyans in spite of the dreadful massacre of them by the numidians some took ropes ends and lighted them to use as torches others held crossed pikes the corpses were placed upon these and were conveyed apart they were found lying stretched in long lines on their backs with their mouths open and their lances beside them or else they were piled up pall-mall so that it was often necessary to dig out a whole heap in order to discover those they were wanting then the torch would be passed slowly over their faces they had received complicated wounds from hideous weapons greenish strips hung from their foreheads they were cut in pieces crushed to the marrow blue from strangulation or broadly cleft by the elephant's ivory although they had died at almost the same time there existed differences between their various states of corruption the men of the north were puffed up with livid swellings while the more nervous africans looked as though they had been smoked and were already drying up the mercenaries might be recognized by the tattooings on their hands the old soldiers of antiochus displayed a sparrow-hawk those who had served in egypt the head of the cynocephalus those who had served with the princes of asia a hatchet a pomegranate or a hammer those who had served in the greek republics the side-view of a citadel or the name of an archon 
and some were to be seen whose arms were entirely covered with these multipled symbols which mingled with their scars and their recent wounds four great funeral piles were erected for the men of latin race the samnites etruscans campanians and bratians the greeks dug pits with the points of their swords the spartans removed their red cloaks and wrapped them around the dead the athenians laid them out with their faces towards the rising sun the cantabrians buried them beneath a heap of pebbles the nasamonians bent them double with ox-leather thongs and the garamantians went and interred them on the shore so that they might be perpetually washed by the waves but the latins were grieved that they could not collect the ashes in urns the nomads regretted the heat of the sands in which bodies were mummified and the celts the three rude stones beneath a rainy sky at the end of an islet covered gulf vociferations arose followed by the lengthened silence this was to oblige the souls to return then the shouting was resumed persistently at regular intervals they made excuses to the dead for their inability to honour them as the rites prescribed for owing to this deprivation they would pass for infinite periods through all kinds of chances and metamorphoses they questioned them and asked them what they desired others loaded them with abuse for having allowed themselves to be conquered the bloodless faces lying back here and there on the wrecks of armour showed pale in the light of the green funeral pile tears provoked tears the sobs became shriller the recognitions and embracings more frantic women stretched themselves on the corpses mouth to mouth and brow to brow it was necessary to beat them in order to make them withdraw when the earth was being thrown in they blackened their cheeks they cut off their hair they drew their own blood and poured it into the pits they gnashed themselves in imitation of the wounds that disfigured the dead roarings burst forth through the crashings of the cymbals some snatched off their amulets and spat upon them the dying rolled in the bloody mire biting their mutilated fists in their rage and forty-three some nights being a sacred spring cut one another's throats like gladiators soon wood for the funeral piles failed the flames were extinguished every spot was occupied and weary from shouting weakened tottering they fell asleep close to their dead brethren those who still clung to life full of anxieties and the others desiring never to wake again in the greyness of the dawn some soldiers appeared on the outskirts of the barbarians and filed past with their helmets raised on the points of their pikes they saluted the mercenaries and asked them whether they had no messages to send to their native lands others approached and the barbarians recognized some of their former companions the suffet had proposed to all the captives that they should serve in his troops several had fearlessly refused 
and quite resolved neither to support them nor to abandon them to the great council he had sent them away with injunctions to fight no more against carthage as to those who had been rendered docile by the fear of torches they had been furnished with the weapons taken from the enemy and they were now presenting themselves to the vanquished not so much in order to seduce them as out of an impulse of pride and curiosity at first they told of the good treatment which they had received from the suffet the barbarians listened to them with jealousy although they despised them then at the first words of reproach the cowards fell into a passion they showed them from a distance their own swords and caresses and invited them with abuse to come and take them the barbarians picked up flints all took to fight and nothing more could be seen on the summit of the mountain except the lance points projecting above the edge of the palisades then the barbarians were overwhelmed with a grief that was heavier than the humiliation of the defeat they thought of the emptiness of their courage and they stood with their eyes fixed and grinding their teeth the same thought came to them all they rushed tumultuously upon the carthaginian prisoners it chanced that the suffet's soldiers had been unable to discover them and as he had withdrawn from the field of battle they were still in the deep pit they were ranged on the ground on a flattened spot sentries formed a circle around them and the women were allowed to enter thirty or forty at a time wishing to profit by the short time that was allowed to them they ran from one to the other uncertain and panting then bending over the poor bodies they struck them with all their might like washerwomen beating linen shrieking their husbands names they tore them with their nails and put out their eyes with the bodkins of their hair the men came next and tortured them from their feet which they cut off at the ankles to their foreheads from which they took crowns of skin to put upon their own heads the eaters of uncleanness were atrocious in their devices they envenomed the wounds by pouring into them dust vinegar and fragments of pottery others waited behind blood flowed and they rejoiced like vintagers round fuming vats mato however was seated on the ground at the very place where he had happened to be when the battle ended his elbows on his knees and his temples in his hands he saw nothing heard nothing and had ceased to think at the shrieks of joy uttered by the crowd he raised his head before him a strip of canvas caught on a flagpole and trailing on the ground sheltered in confused fashion blankets carpets and a lion's skin he recognized his tent and he riveted his eyes upon the ground as though hamilcar's daughter when she disappeared had sunk into the earth the torn canvas flapped in the wind the long rags of it sometimes passed across his mouth and he perceived a red mark like the print of a hand it was the hand of narhavas the token of their alliance then mato rose 
he took a firebrand which was still smoking and threw it disdainfully upon the wrecks of his tent then with the toe of his cothurn he pushed the things which fell out back towards the flame so that nothing might be left suddenly without any one being able to guess from what point he had sprung up spendius reappeared the former slave had fastened two fragments of a lance against his thigh he limped with a piteous look breathing forth complaints the while remove that said matho to him i know that you are a brave fellow for he was so crushed by the injustice of the gods that he had not strength enough to be indignant with men spendius beckoned to him and led him to a hollow of the mountain where zarxas and autaritus were lying concealed they had fled like the slave the one although he was cruel and the other in spite of his bravery but who said they could have expected the treachery of narhavas the burning of the camp of the libyans the loss of the zaimph the sudden attack by hamilcar and above all his manoeuvres which forced them to return to the bottom of the mountain beneath the instant blows of the carthaginians spendius made no acknowledgment of his terror and persisted in maintaining that his leg was broken at last the three chiefs and the skeleskim asked one another what decision should now be adopted hamilcar closed the road to carthage against them they were caught between his soldiers and the provinces belonging to narhavas the tyrian towns would join the conquerors the barbarians would find themselves driven to the edge of the sea and all those united forces would crush them this would infallibly happen thus no means presented themselves of avoiding the war accordingly they must prosecute it to the bitter end but how were they to make the necessity of an interminable battle understood by all these disheartened people who were still bleeding from their wounds i will undertake that said spendius two hours afterwards a man who came from the direction of hippo Zaretis climbed the mountain at a run he waved some tablets at arm's length and as he shouted very loudly the barbarians surrounded him the tablets had been dispatched by the greek soldiers in sardinia they recommended their african comrades to watch over gisco and the other captives a samian trader one hipponax coming from carthage had informed them that a plot was being organized to promote their escape and the barbarians were urged to take every precaution the republic was powerful spendius's stratagem did not succeed at first as he had hoped this assurance of the new peril so far from exciting frenzy raised fears and remembering hamilcar's warning lately thrown into their midst they expected something unlooked for and terrible the night was spent in great distress several even got rid of their weapons so as to soften the soffit when he presented himself but on the following day at the third watch a second runner appeared still more breathless and blackened with dust 
the greek snatched from his hand a roll of papyrus covered with phoenician writing the mercenaries were entreated not to be disheartened the brave men of tunis were coming with large reinforcements spendius first read the letter three times in succession and held up by two cappadocians who bore him seated on their shoulders he had himself conveyed from place to place and re-read it for seven hours he harangued he reminded the mercenaries of the promises of the great council the africans of the cruelties of the stewards and all the barbarians of the injustice of carthage the suffet's mildness was only a bait to capture them those who surrendered would be sold as slaves and the vanquished would perish under torture as to flight what routes could they follow not a nation would receive them whereas by continuing their efforts they would obtain at once freedom vengeance and money and they would not have long to wait since the people of tunis the whole of libya was rushing to relieve them he showed the unrolled papyrus look at it read see their promises i do not lie dogs were straying about with their black muzzles all plastered with red the men's uncovered heads were growing hot in the burning sun a nauseous smell exhaled from the badly buried corpses some even projected from the earth as far as the waist spendius called them to witness what he was saying then he raised his fists in the direction of hamilcar mato moreover was watching him and to cover his cowardice he displayed an anger by which he gradually found himself carried away devoting himself to the gods he heaped curses upon the carthaginians the torture of the captives was child's play why spare them and be ever dragging this useless cattle after one no we must put an end to it their designs are known a single one might ruin us no pity those who are worthy will be known by the speed of their legs and the force of their blows then they turned again upon the captives several were still in the last throes they were finished by the thrust of a heel in the mouth or a stab with the point of a javelin then they thought of gisco nowhere could he be seen they were disturbed with anxiety they wished at once to convince themselves of his death and to participate in it at last three sunlight shepherds discovered him at a distance of fifteen paces from the spot where mato's tent lately stood they recognized him by his long beard and they called the rest stretched on his back his arms against his hips and his knees close together he looked like a dead man laid out for the tomb nevertheless his wasted sides rose and fell and his eyes wide opened in his pallid face gazed in a continuous and intolerable fashion the barbarians looked at him at first with great astonishment since he had been living in the pit he had been almost forgotten rendered uneasy by old memories they stood at a distance and did not venture to raise their hands against him but those who were behind were murmuring and pressed forward 
when a garamantian passed through the crowd he was brandishing a sickle all understood his thought their faces purpled and smitten with shame they shrieked yes yes the man with the curved steel approached gisco he took his head and resting it upon his knee sawed it off with rapid strokes it fell great jets of blood made a hole in the dust zarxas leaped upon it and lighter than a leopard ran towards the carthaginians then when he had covered two-thirds of the mountain he drew gisco's head from his breast by the beard whirled his arm rapidly several times and the mass when thrown at last described a long parabola and disappeared behind the punic entrenchments soon at the edge of the palisades there rose two crossed standards the customary sign for claiming a corpse then four heralds chosen for their width of chest went out with great clarions and speaking through the brass tubes declared that henceforth there would be between carthaginians and barbarians neither faith pity nor gods that they refused all overtures beforehand and that envoys would be sent back with their hands cut off immediately afterwards spendius was sent to hippozaritus to procure provisions the tyrian city sent them some the same evening they ate greedily then when they were strengthened they speedily collected the remains of their baggage and their broken arms the women massed themselves in the centre and heedless of the wounded left weeping behind them they set out along the edge of the shore like a herd of wolves taking its departure they were marching upon hipposaritus resolved to take it for they had need of a town hamilcar as he perceived them at the distance had a feeling of despair in spite of the pride which he experienced in seeing them fly before him he ought to have attacked them immediately with fresh troops another similar day and the war was over if matters were protracted they would return with greater strength the tyrian towns would join them his clemency towards the vanquished had been of no avail he resolved to be pitiless the same evening he sent the great council a dromedary laden with bracelets collected from the dead and with horrible threats ordered another army to be dispatched all had for a long time believed him lost so that on learning his victory they felt a stupefaction which was almost terror the vaguely announced return of the zaimph completed the wonder thus the gods and the might of carthage seemed now to belong to him none of his enemies ventured upon complaint or recrimination owing to the enthusiasm of some and the pusillanimity of the rest an army of five thousand men was ready before the interval prescribed had elapsed this army promptly made its way to utica in order to support the suffet's rear while three thousand of the most notable citizens embarked in vessels which were to land them at hipposaritis whence they were to drive back the barbarians 
hanno had accepted the command but he entrusted the army to his lieutenant magdassin so as to lead the troops which were to be disembarked himself for he could no longer endure the shaking of the litter his disease had eaten away his lips and nostrils and had hollowed out a large hole in his face the back of his throat could be seen at a distance of ten paces and he knew himself to be so hideous that he wore a veil over his head like a woman hippo Zaretus paid no attention to his summonings nor yet to those of the barbarians but every morning the inhabitants lowered provisions to the latter in baskets and shouting from the tops of the towers pleaded the exigencies of the republic and conjured them to withdraw by means of signs they addressed the same protestations to the carthaginians who were stationed on the sea hanno contented himself with blockading the harbour without risking an attack however he permitted the judges of hippo Zaretus to admit three hundred soldiers then he departed to the cape grapes and made a long circuit so as to hem in the barbarians an inopportune and even dangerous operation his jealousy prevented him from relieving the suffet he arrested his spies impeded him in all his plans and compromised the success of the enterprise at last hamilcar wrote to the great council to rid himself of hanno and the latter returned to carthage furious at the baseness of the ancients and the madness of his colleague hence after so many hopes the situation was now still more deplorable but there was an effort not to reflect upon it and even not to talk about it End of chapter twelve part one Chapter Twelve, Part Two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter Twelve, Part Two. As if all this were not sufficient misfortune at one time, news came that the Sardinian mercenaries had crucified their general, seized the strongholds and everywhere slaughtered those of canaanitish race the roman people threatened the republic with immediate hostilities unless she gave twelve hundred talents with the whole of the island of sardinia they had accepted the alliance of the barbarians and they despatched to them flat-bottomed boats laden with meal and dried meat the carthaginians pursued these and captured five hundred men but three days afterwards a fleet coming from Byzacena and conveying provisions to carthage fonded in a storm the gods were evidently declaring against her upon this the citizens of hippo Zaretus, under pretence of an alarm made hanno's three hundred men ascend their walls then coming behind them they took them by the legs and suddenly threw them over the ramparts some who were not killed were pursued and went and drowned themselves in the sea 
utica was enduring the presence of soldiers for magdassin had acted like hanno and in accordance with his orders and deaf to hamilcar's prayers was surrounding the town as for these they were given wine mixed with mandrake and were then slaughtered in their sleep at the same time the barbarians arrived magdassin fled the gates were opened and thenceforward the two turian towns displayed an obstinate devotion to their new friends and an inconceivable hatred to their former allies this abandonment of the punic cause was a counsel and a precedent hopes of deliverance revived populations hitherto uncertain hesitated no longer everywhere there was a stir the suffet learned this and he had no assistance to look for he was now irrevocably lost he immediately dismissed narhavas who was to guard the borders of his kingdom as for himself he resolved to re-enter carthage in order to obtain soldiers and begin the war again the barbarians posted at hippo Zaratus perceived his army as it descended the mountain where could the carthaginians be going hunger no doubt was urging them on and distracted by their sufferings they were coming in spite of their weakness to give battle but they turned to the right they were fleeing they might be overtaken and all be crushed the barbarians dashed in pursuit of them the carthaginians were checked by the river it was wide this time and the west wind had not been blowing some crossed by swimming and the rest on their shields they resumed their march night fell they were out of sight the barbarians did not stop they went higher to find a narrower place the people of tunis hastened thither bringing those of utica along with them their numbers increased at every bush and the carthaginians as they lay on the ground could hear the tramping of their feet in the darkness from time to time barca had a volley of arrows discharged behind him to check them and several were killed when day broke they were in the ariana mountains at the spot where the road makes a bend then mato who was marching at the head thought that he could distinguish something green on the horizon on the summit of an eminence then the ground sank and obelisks domes and houses appeared it was carthage he leaned against a tree to keep himself from falling so rapidly did his heart beat he thought of all that had come to pass in his existence since the last time that he had passed that way it was an infinite surprise it stunned him then he was transported with joy at the thought of seeing salambo again the reasons which he had for execrating her returned to his recollection but he very quickly rejected them quivering and with straining eyeballs he gazed at the lofty terrace of a palace above the palm-trees beyond eskmoun a smile of ecstasy lighted his face as if some great light had reached him he opened his arms and sent kisses on the breeze and murmured come come a sigh swelled his breast and two long tears like pearls fell upon his beard what stays you cried spendius make haste forward the suffered is going to escape us but your knees are tottering and you are looking at me like a drunken man he stamped with impatience and urged matto his eyes twinkling as at the approach of an object long aimed at 
ah we have reached it we are there i have them he had so convinced and triumphant an air that matho was surprised from his torpor and felt himself carried away by it these words coming when his distress was at its height drove his despair to vengeance and pointed to food for his wrath he bounded upon one of the camels that were among the baggage snatched up its halter and with the long rope struck the stragglers with all his might running right and left alternately in the rear of the army like a dog driving a flock at this thundering voice the lines of men closed up even the lame hurried their steps the intervening space lessened in the middle of the isthmus the foremost of the barbarians were marching in the dust raised by the carthaginians the two armies were coming close and were on the point of touching but the malqua gate the tagaste gate and the great gate of Camon threw wide their leaves the punic square divided three columns were swallowed up and eddied beneath the porches soon the mass being too tightly packed could advance no further pikes clashed in the air and the arrows of the barbarians were shivering against the walls hamilcar was to be seen on the threshold of Camon. he turned around and shouted to his men to move aside he dismounted from his horse and pricking it on the croup with the sword which he held sent it against the barbarians it was a black stallion which was fed on balls of meal and would bend its knees to allow its master to mount why was he sending it away was this a sacrifice the noble horse galloped into the midst of the lances knocked down men and entangling its feet in its entrails fell down then rose again with furious leaps and while they were moving aside trying to stop it or looking at it in surprise the carthaginians had united again they entered and the enormous gate shut echoing behind them it would not yield the barbarians came crushing against it and for some minutes there was an oscillation throughout the army which became weaker and weaker and at last ceased the carthaginians had placed soldiers on the aqueduct they began to hurl stones balls and beams spendius represented that it would be best not to persist the barbarians went and posted themselves further off all being quite resolved to lay siege to carthage the rumour of the war however had passed beyond the confines of the punic empire and from the pillars of hercules to beyond serene shepherds mused on it as they kept their flocks and caravans talked about it in the light of the stars this great carthage mistress of the seas splendid as the sun and terrible as a god actually found men who were daring enough to attack her her fall even had been asserted several times and all had believed it for all wished it the subject populations the tributary villages the allied provinces the independent hordes those who execrated her for her tyranny or were jealous of her power or coveted her wealth the bravest had very speedily joined the mercenaries the defeat at the makaras had checked all the rest at last they had recovered confidence had gradually advanced and approached and now the men of the eastern regions were lying on the sand hills of clypea on the other side of the gulf as soon as they perceived the barbarians they showed themselves they were not libyans from the neighbourhood of carthage who had long composed the third army 
but nomads from the table-land of barca bandits from cape fiscus and the promontory of derna from fazana and marmarica they had crossed the desert drinking at the brackish wells walled in with camel's bones the zuaeses with their covering of ostrich feathers had come on quadrigae the garamantians masked with black veils rode behind on their painted mares others were mounted on asses on ages, zebras and buffaloes while some dragged after them the roofs of their sloop-shaped huts together with their families and idols they were ammonians with the limbs wrinkled by the hot water of the springs atarantians who curse the sun troglodytes who bury their dead with laughter beneath the branches of trees and the hideous oceans who eat grasshoppers the acurmachidae who eat lice and the vermilion painted gusantians who eat apes all were ranged along the edge of the sea in a great straight line afterwards they advanced like tornadoes of sand raised by the wind in the centre of the isthmus the throng stopped the mercenaries who were posted in front of them close to the walls being unwilling to move then from the direction of ariana appeared the men of the west the people of the numidians in fact narhavas governed only the massilians and moreover as they were permitted by custom to abandon their king when reverses were sustained they had assembled on the zainus and then had crossed it at hamilcar's first movement first were seen running up all the hunters from malethot baal and garaphos clad in lions skins and with the staves of their pikes driving small lean horses with long manes then marched the Gatulians in cuirasses of serpent's skin then the pharusians wearing lofty crowns made of wax and resin and the conians macarians and tilabarians each holding two javelins and a round shield of hippototomus leather they stopped at the foot of the catacombs among the first pools of the lagoon but when the libyans had moved away the multitude of the negroes appeared like a cloud on a level with the ground in the place which the others had occupied they were there from the white harush the black harush the desert of ogila and even from the great country of agazumba which is four months journey south of the garamantians and from regions further still in spite of their red wooden jewels the filth of their black skin made them look like mulberries that had been long rolling in the dust they had bark thread drawers dried grass tunics fellow deer muzzles on their heads they shook rods furnished with rings and brandished cows tails at the end of sticks after the fashion of standards howling the while like wolves then behind the numidians marusians and getulians pressed the yellowish men who are spread through the cedar forest beyond tagir they had cat-skin quivers flapping against their shoulders and they led in leashes enormous dogs which were as high as asses and did not bark finally as though africa had not been sufficiently emptied and it had been necessary to seek further fury in the very dregs of the races men might be seen behind the rest with beast-like profiles and grinning with idiotic laughter wretches ravaged by hideous diseases deformed pygmies 
mulattoes of doubtful sex albinos whose red eyes blinked in the sun stammering out unintelligible sounds they put a finger into their mouths to show that they were hungry the confusion of weapons was as great as that of garments and peoples there was not a deadly invention that was not present from wooden daggers stone hatchets and ivory tridents to long sabres toothed like saws slender and formed of a yielding copper blade they handled cutlasses which were forked into several branches like antelopes horns bills fastened to the end of ropes iron triangles clubs and bodkins the ethiopians from the bambotus had little poisoned darts hidden in their hair many had brought pebbles in bags others empty-handed chattered with their teeth this multitude was stirred with a ceaseless swell dromedaries smeared all over with tar-like streaks knocked down the women who carried their children on their hips the provisions in the baskets were pouring out in walking pieces of salt parcels of gum rotten dates and guru nuts were crushed under foot and sometimes on vermin-covered bosoms there would hang a slender cord supporting a diamond that the satraps had sought an almost fabulous stone sufficient to purchase an empire most of them did not even know what they desired they were impelled by fascination or curiosity and nomads who had never seen a town were frightened by the shadows of the walls the isthmus were now hidden by men and this long surface whereon the tents were like huts amid an inundation stretched as far as the first lines of the other barbarians which were streaming with steel and were posted symmetrically upon both sides of the aqueduct the carthaginians had not recovered from the terror caused by their arrival when they perceived the siege engines set by the tyrian towns coming straight towards them like monsters and like buildings with their masts arms ropes articulations capitals and carapaces sixty caraballistas eighty onagers thirty scorpions fifty tolenos twelve rams and three gigantic catapults which hurled pieces of rock of the weight of fifteen talents masses of men clinging to their bases pushed them on at every step a quivering shook them and in this way they arrived in front of the walls but several days were still needed to finish the preparation for the siege the mercenaries taught by their defeats would not risk themselves in useless engagements and on both sides there was no haste for it was well known that a terrible action was about to open and that the result of it would be complete victory or complete extermination carthage might hold out for a long time her broad walls presented a series of re-entrant and projecting angles an advantageous arrangement for repelling assaults nevertheless a portion had fallen down in the direction of the catacombs and on dark nights lights could be seen in the dens of malqua through the disjointed blocks these in some places overlooked the top of the ramparts it was here that the mercenaries wives who had been driven away by Mato, were living with their new husbands on seeing the men again their hearts could stand it no longer they waved their scarfs at a distance then they came and chatted in the darkness with the soldiers through the cleft in the wall and one morning 
the great council learned that they had all fled some had passed through between the stones others with greater intrepidity had let themselves down with ropes at last spendius resolved to accomplish his design the war by keeping him at a distance had hitherto prevented him and since the return to before carthage it seemed to him that the inhabitants suspected his enterprise but soon they diminished the sentries on the aqueduct there were not too many people for the defence of the walls the former slave practised himself for some days in shooting arrows at the flamingos on the lake then one moonlit evening he begged matto to light a great fire of straw in the middle of the night while all his men were to shout at the same time and taking zarxas with him he went away along the edge of the gulf in the direction of tunis when on a level with the last arches they returned straight towards the aqueduct the place was unprotected they crawled to the base of the pillars the sentries on the platform were walking quietly up and down towering flames appeared clarions rang and the soldiers on vendette believing that there was an assault rushed away in the direction of carthage one man had remained he showed black against the background of the sky the moon was shining behind him and his shadow which was of extravagant size looked in the distance like an obelisk proceeding across the plain they waited until he was in position just before them zarxas seized his sling but whether from prudence or from ferocity spendius stopped him no the whiz of the bullet would make a noise let me then he bent his bow with all his strength resting the lower end of it against the great toe of his left foot he took aim and the arrow went off the man did not fall he disappeared if he were wounded we should hear him said spendius and he mounted quickly from story to story as he had done the first time with the assistance of a rope and a harpoon then when he had reached the top and was beside the corpse he let it fall again the balearian fastened a pick and a malay to it and turned back the trumpets sounded no longer all was now quiet spendius had raised one of the flagstones and entering the water had closed it behind him calculating the distance by the number of his steps he arrived at the exact spot where he had noticed an oblique fissure and for three hours until morning he worked in continuous and furious fashion breathing with difficulty through the interstices in the upper flagstones assailed with anguish and twenty times believing that he was going to die at last a crack was heard and a huge stone ricocheting on the lower arches rolled to the ground and suddenly a cataract an entire river fell from the skies on to the plain the aqueduct being cut through in the centre was emptying itself it was death to carthage and victory for the barbarians in an instant the awakened carthaginians appeared on the walls the houses and the temples the barbarians pressed forward with shouts they danced in delirium around the great waterfall and came up and wet their heads in it in the extravagance of their joy a man in a torn brown tunic was perceived on the summit of the aqueduct he stood leaning over the very edge with both hands on his hips 
and was looking down below him as though astonished at his work then he drew himself up he surveyed the horizon with a haughty air which seemed to say all that is now mine the applause of the barbarians burst forth while the carthaginians comprehending their disaster at last shrieked with despair then he began to run about the platform from one end to the other and like a chariot driver triumphant at the olympic games spendius distraught with pride raised his arms aloft End of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen part one of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter thirteen part one. Moloch. The barbarians had no need of a circumvallation on the side of Africa, for it was theirs, but to facilitate the approach to the walls, the entrenchments bordering the ditch were thrown down mato next divided the army into great semicircles so as to encompass carthage the better the hoplites of the mercenaries were placed in the first rank and behind them the slingers and horsemen quite at the back were the baggage chariots and horses and the engines bristled in front of this throng at a distance of three hundred paces from the towers amid the infinite variety of their nomenclature which changed several times in the course of the centuries these machines might be reduced to two systems some acted like slings and the rest like bows the first which were the catapults were composed of a square frame with two vertical uprights and a horizontal bar in its interior portion was a cylinder furnished with cables which held back a great beam bearing a spoon for the reception of projectiles its base was caught in a skein of twisted thread and when the ropes were let go it sprang up and struck against the bar which checking it with a shock multiplied its power the second presented a more complicated mechanism a crossbar had its centre fixed on a little pillar and from this point of junction there branched off at right angles a sort of channel two caps containing twists of horsehair stood at the extremities of the crossbar two small beams were fastened to them to hold the extremities of a rope which was brought to the bottom of the channel upon a tablet of bronze this metal plate was released by a spring and sliding in grooves impelled the arrows the catapults were likewise called onagers after the wild asses which fling up stones with their feet and the ballistas scorpions on account of a hook which stood upon the tablet and being lowered by a blow of the fist released the spring their construction required learned calculations the wood selected had to be of the hardest substance and their gearing all of brass they were stretched with levers tackle blocks capstans and tympanums the direction of the shooting was changed by means of strong pivots they were moved forward on cylinders and the most considerable of them which were brought piece by piece were set up in front of the enemy spendius arranged three great catapults opposite the three principal angles 
he placed a ram before every gate a ballista before every tower while caraballistas were to move about in the rear but it was necessary to protect them against the fire thrown by the besieged and first of all to fill up the trench which separated them from the walls they pushed forward galleries formed of hurdles of green reeds and oaken semicircles like enormous shields gliding on three wheels the workers were sheltered in little huts covered with raw hides and stuffed with rack the catapults and ballistas were protected by rope curtains which had been steeped in vinegar to render them incombustible the women and children went to procure stones on the strand and gathered earth with their hands and brought it to the soldiers the carthaginians also made preparations hamilcar had speedily reassured them by declaring that there was enough water left in the cisterns for one hundred and twenty-three days this assertion together with his presence and above all that of the zaimph among them gave them good hopes carthage recovered from its dejection those who were not of chanaitish origin were carried away by the passion of the rest the slaves were armed the arsenals were emptied and every citizen had his own post and his own employment twelve hundred of the fugitives had survived and the suffet made them all captains and carpenters armourers blacksmiths and goldsmiths were entrusted with the engines the carthaginians had kept a few in spite of the conditions of the peace with rome these were repaired they understood such work the two northern and eastern sides being protected by the sea and the gulf remained inaccessible on the wall fronting the barbarians they collected tree trunks millstones vases filled with sulphur and vats filled with oil and built furnaces stones were heaped up on the platforms of the towers and the houses bordering immediately on the rampart were crammed with sand in order to strengthen it and increase its thickness the barbarians grew angry at the sight of these preparations they wished to fight at once the weights which they put into the catapults were so extravagantly heavy that the beams broke and the attack was delayed at last on the thirteenth day of the month of shabar at sunrise a great blow was heard at the gate of Carmon seventy-five soldiers were pulling at ropes arranged at the base of a gigantic beam which was suspended horizontally by chains hanging from a framework and which terminated in a ram's head of pure brass it had been swathed in ox hides it was bound at intervals with iron bracelets it was thrice as thick as a man's body one hundred and twenty cubits long and under the crowd of naked arms pushing it forward and drawing it back it moved to and fro with a regular oscillation the other rams before the other gates began to be in motion men might be seen mounting from step to step in the hollow wheels of the tympanums the pulleys and caps grated the rope curtains were lowered and showers of stones and showers of arrows poured forth simultaneously all the scattered slingers ran up some approached the rampart hiding pots of resin under their shields then they would hurl these with all their might this hail of bullets darts and flames passed above the first ranks in the form of a curve which fell behind the walls 
but long cranes used for masting vessels were reared on the summit of the ramparts and from them there descended some of these enormous pincers which terminated in two semicircles toothed on the inside they bit the rams the soldiers clung to the beam and drew it back the carthaginians hauled in order to pull it up and the action was prolonged until the evening when the mercenaries resumed their tasks on the following day the tops of the walls were completely carpeted with bales of cotton sails and cushions the battlements were stopped up with mats and a line of forks and blades fixed upon sticks might be distinguished among the cranes of the rampart a furious resistance immediately began trunks of trees fastened to cables fell and rose alternately and battered the rams cramps hurled by the ballistas tore away the roofs of the huts and streams of flints and pebbles poured from the platforms of the towers at last the rams broke the gates of Camon and tagaste but the carthaginians had piled up such an abundance of materials on the inside that the leaves did not open they remained standing then they drove augers against the walls these were applied to the joints of the blocks so as to detach the latter the engines were better managed the men serving them were divided into squads and they were worked from morning till evening without interruption and with the monotonous precision of a weaver's loom spendius returned to them untiringly it was he who stretched the skeins of the ballistas in order that the twin tangents might completely correspond the ropes as they were tightened were struck on the right and left alternately until both sides gave out an equal sound spendius would mount upon the timbers he would strike the ropes softly with the extremity of his foot and strain his ears like a musician tuning a lyre then when the beam of the catapult rose when the pillar of the ballista trembled with the shock of the spring when the stones were shooting in rays and the darts pouring in streams he would incline his whole body and fling his arms into the air as though to follow them the soldiers admired his skill and executed his commands in the gaiety of their work they gave utterance to jests on the names of the machines thus the pliers for seizing the rams were called wolves and the galleries were covered with vines they were lambs or they were going to gather the grapes as they loaded their pieces they would say to the onagers come pick well and to the scorpions pierce them to the heart these jokes which were ever the same kept up their courage nevertheless the machines did not demolish the rampart it was formed of two walls and was completely filled with earth the upper portions were beaten down but each time the besieged raised them again matho ordered the construction of wooden towers which should be as high as the towers of stone they cast turf stakes pebbles and chariots with their wheels into the trench so as to fill it up the more quickly but before this was accomplished the immense throng of the barbarians undulated over the plain with a single movement and came beating against the foot of the walls like an overflowing sea they moved forward the rope ladders straight ladders and sambucas 
the latter consisting of two poles from which a series of bamboos terminating in a movable bridge were lowered by means of tackling they formed numerous straight lines resting against the wall and the mercenaries mounted them in files holding their weapons in their hands not a carthaginian showed himself already two-thirds of the rampart had been covered then the battlements opened vomiting flames and smoke like dragon jaws the sand scattered and entered the joints of their armour the petroleum fastened on their garments the liquid lead hopped on their helmets and made holes in their flesh a rain of sparks splashed against their faces and eyeless orbits seemed to weep tears as big as almonds there were men all yellow with oil with their hair in flames they began to run and set fire to the rest they were extinguished in mantles steeped in blood which were thrown from a distance over their faces some who had no wounds remained motionless stiffer than snakes their mouths open and their arms outspread the assault was renewed for several days in succession the mercenaries hoping to triumph by extraordinary energy and audacity sometimes a man raised on the shoulders of another would drive a pin between the stones and then making use of it as a step to reach further would place a second and a third and protected by the edge of the battlements which stood out from the wall they would gradually raise themselves in this way but on reaching a certain height they always fell back again the great trench was full to overflowing the wounded were massed pell-mell with the dead and dying beneath the footsteps of the living calcined trunks formed black spots amid opened entrails scattered brains and pools of blood and arms and legs projecting halfway out of a heap would stand straight up like a props in a burning vineyard the ladders proving insufficient the tolinos were brought into requisition instruments consisting of a long beam set traversely upon another and bearing at its extremity a quadrangular basket which would hold thirty-foot soldiers with their weapons mato wished to ascend in the first that was ready spendius stopped him some men bent over a capstan the great beam rose became horizontal reared itself almost vertically and being overweight at the end bent like a huge reed the soldiers who were crowded together were hidden up to their chins only their helmet plumes could be seen at last when it was twenty cubits high in the air it turned several times to the right and to the left and then was depressed and like a giant arm holding a cohort of pygmies in its hand it laid the basket full of men upon the edge of the wall they leaped into the crowd and never returned all the other tolinos were speedily made ready but a hundred times as many would have been needed for the capture of the town they were utilized in a murderous fashion ethiopian archers were placed in the baskets then the cables having been fastened they remained suspended and shot poisoned arrows the fifty tolinos commanding the battlements thus surrounded carthage like monstrous vultures and the negroes laughed to see the guards on the ramparts dying in grievous convulsions hamilcar sent hoplites to these posts and every morning made them drink the juice of certain herbs which protected them against the poison 
one evening when it was dark he embarked the best of his soldiers on lighters and planks and turning to the right of the harbour disembarked on the taenia then he advanced to the first lines of the barbarians and taking them in flank made a great slaughter men hanging to ropes would descend at night from the top of the wall with torches in their hands burn the works of the mercenaries and then mount up again matho was exasperated every obstacle strengthened his wrath which led him into terrible extravagances he mentally summoned salambo to an interview then he waited she did not come this seemed to him like a fresh piece of treachery and henceforth he execrated her if he had seen her corpse he would perhaps have gone away he doubled the outposts he planted forks at the foot of the rampart he drove caltrops into the ground and he commanded the libyans to bring him a whole forest that he might set it on fire and burn carthage like a den of foxes spendius went on obstinately with the siege he sought to invent terrible machines such as had never before been constructed the other barbarians encamped at a distance on the isthmus were amazed at these delays they murmured and they were let loose then they rushed with their cutlasses and javelins and beat against the gates with them but the nakedness of their bodies facilitating the infliction of wounds the carthaginians massacred them freely and the mercenaries rejoiced at it no doubt through jealousy about the plunder hence there resulted quarrels and combats between them then the country having been ravaged provisions were soon scarce they grew disheartened numerous hordes went away but the crowd was so great that the loss was not apparent the best of them tried to dig mines but the earth being badly supported fell in they began again in other places but hamilcar always guessed the direction that they were taking by holding his ear against a bronze shield he bored countermines beneath the path along which the wooden towers were to move and when they were pushed forward they sank into the holes at last all recognized that the town was impregnable unless a long terrace was raised to the same height as the walls so as to enable them to fight on the same level the top of it should be paved so that the machines might be rolled along then carthage would find it quite impossible to resist the town was beginning to suffer from thirst the water which was worth to kisitas the bath at the opening of the siege was now sold for a shekel of silver the stores of meat and corn were also becoming exhausted there was a dread of famine and some even began to speak of useless mouths which terrified every one from the square of Carmon to the temple of melkarth the streets were cumbered with corpses and as it was the end of summer the combatants were annoyed by the great black flies old men carried off the wounded and the devout continued the fictitious funerals for their relatives and friends who had died far away during the war waxen statues with clothes and hair were displayed across the gates they melted in the heat of the tapers burning beside them the paint flowed down upon their shoulders and tears streamed over the faces of the living as they chanted mournful songs beside them 
the crowd meanwhile ran to and fro armed bands passed captains shouted orders while the shocks of the rams beating against the rampart was constantly heard the temperature became so heavy that the bodies swelled and would no longer fit into the coffins they were burned in the centre of the courts but the fires being too much confined kindled the neighbouring walls and long flames suddenly burst from the houses like blood spurting from an artery thus moloch was in possession of carthage he clasped the ramparts he rolled through the streets he devoured the very corpses men wearing cloaks made of collected rags in token of despair stationed themselves in the corners of the crossways they declaimed against the ancients and against hamilcar predicted complete ruin to the people and invited them to universal destruction and license the most dangerous were the henbane drinkers in their crisis they believed themselves wild beasts and leaped upon the passers-by to rend them mobs formed around them and the defence of carthage was forgotten the suffet devised the payment of others to support his policy End of chapter thirteen part one Chapter Thirteen, Part Two of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Thirteen, Part Two. In order to retain the genius of the gods within the town, their images had been covered with chains. Black veils were placed upon the Patek gods, and hair cloths around the altars and attempts were made to excite the pride and jealousy of the baals by singing in their ears thou art about to suffer thyself to be vanquished are the others perchance more strong show thyself aid us that the people may not say where are now their gods the colleges of the pontiffs were agitated by unceasing anxiety those of rabetna were especially afraid the restoration of the zaimph having been of no avail they kept themselves shut up in the third enclosure which was as impregnable as a fortress only one among them the high priest shahabarim ventured to go out he used to visit salambo but he would either remain perfectly silent gazing at her with fixed eyeballs or else would be lavish of words and the reproaches that he uttered were harder than ever with inconceivable inconsistency he would not forgive the young girl for carrying out his commands shahabarim had guessed all and this haunting thought revived the jealousies of his impotence he accused her of being the cause of the war mato according to him was besieging carthage to recover the zaimph and he poured out imprecations and sarcasms upon this barbarian who pretended to the possession of holy things yet it was not this that the priest wished to say but just now salambo felt no terror of him the anguish which she used formerly to suffer had left her a strange peacefulness possessed her her gaze was less wandering and shone with limpid fire meanwhile the python had become ill again and as salambo on the contrary appeared to be recovering 
old tarnach rejoiced in the conviction that by its decline it was taking away the languor of her mistress one morning she found it coiled up behind the bed of ox hides colder than marble and with its head hidden by a heap of worms her cries brought salambo to the spot she turned it over for a while with the tip of her sandal and the slave was amazed at her insensibility hamilcar's daughter no longer prolonged her fasts with so much fervour she passed whole days on the top of her terrace leaning her elbows against the balustrade and amusing herself by looking out before her the summits of the walls at the end of the town cut uneven zigzags upon the sky and the lances of the sentries formed what was like a border of corn ears throughout their length further away she could see the manoeuvres of the barbarians between the towers on days when the siege was interrupted she could even distinguish their occupations they mended their weapons greased their hair and washed their blood-stained arms in the sea the tents were closed the beasts of burden were feeding and in the distance the scythes of the chariots which were all arranged in a semicircle looked like a silver scimitar lying at the base of the mountains shahabarim's talk recurred to her memory she was waiting for nar havas her betrothed in spite of her hatred she would have liked to see matto again of all the carthaginians she was perhaps the only one who would have spoken to him without fear her father often came into her room he would sit down panting on the cushions and gaze at her with an almost tender look as if he found some rest from his fatigues in the sight of her he sometimes questioned her about her journey to the camp of the mercenaries he even asked her whether any one had urged her to it and with a shake of the head she answered no so proud was salambo of having saved the zaimph but the suffet always came back to matto under the pretence of making military inquiries he could not understand how the hours which she had spent in the tent had been employed salambo in fact said nothing about gisco for as words had an effective power in themselves curses if reported to any one might be turned against him and she was silent about her wish to assassinate lest she should be blamed for not having yielded to it she said that the skulliskim appeared furious that he had shouted a great deal and that he had then fallen asleep salambo told no more through scheme perhaps or else because she was led by her extreme ingenuousness to attach but little importance to the soldier's kisses moreover it all floated through her head in a melancholy and misty fashion like the recollection of a depressing dream and she would not have known in what way or in what words to express it one evening when they were thus face to face with each other tarnach came in looking quite scared an old man with a child was yonder in the courts and wished to see the suffet hamilcar turned pale and then quickly replied let him come up idibal entered without prostrating himself he held a young boy covered with a goat's hair cloak by the hand and at once raised the hood which screened his face here he is master take him the suffet and the slave went into a corner of the room the child remained in the centre standing upright and with a gaze of attention rather than of astonishment he surveyed the ceiling the furniture the pearl necklaces trailing on the purple draperies 
and the majestic maiden who was bending over towards him he was perhaps ten years old and was not taller than a roman sword his curly hair shaded his swelling forehead his eyeballs looked as if they were seeking for space the nostrils of his delicate nose were broad and palpitating and upon his whole person was displayed the indefinable splendour of those who are destined to great enterprises when he had cast aside his extremely heavy cloak he remained clad in a lynx skin which was fastened about his waist and he rested his little naked feet which were all white with dust resolutely upon the pavement but he no doubt divined that important matters were under discussion for he stood motionless with one hand behind his back his chin lowered and a finger in his mouth at last hamilcar attracted salambo with a sign and said to her in a low voice you will keep him with you you understand no one even though belonging to the house must know of his existence then behind the door he again asked idibal whether he was quite sure that they had not been noticed no said the slave the streets were empty as the war filled all the provinces he had feared for his master's son then not knowing where to hide him he had come along the coasts in a sloop and for three days idibal had been tacking about in the gulf and watching the ramparts at last that evening as the environs of Kamon seemed to be deserted he had passed briskly through the channel and landed near the arsenal the entrance to the harbour being free but soon the barbarians posted an immense raft in front of it in order to prevent the carthaginians from coming out they were again rearing the wooden towers and the terrace was rising at the same time outside communications were cut off and an intolerable famine set in the besieged killed all the dogs all the mules all the asses and then the fifteen elephants which the suffet had brought back the lions of the temple of moloch had become ferocious and the hero duels no longer durst approach them they were fed at first with the wounded barbarians then they were thrown corpses that were still warm they refused them and they all died people wandered in the twilight among the old enclosures and gathered grass and flowers among the stones to boil them in wine wine being cheaper than water others crept as far as the enemy's outposts and entered the tents to steal food and the stupefied barbarians sometimes allowed them to return at last a day arrived when the ancients resolved to slaughter the horses of eskmoun privately they were holy animals whose manes were plated by the pontiffs with gold ribbons and whose existence denoted the motion of the sun the idea of fire in its most exalted form their flesh was cut into equal portions and buried behind the altar then every evening the ancients alleging some act of devotion would go up to the temple and regale themselves in secret and each would take away a piece beneath his tunic for his children in the deserted quarters remote from the walls the inhabitants whose misery was not so great had barricaded themselves through fear of the rest the stones from the catapults and the demolition commanded for purposes of defence had accumulated heaps of ruins in the middle of the streets at the quietest times masses of people would suddenly rush along with shouts and from the top of the acropolis 
the conflagrations were like purple rags scattered upon the terraces and twisted by the wind the three great catapults did not stop in spite of all these works their ravages were extraordinary thus a man's head rebounded from the pediment of the Susitia. a woman who was being confined in the street of Kinisto was crushed by a block of marble and her child was carried with the bed as far as the crossways of sinasin where the coverlet was found the most annoying were the bullets of the slingers they fell upon the roofs and in the gardens and in the middle of the courts while people were at table before a slender meal with their hearts big with sighs these cruel projectiles bore engraved letters which stamped themselves upon the flesh and insults might be read on corpses such as pig jackal vermin and sometimes jests catch it or i have well deserved it the portion of the rampart which extended from the corner of the harbours to the extent of the cisterns was broken down then the people of malqua found themselves caught between the old enclosure of bizra behind and the barbarians in front but there was enough to be done in thickening the wall and making it as high as possible without troubling about them they were abandoned all perished and although they were generally hated hamilcar came to be greatly abhorred on the morrow he opened the pits in which he kept stores of corn and his stewards gave it to the people for three days they gorged themselves their thirst however only became the more intolerable and they could constantly see before them the long cascade formed by the clear falling water of the aqueduct a thin vapour with a rainbow beside it went up from its base beneath the rays of the sun and a little stream curving through the plain fell into the gulf hamilcar did not give way he was reckoning upon an event upon something decisive and extraordinary his own slaves tore off the silver plates from the temple of melkarth four long boats were drawn out of the harbour they were brought by means of capstans to the front of the mapalian quarter the wall facing the shore was bored and they set out for the gauls to buy mercenaries there at no matter what price nevertheless hamilcar was distressed at his inability to communicate with the king of the numidians for he knew that he was behind the barbarians and ready to fall upon them but narhavas being too weak was not going to make any venture alone and the suffet had the rampart raised twelve palms higher all the material in the arsenals piled up in the acropolis and the machines repaired once more sinews taken from bulls necks or else stags hamstrings were commonly employed for the twists of the catapults however neither stags nor bulls were in existence in carthage hamilcar asked the ancients for the hair of their wives all sacrificed it but the quantity was not sufficient in the buildings of the Sicitia there were twelve hundred marriageable slaves destined for prostitution in greece and italy and their hair having been rendered elastic by the use of unguents was wonderfully well adapted for engines of war but the subsequent loss would be too great accordingly it was decided that a choice should be made of the finest heads of hair among the wives of the plebeians careless of their country's needs they shrieked in despair when the servants of the hundred came with scissors to lay hands upon them the barbarians were animated with increased fury they could be seen in the distance taking fat from the dead to grease their machines while others pulled out the nails 
and stitched them to the end to make caresses they devised a plan of putting into the catapults vessels filled with serpents which had been brought by the negroes the clay pots broke on the flagstones the serpents ran about seemed to multiply and so numerous were they to issue naturally from the walls then the barbarians not satisfied with their invention improved upon it they hurled all kinds of filth human excrements pieces of carrion corpses the plague reappeared the teeth of the carthaginians fell out of their mouths and their gums were discoloured like those of camels after too long a journey the machines were set up on the terrace although the latter did not as yet reach everywhere to the height of the rampart before the twenty-three towers on the fortification stood twenty-three others of wood all the tolinos were mounted again and in the centre a little further back appeared the formidable helepolis of demetrius poliorcetes which spendius had at last reconstructed of pyramidical shape like the pharos of alexandria it was one hundred and thirty cubits high and twenty-three wide with nine stories diminishing as they approached the summit and protected by scales of brass they were pierced with numerous doors and filled with soldiers and on the upper platform there stood a catapult flanked by two ballistas then hamilcar planted crosses for those who should speak of surrender and even the women were brigaded the people lay in the streets and waited full of distress then one morning before sunrise it was the seventh day of the month of nisan they heard a great shout uttered by all the barbarians simultaneously the leaden-tubed trumpets pealed and the great paphlagonian horns bellowed like bulls all rose and ran to the rampart a forest of lances pikes and swords bristled at its base it leaped against the wall the ladders grappled them and barbarians heads appeared in the intervals of the battlement beams supported by long files of men were battering at the gates and in order to demolish the wall at places where the terrace was wanting the mercenaries came up in serried cohorts the first line crawling the second bending their hams and the others rising in succession to the last who stood upright while elsewhere in order to climb up the tallest advanced in front and the lowest in the rear and all rested their shields upon their helmets with their left arms joining them together at the edges so tightly that they might have been taken for an assemblage of large tortoises the projectiles slid over those oblique masses the carthaginians threw down millstones pestles vats casks bits everything that could serve as a weight and could knock down some watched at the embrasures with fishermen's nets and when the barbarians arrived he found himself caught in the meshes and struggled like a fish they demolished their own battlements portions of wall fell down raising a great dust and as the catapults on the terrace were shooting over against one another the stones would strike together and shiver into a thousand pieces making a copious shower upon the combatants soon the two crowds formed but one great chain of human bodies it overflowed into the intervals in the terrace and somewhat looser at the two extremities swayed perpetually without advancing they clasped one another lying flat on the ground like wrestlers they crushed one another 
the women leaned over the battlements and shrieked they were dragged away by their veils and the whiteness of their suddenly uncovered sides shone in the arms of the negroes as the latter buried their daggers in them some corpses did not fall being too much repressed by the crowd and supported by the shoulders of their companions advanced for some minutes quite upright and with staring eyes some who had both temples pierced by a javelin swayed their heads about like bears mouths opened to shout remained gaping severed hands flew through the air mighty blows were dealt which were long talked of by the survivors meanwhile arrows darted from the towers of wood and stone the tolinos moved their long yards rapidly and as the barbarians had sacked the old cemetery of the aborigines beneath the catacombs they hurled the tombstones against the carthaginians sometimes the cables broke under the weight of two heavy baskets and masses of men all with uplifted arms would fall from the sky up to the middle of the day the veterans had attacked the taenia fiercely in order to penetrate into the harbour and destroy the fleet hamilcar had a fire of damp straw lit upon the roofing of Carmon, and as the smoke blinded them they fell back to the left and came to swell the horrible rout which was pressing forward in malqua some syntagmata composed of sturdy men chosen expressly for the purpose had broken in three gates they were checked by lofty barriers made of planks studded with nails but a fourth yielded easily they dashed over it at a run and rolled into a pit in which there were hidden snares at the southwest gate autaritus and his men broke down the rampart the fissure which had been stooped up with bricks the ground behind rose and they climbed in it nimbly but on the top they found a second wall composed of stones and long beams lying quite flat and alternating like the squares of a chessboard it was a gaulish fashion and had been adapted by the suffet to the requirements of the situation the gauls imagined themselves before a town of their own country their attack was weak and they were repulsed all the round way from the street of Carmon as far as the green market now belonged to the barbarians and the samnites were finishing off the dying with blows of stakes or else with one foot on the wall were gazing down at the smoking ruins beneath them and the battle which was beginning again in the distance the slingers which were distributed through the rear were still shooting but the springs of the arcanian slings had broken from use and many were throwing stones with the hand like shepherds the rest hurled leaden bullets with the handle of a whip xarxas his shoulders covered with his long black hair went about everywhere and let on the barbarians two pouches hung at his hips he thrust his left hand into them continually while his right arm whirled around like a chariot wheel End of chapter thirteen part two Chapter thirteen part three of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter thirteen part three. Mato had at first refrained from fighting, the better to command the barbarians all at once. He had been seen along the gulf with the mercenaries, 
near the lagoon with the numidians and on the shores of the lake among the negroes and from the back part of the plain he urged forward masses of soldiers who came ceaselessly against the ramparts by degrees he had drawn near the smell of blood the sight of carnage and the tumult of clarions had at last made his heart leap then he had gone back into his tent and throwing off his caress had taken his lion's skin as being more convenient for battle the snout fitted upon his head bordering his face with a circle of fangs the two forepaws were crossed upon his breast and the claws of the hinder ones fell beneath his knees he had kept on his strong waist-belt wherein gleamed a two-edged axe and with his great sword in both hands he had dashed impetuously through the breach like a pruner cutting willow branches and trying to strike off as much as possible so as to make the more money he marched along mowing down the carthaginians around him those who tried to seize him in flank he knocked down with blows of the pommel when they attacked him in front he ran them through if they fled he clove them two men leaped together upon his back he bounded backwards against a gate and crushed them his sword fell and rose it shivered on the angle of a wall then he took his heavy axe and front and rear he ripped up the carthaginians like a flock of sheep they scattered more and more and he was quite alone when he reached the second enclosure at the foot of the acropolis the materials which had been flung from the summit cumbered the steps and were heaped up higher than the wall Mato turned back amid the ruins to summon his companions. He perceived their crests scattered over the multitude. They were sinking, and their wearers were about to perish. He dashed towards them. Then the vast wreath of red plumes closed in, and they soon rejoined him and surrounded him but an enormous crowd was discharging from the side streets he was caught by the hips lifted up and carried away outside the ramparts to a spot where the terrace was high mato shouted a command and all the shields sank upon the helmets he leaped upon them in order to catch hold somewhere so as to re-enter carthage and flourishing his terrible axe ran over the shields which resembled waves of bronze like a marine guard with brandished trident over his billows however a man in a white robe was walking along the edge of the rampart impassable and indifferent to the death which surrounded him sometimes he would spread out his right hand above his eyes in order to find out some one Mato happened to pass beneath him. Suddenly his eyeballs flamed, his livid face contracted, and raising both his lean arms, he shouted out abuse at him. Mato did not hear it, but he felt so furious and cruel a look entering his heart that he uttered a roar. He hurled his long axe at him. Some people threw themselves upon Shahabarim, and mato seeing him no more fell back exhausted a terrible creaking drew near mingled with the rhythms of voices singing together it was the great helepolis surrounded by a crowd of soldiers they were dragging it with both hands hauling it with ropes and pushing it with their shoulders for the slope rising from the plain to the terrace although extremely gentle was found impracticable for machines of such prodigious weight however it had eight wheels banded with iron and it had been advancing slowly in this way since the morning like a mountain raised upon another 
then there appeared an immense ram issuing from its base the doors along the three fronts which faced the town fell down and cuirassed soldiers appeared in the interior like pillars of iron some might be seen climbing and descending the two staircases which crossed the stories some were waiting to dart out as soon as the cramps of the doors touched the walls in the middle of the upper platform the skeins of the ballistas were turning and the great beam of the catapult was being lowered hamilcar was at that moment standing upright on the roof of melkarth he had calculated that it would come directly towards him against what was the most invulnerable place in the wall which was for that very reason denuded of sentries his slaves had for a long time been bringing leathern bottles along the round way where they had raised with clay two transverse partitions forming a sort of basin the water was flowing insensibly along the terrace and strange to say it seemed to cause hamilcar no anxiety but when the helepolis was thirty paces off he commanded planks to be placed over the streets between the houses from the cisterns to the rampart and a file of people passed from hand to hand helmets and amphoras which were emptied continually the carthaginians however grew indignant at this waste of water the ram was demolishing the wall when suddenly a fountain sprang forth from the disjointed stones then the lofty brazen mass nine stories high which contained and engaged more than three thousand soldiers began to rock gently like a ship in fact the water which had penetrated the terrace had broken up the path before it wheels struck in the mire the head of spendius with distended cheeks blowing an ivory cornet appeared between leathern curtains on the first story the great machine as though convulsively upheaved advanced perhaps ten paces but the ground softened more and more the mire reached to the axles and the helepolis stopped leaning over frightfully to one side the catapult rolled to the edge of the platform and carried away by the weight of its beam fell shattering the lower stories beneath it the soldiers who were standing on the doors slipped into the abyss or else held on to the extremities of the long beams and by their weight increased the inclination of the helepolis which was going to pieces with creakings in all its joints the other barbarians rushed up to help them massing themselves into a compact crowd the carthaginians descended from the rampart and assailing them in the rear killed them at leisure but the chariots furnished with sickles hastened up and galloped round the outskirts of the multitude the latter ascended the wall again night came on and the barbarians gradually retired nothing could now be seen on the plain but a sort of perfectly blank swarming mass which extended from the bluish gulf to the purely white lagoon and the lake which had received streams of blood stretched further away like a great purple pool the terrace was now so laden with corpses that it looked as though it had been constructed of human bodies in the centre stood the helepolis covered with armour and from time to time huge fragments broke off from it like stones from a crumbling pyramid broad tracks made by the streams of lead might be distinguished on the walls a broken-down wooden tower burned here and there and the houses showed dimly like the stages of a ruined amphitheatre heavy fumes of smoke were rising and rolling with them sparks which were lost in the dark sky the carthaginians however who were consumed by thirst had rushed to the cisterns 
they broke open the doors a miry swamp stretched at the bottom what was to be done now moreover the barbarians were countless and when their fatigue was over they would begin again the people deliberated all night in groups at the corners of the streets some said that they ought to send away the women the sick and the old men others proposed to abandon the town and found a colony far away but vessels were lacking and when the sun appeared no decision had been made there was no fighting that day all being too much exhausted the sleepers looked like corpses when the carthaginians reflecting upon the cause of their disasters remembered that they had not dispatched to phoenicia the annual offering due to turian melkarth and a great terror came upon them the gods were indignant with the republic and were no doubt about to prosecute their vengeance they were considered as cruel masters who were appeased with supplications and allowed themselves to be bribed with presents all were feeble in comparison with moloch the devourer the existence the very flesh of men belonged to him and hence in order to preserve it the carthaginians used to offer up a portion of it to him which calmed his fury children were burnt on the forehead or on the nape of the neck with woollen wicks and as this mode of satisfying baal brought in much money to the priests they failed not to recommend it as being easier and more pleasant this time however the republic itself was at stake but as every profit must be purchased by some loss and as every transaction was regulated according to the needs of the weaker and the demands of the stronger there was no pain great enough for the god since he delighted in such as was of the most horrible description and all were now at his mercy he must accordingly be fully gratified precedents showed that in this way the scourge would be made to disappear moreover it was believed that an emulation by fire would purify carthage the ferocity of the people was predisposed towards it the choice too must fall exclusively upon the families of the great the ancients assembled the sitting was a long one hanno had come to it as he was now unable to sit he remained lying down near the door half hidden among the fringes of the lofty tapestry and when the pontiff of moloch asked them whether they would consent to surrender their children his voice suddenly broke forth from the shadow like the roaring of a genius in the depths of a cavern he regretted he said that he had none of his own blood to give and he gazed at hamilcar who faced him at the other end of the hall the suffet was so much disconcerted by this look that it made him lower his eyes all successively bent their heads in approval and in accordance with the rites he had to reply to the high priest yes be it so then the ancients decreed the sacrifice in traditional circumlocution because there are things more troublesome to say than to perform the decision was almost immediately known in carthage and lamentations resounded the cries of women might everywhere be heard their husbands consoled them or railed at them with remonstrances but three hours afterwards extraordinary tidings were spread abroad the suffet had discovered springs at the foot of the cliff there was a rush to the place water might be seen in holes dug in the sand and some were already lying flat on the ground and drinking hamilcar did not himself know whether it was by the determination of the guards or through the vague recollection of a revelation which his father had once made to him 
but on leaving the ancients he had gone down to the shore and had begun to dig the gravel with his slaves he gave clothing boots and wine he gave all the rest of the corn he was keeping by him he even let the crowd enter his palace and he opened kitchens stores and all the rooms salambos alone excepted he announced that six thousand gaulish mercenaries were coming and that the king of macedonia was sending soldiers but on the second day the springs diminished and on the evening of the third they were completely dried up then the decree of the ancients passed everywhere from lip to lip and the priests of moloch began their task men in black robes presented themselves in the houses in many instances the owners had deserted them under pretence of some business or of some dainty that they were going to buy and the servants of moloch came and took the children away others themselves surrendered them stupidly then they brought to the temple of tanith where the priestesses were charged with their amusement and support until the solemn day they visited hamilcar suddenly and found him in his gardens barca we come for that that you know of your son they added that some people had met him one evening during the previous moon in the centre of the mappalian district being led by an old man he was as though suffocated at first but speedily understanding that any denial would be in vain hamilcar bowed and he brought them into the commercial house some slaves who had run up at a sign kept watch all round about it he entered salambo's room in a state of distraction he seized hannibal with one hand snatched up the cord of a trailing garment with the other tied his feet and hands with it thrust the end into his mouth to form a gag and hid him under the bed of the ox hides by letting an ample drapery fall to the ground afterwards he walked about from right to left raised his arms wheeled around bit his lips then he stood still with staring eyelids and panted as though he were about to die but then he clapped his hands three times giddenham appeared listen he said go and take from among the slaves a male child from eight to nine years of age with black hair and swelling forehead bring him here make haste giddenham soon entered again bringing forward a young boy he was a miserable child at once lean and bloated his skin looked greyish like the infected rag hanging to his sides his head was sunk between his shoulders and with the back of his hand he was rubbing his eyes which were filled with flies how could he ever be confounded with hannibal and there was no time to choose another hamilcar looked at giddenham he felt inclined to strangle him be gone he cried and the master of the slaves fled the misfortunes which he had so long dreaded was therefore come and with extravagant efforts he strove to discover whether there was not some mode some means to escape it abdalonim suddenly spoke from behind the door the suffet was being asked for the servants of moloch were growing impatient hamilcar repressed a cry as though a red-hot iron had burnt him and he began anew to pace the room like one distraught then he sank down beside the balustrade and with his elbows on his knees pressed his forehead into his shut fists the porphyry basin still contained a little clear water for salambo's ablutions in spite of his repugnance and all his pride the suffet dipped the child into it and like a slave merchant began to wash him and rub him with strigils and red earth then he took two purple squares from the receptacles round the wall 
placed one on his breast and the other on his back and joined them together on the collar-bones with two diamond clasps he poured perfume upon his head passed an electrum necklace around his neck and put on him sandals with heels of pearl sandals belonging to his own daughter but he stamped with shame and vexation salambo who busied herself in helping him was as pale as he the child dazzled by such splendour smiled and growing bold even was beginning to clap his hands and jump when hamilcar took him away he held him firmly by the arm as though he were afraid of losing him and the child who was hurt wept a little as he ran beside him when on a level with the ergastulum under a palm tree a voice was raised a mournful and supplicant voice it murmured master o oh master hamilcar turned and beside him perceived a man of abject appearance one of the wretches who led a haphazard existence in the household what do you want said the suffet the slave who trembled horribly stammered i am his father hamilcar walked on the other followed him with stooping loins bent hams and head thrust forward his face was convulsed with unspeakable anguish and he was choking with suppressed sobs so eager was he at once to question him and to cry mercy at last he ventured to touch him lightly with one finger on the elbow are you going to he had not the strength to finish and hamilcar stopped quite amazed at such grief he had never thought so immense was the abyss separating them from each other that there could be anything in common between them it even appeared to him a sort of outrage an encroachment upon his own privileges he replied with a look colder and heavier than an executioner's axe the slave swooned and fell in the dust at his feet hamilcar strode across him the three black-robed men were waiting in the great hall and standing against the stone disk immediately he tore his garments and rolled upon the pavement uttering piercing cries ah poor little hannibal oh my son my consolation my hope my life kill me also take me away woe woe he ploughed his face with his nails tore out his hair and shrieked like the women who lamented at funerals take him away then my suffering is too great be gone kill me like him the servants of moloch were astonished that the great hamilcar was so weak-spirited they were almost moved by it a noise of naked feet became audible with a broken throat rattling like the breathing of a wild beast speeding along and a man pale terrible and with outspread arms appeared on the threshold of the third gallery between the ivory pots he exclaimed my child hamilcar threw himself with a bound upon the slave and covering the man's mouth with his hand exclaimed still more loudly it is the old man who reared him he calls him my child it will make him mad enough enough and hustling away the three priests and their victim he went out with them and with a great kick shut the door behind them hamilcar strained his ears for some minutes in constant fear of seeing them return he then thought of getting rid of the slave in order to be quite sure that he would see nothing but the peril had not wholly disappeared and if the guards were provoked at the man's death it might be turned against his son then changing his intention he sent him by tanach the best from his kitchens a quarter of a goat beans and preserved pomegranates the slave who had eaten nothing for a long time rushed upon them his tears fell into the dishes 
hamilcar at last returned to salambo and unfastened hannibal's cords the child in exasperation bit his hand until the blood came he repelled him with a caress to make him remain quiet salambo tried to frighten him with lamia a Cyrenian ogress but where is she he asked he was told that brigands were coming to put him into prison let them come he rejoined and i will kill them then hamilcar told him the frightful truth but he fell into a passion with his father contending that he was quite able to annihilate the whole people since he was the master of carthage at last exhausted by his exertions and anger he fell into a wild sleep he spoke in his dreams his back leaning against a scarlet cushion his head was thrown back somewhat and his little arm outstretched from his body lay quite straight in an attitude of command when the night had grown dark hamilcar lifted him up gently and without a torch went down the galley staircase as he passed through the mercantile house he took up a basket of grapes and a flagon of pure water the child awoke before the statue of alites in the vault of gems and he smiled like the other on his father's arm at the brilliant lights which surrounded him hamilcar felt quite sure that his son could not be taken from him it was an impenetrable spot communicating with the beach by a subterranean passage which he alone knew and casting his eyes around he inhaled a great draught of air then he sent him down upon a stool beside some golden shields no one at present could see him he had no further need for watching and he relieved his feelings like a mother finding her first-born that was lost he threw himself upon his son he clasped him to his breast he laughed and wept at the same time he called him by the fondest names and covered him with kisses little hannibal was frightened by this terrible tenderness and was silent now End of chapter thirteen part three Chapter Thirteen, Part Four of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Thirteen, Part Four. Hamilcar returned with silent steps, feeling the walls around him, and came into the great hall where the moonlight entered through one of the apertures in the dome in the centre the slave lay sleeping after his repast stretched at full length upon the marble pavement he looked at him and was moved with a sort of pity with the tip of his cothurn he pushed forward a carpet beneath his head then he raised his eyes and gazed at tanith whose slender crescent was shining in the sky and felt himself stronger than the baals and full of contempt for them the arrangements for the sacrifice were already begun part of a wall in the temple of moloch was thrown down in order to draw out the brazen guard without touching the ashes of the altar then as soon as the sun appeared the hero duels pushed it towards the square of carmon it moved backwards sliding upon cylinders its shoulders overlapped the walls no sooner did the carthaginians perceive it in the distance than they speedily took to flight for the baal could be looked upon with impunity only when exercising his wrath a smell of aromatics spread through the streets 
all the temples had just been opened simultaneously and from them there came forth tabernacles borne upon chariots or upon litters carried by the pontiffs great plumes swayed at the corners of them and rays were emitted from their slender pinnacles which terminated in balls of crystal gold silver or copper these were the cananitish balim offshoots of the supreme baal who were returning to their first cause to humble themselves before his might and annihilate themselves in his splendour melkarth's pavilion which was of fine purple sheltered a petroleum flare on carmon's which was of hyacinth colour there rose an ivory phallus bordered with a circle of gems between eskmount's curtains which were as blue as the ether a sleeping python formed a circle with his tail and the Pataic gods held in the arms of their priests looked like great infants in swaddling clothes with their heels touching the ground then came all the inferior forms of the divinity baal samin god of celestial space baal peor god of the sacred mountains baal zebub god of corruption with those of the neighbouring countries and congenerous races the iarbal of libya the adramelech of chaldea the kijun of the syrians derceto with her virgin's face crept on her fins and the corpse of tammuz was drawn along in the midst of a catafalque among torches and heads of hair in order to subdue the kings of the firmament to the sun and prevent their particular influences from disturbing his diversely coloured metal stars were brandished at the end of long poles and all were there from the dark neblo the genius of mercury to the hideous rahab which is the constellation of the crocodile the abadirs stones which had fallen from the moon were whirling in slings of silver thread little loaves representing the female form were borne on baskets by the priests of ceres others brought their fetishes and amulets forgotten idols appeared while the mystic symbols had been taken from the very ships as though carthage wished to concentrate herself wholly upon a single thought of death and desolation before each tabernacle a man balanced a large vase of smoking incense on his head clouds hovered here and there and the hangings pendants and embroideries of the sacred pavilions might be distinguished amid the thick vapours these advanced slowly owing to their enormous weight sometimes the axles became fast in the street then the pious took advantage of the opportunity to touch the balim with their garments which they preserved afterwards as holy things the brazen statue continued to advance towards the square of carmon the rich carrying sceptres with emerald balls set out from the bottom of megara the ancients with diadems on their heads had assembled in Kinisdo, and masters of the finances governors of provinces sailors and the numerous horde employed at funerals all with the insignia of their magistracies or the instruments of their calling were making their way towards the tabernacles which were descending from the acropolis between the colleges of the pontiffs out of deference to moloch they had adorned themselves with the most splendid jewels diamonds sparkled on their black garments but their rings were too large and fell from their wasted hands nor could there have been anything so mournful as this silent crowd where earrings tapped against pale faces 
and gold tiaras clasped brows contracted with stern despair at last the baal arrived exactly in the centre of the square his pontiffs arranged an enclosure with trellis work to keep off the multitude and remained around him at his feet the priests of Kamon, in tawny woolen robes formed a line before their temple beneath the columns of the portico those of eskmoun in linen mantles with necklaces of kukufa's heads and pointed tiaras posted themselves on the steps of the acropolis the priests of melkarth in violet tunics took the western side the priests of the abadirs clasped with bands of phrygian stuffs placed themselves on the east while towards the south with the necromancers all covered with tattooings and the shriekers in patched cloaks were ranged the curates of the pataic guards and the yidonim who put the bone of a dead man into their mouths to learn the future the priests of ceres who were dressed in blue robes had prudently stopped in the street of sartheb and in low tones were chanting a thesmophorion in the megarian dialect from time to time files of men arrived completely naked their arms outstretched and all holding one another by the shoulders from the depths of their breasts they drew forth a hoarse and cavernous intonation their eyes which were fastened upon the colossus shone through the dust and they swayed their bodies simultaneously and at equal distances as though they were all affected by a single movement they were so frenzied that to restore order the hierodules compelled them with blows of the stick to lie flat upon the ground with their faces resting against the brass trellis work then it was that a man in a white robe advanced from the back of the square he penetrated the crowd slowly and people recognized a priest of tanith the high priest shahabarim hootings were raised for the tyranny of the male principle prevailed that day in all consciences and the goddess was actually so completely forgotten that the absence of her pontiffs had not been noticed but the amazement was increased when he was seen to open one of the doors of the trellis work intended for those who intended to offer up victims it was an outrage to their god thought the priests of moloch that he had just committed and they sought with eager gestures to repel him fed on the meat of the holocausts clad in purple like kings and wearing triple-storied crowns they despised the pale eunuch weakened with his macerations and angry laughter shook their black beards which were displayed on their breasts in the sun shahabarim walked on giving no reply and traversing the whole enclosure with deliberation reached the legs of the colossus then spreading out both arms he touched it on both sides which was a solemn form of adoration for a long time rabbits had been torturing him and in despair or perhaps for lack of a god that completely satisfied his ideas he had at last decided for this one the crowd terrified by this act of apostasy uttered a lengthened murmur it was felt that the last tie which bound their souls to a merciful divinity was breaking but owing to his mutilation shahabarim could take no part in the cult of the baal the men in the red cloaks shut him out from the enclosure then when he was outside he went around all the colleges in succession and the priest henceforth without a guard 
disappeared into the crowd it scattered at his approach meanwhile a fire of aloes cedar and laurel was burning between the legs of the colossus the tips of its long wings dipped into the flame the unguents with which it had been rubbed flowed like sweat over its brazen limbs around the circular flagstone on which its feet rested the children wrapped in black veils formed a motionless circle and its extravagantly long arms reached down their palms to them as though to seize the crown that they formed and carry it to the sky the rich the ancients the women the whole multitude thronged behind the priests and on the terraces of the houses the large painted stars revolved no longer the tabernacles were set upon the ground and the fumes from the censers ascended perpendicularly spreading their bluish branches through the azure like gigantic trees many fainted others became inert and petrified in their ecstasy infinite anguish weighed upon the breasts of the beholders the last shouts died out one by one and the people of carthage stood breathless and absorbed in the longing of their terror at last the high priest of moloch passed his left hand beneath the children's veils plucked a lock of hair from their foreheads and threw it upon the flames then the men in their red cloaks chanted the sacred hymn homage to thee son king of the two zones self-generating creator father and mother father and son god and goddess goddess and god and their voices were lost in the outburst of instruments sounding simultaneously to drown the cries of the victims the eight-stringed skimineths the kinors which had ten strings and the nabals which had twelve grated whistled and thundered enormous leathern bags bristling with pipes made a shrill clashing noise the tabourines beaten with all the player's might resounded with heavy rapid blows and in spite of the fury of the clarions the salsalim snapped like grasshoppers wings the hero duels with a long hook opened the seven-storied compartments on the body of the baal they put meal into the highest two turtle doves in the second an ape into the third a ram into the fourth a sheep into the fifth and as no ox was to be had for the sixth a tawny hide taken from the sanctuary was thrown into it the seventh compartment yawned empty still before undertaking anything it was well to make trial of the arms of the guard slender chainlets stretched from its fingers up to his shoulders and fell behind where men by pulling them made the two hands rise to a level with the elbows and come closer together against the belly they were moved several times in succession with little abrupt jerks then the instruments were still the fire roared the pontiffs of moloch walked about on the great flagstone scanning the multitude an individual sacrifice was necessary a perfectly voluntary oblation which was considered as carrying the others along with it but no one had appeared up to the present and the seven passages leading from the barriers to the colossus were completely empty then the priests to encourage the people drew bodkins from their girdles and gashed their faces the devotees who were stretched on the ground outside were brought within the enclosure a bundle of horrible irons was thrown to them and each chose his own torture 
they drove in spits between their breasts they split their cheeks they put crowns of thorns upon their heads then they twined their arms together and surrounded the children in another large circle which widened and contracted in turns they reached to the balustrade they threw themselves back again and then began once more attracting the crowd to them by the dizziness of their motion with its accompanying blood and shrieks by degrees people came into the end of the passages they flung into the flames pearls gold vases cups torches all their wealth the offerings became constantly more numerous and more splendid at last a man who tottered a man pale and hideous with terror thrust forward a child then a little black mass was seen between the hands of the colossus and sank into the dark opening the priests bent over the edge of the great flagstone and a new song burst forth celebrating the joys of death and of new birth into eternity the children ascended slowly and as the smoke formed lofty eddies as it escaped they seemed at a distance to disappear into a cloud no one stirred their wrists and ankles were tied and the dark drapery prevented them from seeing anything and from being recognized hamilcar in a red cloak like the priests of moloch was beside the baal standing upright in front of the great toe of its right foot when the fourteenth child was brought every one could see him make a great gesture of horror but he soon resumed his former attitude folded his arms and looked upon the ground the high pontiff stood on the other side of the statue as motionless as he his head laden with an assyrian mitre was bent and he was watching the gold plate on his breast it was covered with fatidical stones and the flame mirrored in it formed irisated lights he grew pale and dismayed hamilcar bent his brow and they were both so near the funeral pile that the hems of their cloaks brushed it as they rose from time to time the brazen arms were working more quickly they paused no longer every time that a child was placed in them the priests of moloch spread out their hands upon him to burden him with the crimes of the people vociferating they are not men but oxen and the multitude round about repeated oxen oxen the devout exclaimed lord eat and the priests of proserpine complying through terror with the needs of carthage muttered the eleusinian formula pour out rain bring forth the victims when scarcely at the edge of the opening disappeared like a drop of water on a red-hot plate and white smoke rose amid the great scarlet colour nevertheless the appetite of the god was not appeased he ever wished for more in order to furnish him with a larger supply the victims were piled up on his hands with a big chain above them which kept them in their place some devout persons had at the beginning wished to count them to see whether their number corresponded with the days of the solar year but others were brought and it was impossible to distinguish them in the giddy motion of the horrible arms this lasted for a long indefinite time until the evening then the partitions inside assumed a darker glow and burning flesh could be seen some even believed that they could descry hair limbs and whole bodies night fell clouds accumulated above the baal the funeral pile which was flameless now formed a pyramid of coals up to his knees 
completely red like a giant covered with blood he looked with his head thrown back as though he were staggering beneath the weight of his intoxication in proportion as the priests made haste the frenzy of the people increased as the number of the victims was diminishing some cried out to spare them others that still more were needful the walls with their burden of people seemed to be giving way beneath the howlings of terror and mystic voluptuousness then the faithful came into the passages dragging their children who clung to them and they beat them in order to make them let go and handed them over to the men in red the instrument players sometimes stopped through exhaustion then the cries of the mothers might be heard and the frizzling of the fat as it fell upon the coals the henbane drinkers crawled on all fours around the colossus roaring like tigers the yidonim vaticinated the devotees sang with their cloven lips the trellis work had been broken through all wished for a share in the sacrifice and fathers whose children had died previously cast their effigies their playthings their preserved bones into the fire some who had knives rushed upon the rest they slaughtered one another the hierodules took the fallen ashes at the edge of the flagstone in bronze fans and cast them into the air that the sacrifice might be scattered over the town and even to the region of the stars the loud noise and great light had attracted the barbarians to the foot of the walls they clung to the wreck of the helepolis to have a better view and gazed open-mouthed in horror End of chapter thirteen Chapter fourteen part one of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter fourteen part one. The Pass of the Hatchet. The Carthaginians had not re entered their houses when the clouds accumulated more thickly. Those who raised their heads towards the Colossus could feel big drops on their foreheads and the rain fell it fell the whole night plentifully in floods the thunder growled it was the voice of moloch he had vanquished tanith and she being now fecundated opened up her vast bosom in heaven's heights sometimes she could be seen in a clear and luminous spot stretched upon cushions of cloud and then the darkness would close in again as though she were still too weary and wished to sleep again the carthaginians all believing that water is brought forth by the moon shouted to make her travail easy the rain beat upon the terraces and overflowed them forming lakes in the courts cascades on the staircases and eddies at the corners of the streets it poured in warm heavy masses and urgent streams big frothy jets leaped from the corners of all the buildings and it seemed as though whitish cloths hung dimly upon the walls and the washed temple roofs shone black in the gleam of the lightning torrents descended from the acropolis by a thousand paths houses suddenly gave way and small beams plaster rubbish and furniture passed along in streams which ran impetuously over the pavement 
amphoras flagons and canvases had been placed out of doors but the torches were extinguished brands were taken from the funeral pile of the baal and the carthaginians bent back their necks and opened their mouths to drink others by the side of the miry pools plunged their arms into them up to the armpits and filled themselves so abundantly with water that they vomited it forth like buffaloes the freshness gradually spread they breathed in the damp air with play of limb and in the happiness of their intoxication boundless hope soon arose all their miseries were forgotten their country was born anew they felt the need as it were of directing upon others the extravagant fury which they had been unable to employ against themselves such a sacrifice could not be in vain although they felt no remorse they found themselves carried away by the frenzy which results from complicity in irreparable crimes the barbarians had encountered the storm in their ill-closed tents and they were still quite chilled on the morrow as they tramped through the mud in search of their stores and weapons which were spoiled and lost hamilcar went himself to see hanno and in spite of his plenary powers entrusted the command to him the old suffet hesitated for a few minutes between his animosity and his appetite for authority but he accepted nevertheless hamilcar next took out a galley armed with a catapult at each end he placed it in the gulf in front of the raft then he embarked his stoutest troops on board such vessels as were available he was apparently taking to flight and running northward before the wind he disappeared into the mist but three days afterwards when the attack was about to begin again some people arrived tumultuously from the libyan coast barca had come among them he had carried off provisions everywhere and he was spreading through the country then the barbarians were indignant as though he were betraying them those who were most weary of the siege and especially the gauls did not hesitate to leave the walls in order to try and rejoin him spendius wanted to reconstruct the helepolis mato had traced an imaginary line from his tent to megara and inwardly swore to follow it and none of their men stirred but the rest under the command of autaritus went off abandoning the western part of the rampart and so profound was the carelessness exhibited that no one even thought of replacing them narhavas spied them from afar in the mountains during the night he led all his men along the seashore on the outer side of the lagoon and entered carthage he presented himself as a saviour with six thousand men all carrying meal under their cloaks and forty elephants laden with forage and dried meat the people flocked quickly around them they gave them names the sight of these strong animals sacred to baal gave the carthaginians even more joy than the arrival of such relief it was a token of the tenderness of the god a proof that he was at last about to interfere in the war to defend them narhavas received the compliments of the ancients then he ascended to salambo's palace he had not seen her again since the time when in hamilcar's tent amid the five armies he had felt her little cold soft hand fastened to his own she had left for carthage after the betrothal his love which had been diverted by other ambitions had come back to him and now he expected to enjoy his rights to marry her and take her 
salambo did not understand how the young man could ever become her master although she asked tanith every day for matto's death her horror of the libyan was growing less she vaguely felt that the hate with which he had persecuted her was something almost religious and she would fain have seen in narr havas's person a reflection as it were of that malice which still dazzled her she desired to know him better and yet his presence would have embarrassed her she sent him word that she could not receive him moreover hamilcar had forbidden his people to admit the king of the numidians to see her by putting off his reward to the end of the war he hoped to retain his devotion and through dread of the suffet narr withdrew but he bore himself haughtily towards the hundred he changed their arrangements he demanded privileges for his men and placed them on important posts thus the barbarians stared when they perceived numidians on the towers the surprise of the carthaginians was greater still when three hundred of their own people who had been made prisoners during the sicilian war arrived on board an old punic trireme hamilcar in fact had secretly sent back to the quirites the crews of the latin vessels taken before the defection of the tyrian towns and to reciprocate the courtesy rome was now sending him back her captives she scorned the overtures of the mercenaries in sardinian and would not even recognize the inhabitants of utica as subjects hiero who was ruling at syracuse was carried away by his example for the preservation of his own states it was necessary that an equilibrium should exist between the two peoples he was interested therefore in the safety of the Canaanites, and he declared himself their friend and sent them twelve hundred oxen with fifty-three thousand nebels of pure wheat a deeper reason prompted aid to carthage it was felt that if the mercenaries triumphed every one from soldier to plate-washer would rise and that no government and no house could resist them meanwhile hamilcar was scouring the eastern districts he drove back the gauls and all the barbarians found that they were themselves in something like a state of siege then he set himself to harass them he would arrive and then retire and by constantly renewing his manoeuvre he gradually detached them from their encampments spendius was obliged to follow them and in the end matto yielded in like manner he did not pass beyond tunis he shut himself up within its walls this persistence was full of wisdom for soon narr havas was to be seen issuing from the gate of Kamon with his elephants and soldiers hamilcar was recalling him but the other barbarians were already wandering about in the provinces in pursuit of the suffet the latter had received three thousand golds from clypea he had horses brought to him from cyrenaica and armour from brutium and began the war again never had his genius been so impetuous and fertile for five moons he dragged his enemies after him he had an end to which he wished to guide them the barbarians had at first tried to encompass him with small detachments but he always escaped them they ceased to separate then their army amounted to about forty thousand men and several times they enjoyed the sight of seeing the carthaginians fall back the horsemen of narr havas were what they found most tormenting often at times of the greatest weariness 
when they were advancing over the plains and dozing beneath the weight of their arms a great line of dust would suddenly rise on the horizon there would be a galloping up to them and a rain of darts would pour from the bosom of a cloud filled with flaming eyes the numidians in their white cloaks would utter loud shouts raise their arms press their rearing stallions with their knees and wheeling them around abruptly would then disappear they had always supplies of javelins and dromedaries some distance off and they would return more terrible than before howl like wolves and take to flight like vultures the barbarians posted at the extremities of the files fell one by one and this would continue until evening when an attempt would be made to enter the mountains although they were perilous for elephants hamilcar made his way in among them he followed the chain which extends from the promontory of hermaeum to the top of zaguan this they believed was a device for hiding the insufficiency of his troops but the continual uncertainty in which he kept them exasperated them at last more than any defeat they did not lose heart and marched after him at last one evening they surprised a body of velites amid some big rocks at the entrance of a pass between the silver mountain and the lead mountain the entire army was certainly in front of them for a noise of footsteps and clarions could be heard the carthaginians immediately fled through the gorge it descended into a plain and was shaped like an iron hatchet with a surrounding of lofty cliffs the barbarians dashed into it in order to overtake the velites quite at the bottom other carthaginians were running tumultuously amid galloping oxen a man in a red cloak was to be seen it was the suffet they shouted this to one another and they were carried away with increased fury and joy several from laziness or prudence had remained on the threshold of the pass but some cavalry debouching from a wood beat them down upon the rest with blows of pike and sabre and soon all the barbarians were below in the plain then this great human mass after swaying to and fro for some time stood still they could discover no outlet those who were nearest to the pass went back again but the passage had entirely disappeared they hailed those in front to make them go on they were being crushed against the mountain and from a distance they inveighed against their companions who were unable to find the route again in fact the barbarians had scarcely descended when men who had been crouching behind the rocks raised the latter with beams and overthrew them and as the slope was steep the huge blocks had rolled down pall-mall and completely stopped up the narrow opening at the other extremity of the plain stretched a long passage split in gaps here and there and leading to a ravine which ascended to the upper plateau where the punic army was stationed ladders had been placed beforehand in this passage against the wall of cliff and protected by the windings of the gaps the velites were able to seize and mount them before being overtaken several even made their way to the bottom of the ravine they were drawn up with cables for the ground at this spot was of moving sand and so much inclined that it was impossible to climb it even to the knees the barbarians arrived almost immediately but a portcullis 
forty cubits high and made to fit the intervening space exactly suddenly sank before them like a rampart fallen from the skies the suffet's combinations had therefore succeeded none of the mercenaries knew the mountain and marching as they did at the head of the columns they had drawn on the rest the rocks which were somewhat narrow at the base had been easily cast down and while all were running his army had raised shouts as of distress on the horizon hamilcar it is true might have lost his velites only half of whom remained but he would have sacrificed twenty times as many for the success of such an enterprise the barbarians pressed forward until morning in compact files from one end of the plain to the other they felt the mountain with their hands seeking to discover a passage at last day broke and they perceived all about them a great white wall hewn with the pick and no means of safety no hope the two natural outcomes from this blind alley were closed by the portcullis and the heaps of rock then they all looked at one another without speaking they sank down in collapse feeling an icy coldness in their loins and an overwhelming weight upon their eyelids they rose and bounded against the rocks but the lowest were weighted by the pressure of the others and were immovable they tried to cling to them so as to reach the top but the bellying shape of the great masses rendered all hold impossible they sought to cleave the ground on both sides of the gorge but their instruments broke they made a large fire with the tent poles but the fire could not burn the mountain they returned to the portcullis it was garnished with long nails as thick as stakes as sharp as the spines of a porcupine and closer than the hairs of a brush but they were animated by such rage that they dashed themselves against it the first were pierced to the backbone those coming next surged over them and all fell back leaving human fragments and blood-stained hair on those horrible branches when their discouragement was somewhat abated they made an examination of the provisions the mercenaries whose baggage was lost possessed scarcely enough for two days and all the rest found themselves destitute for they had been awaiting a convoy promised by the villages of the south however some bulls were roaming about those which the carthaginians had loosened in the gorge to attract the barbarians they killed them with lance thrust and ate them and when their stomachs were filled their thoughts were less mournful the next day they slaughtered all the mules to the number of about forty then they scraped the skins boiled the entrails pounded the bones and did not yet despair the army from tunis had no doubt been warned and was coming but on the evening of the fifth day their hunger increased they gnawed their sword-belts and the little sponges which bordered the bottom of their helmets these forty thousand men were massed into the species of hippodrome formed by the mountain about them some remained in front of the portcullis or at the foot of the rocks the rest covered the plain confusedly the strong shunned one another and the timid sought out the brave who nevertheless were unable to save them to avoid infection the corpse of the velites had been speedily buried and the position of the graves was no longer visible all the barbarians lay drooping on the ground a veteran would pass between their lines here and there 
and they would howl curses against the carthaginians against hamilcar and against matho although he was innocent of their disaster but it seemed to them that their pains would have been less if he had shared them then they groaned and some wept softly like little children they came to the captains and besought them to grant them something that would alleviate their sufferings the others made no reply or seized with fury would pick up a stone and fling it in their faces several in fact carefully kept a reserve of food in a hole in the ground a few handfuls of dates or a little meal and they ate this during the night with their heads bent beneath their cloaks those who had swords kept them naked in their hands and the most suspicious remained standing with their backs against the mountain they accused their chiefs and threatened them oteritus was not afraid of showing himself with the barbaric obstinacy which nothing could discourage he would advance twenty times a day to the rocks at the bottom hoping every time to find them perchance displaced and swaying his heavy fur-covered shoulders he reminded his companions of a bear coming forth from its cave in springtime to see whether the snows are melted spendius surrounded by the greeks hid himself in one of the gaps as he was afraid he caused a rumour of his death to be spread they were now hideously lean their skin was overlaid with bluish marblings on the evening of the ninth day three iberians died their frightened companions left the spot they were stripped and the white naked bodies lay in the sunshine on the sand then the garamantians began to prowl slowly round about them they were men accustomed to existence in solitude and they reverenced no god at last the oldest of the band made a sign and bending over the corpses they cut strips from them with their knives then squatted upon their heels and ate the rest looked on from a distance they uttered cries of horror many nevertheless being at the bottom of their souls jealous of such courage in the middle of the night some of these approached and dissembling their eagerness asked for a small mouthful merely to try they said bolder ones came up their number increased there was soon a crowd but almost all of them let their hands fall on feeling the cold flesh on the edge of their lips others on the contrary devoured it with delight that they might be led away by example they urged one another on mutually such as had first refused went to see the garamantians and returned no more they cooked the pieces on coals at the point of the sword they salted them with dust and contended for the best morsels when nothing was left of the three corpses their eyes ranged over the whole plain to find others but were they not in possession of carthaginians twenty captives taken in the last encounter whom no one had noticed up to the present these disappeared moreover it was an act of vengeance then as they must live as the taste for this food had become developed and as they were dying they cut the throats of the water-carriers grooms and all the serving-men belonging to the mercenaries they killed some of them every day some ate much recovered strength and were sad no more soon this resource failed then the longing was directed to the wounded and sick 
since they could not recover it was as well to release them from their tortures and as soon as a man began to stagger all exclaimed that he was now lost and ought to be made use of for the rest artifices were employed to accelerate their death the last remnant of their foul portion was stolen from them they were trodden on as though by inadvertence those in the last throes wishing to make believe that they were strong strove to stretch out their arms to rise to laugh men who had swooned came to themselves at the touch of a notched blade sawing off a limb and they still slew ferociously and needlessly to sate their fury End of chapter 14, part 1chapter fourteen part two of salambo by gustave flaubert this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by caroline chapter fourteen part two a mist heavy and warm such as comes in those regions at the end of winter sank on the fourteenth day upon the army this change of temperature brought numerous deaths with it and corruption was developed with frightful rapidity in the warm dampness which was kept in by the sides of the mountain the drizzle that fell upon the corpses softened them and soon made the plain one broad tract of rottenness whitish vapours floated overhead they pricked the nostrils penetrated the skin and troubled the sight and the barbarians thought that through the exhalations of the breath they could see the souls of their companions they were overwhelmed with immense disgust they wished for nothing more they preferred to die two days afterwards the weather became fine again and hunger seized them once more it seemed to them that their stomachs were being wrenched from them with tongs then they rolled about in convulsions flung handfuls of dust into their mouths bit their arms and burst into frantic laughter they were still more tormented by thirst for they had not a drop of water the leathern bottles having been completely dried up since the ninth day to cheat their need they applied their tongues to the metal plates on their waist belts their ivory pommels and the steel of their swords some former caravan leaders tightened their waists with ropes others sucked a pebble they drank urine cooled in their brazen helmets and they still expected the army from tunis the length of time which it took in coming was according to their conjectures an assurance of its early arrival besides matto who was a brave fellow would not desert them it will be to-morrow they would say to one another and then to-morrow would pass at the beginning they had offered up prayers and vows and practised all kinds of incantations just now their only feeding on their divinities was one of hatred and they strove to revenge themselves by believing in them no more men of violent disposition perished first the africans held out better than the gauls Zaxas lay stretched at full length among the balearians his hair over his arm inert 
spendius found a plant with broad leaves filled abundantly with juice and after declaring that it was poisonous so as to keep off the rest he fed himself upon it they were too weak to knock down the flying crows with stones sometimes when a gibbetaeus was perched on a corpse and had been mangling it for a long time a man would set himself to crawl towards it with a javelin between his teeth he would support himself with one hand and after taking a good aim throw his weapon the white feathered creature disturbed by the noise would desist and look about in tranquil fashion like a cormorant on a rock and would then again thrust in its hideous yellow beak while the man in despair would fall flat on his face in the dust some succeeded in discovering chameleons and serpents but it was the love of life that kept them alive they directed their souls to this idea exclusively and clung to existence by an effort of the will that prolonged it the most stoical kept close to one another seated in a circle here and there among the dead in the middle of the plain and wrapped in their cloaks they gave themselves up silently to their sadness those who had been born in towns recalled the resounding streets the taverns theatres baths and the barbers shops where there are tales to be heard others could once more see country districts at sunset when the yellow corn waves and the great oxen ascend the hills again with the ploughshares on their necks travellers dreamt of cisterns hunters of their forests veterans of battles and in the somnolence that benumbed them their thoughts jostled one another with the precipitancy and clearness of dreams hallucinations came suddenly upon them they sought for a door in the mountain in order to flee and tried to pass through it others thought that they were sailing in a storm and gave orders for the handling of a ship or else fell back in terror perceiving punic battalions in the clouds there were some who imagined themselves at a feast and sang many through a strange mania would repeat the same word or continually make the same gesture then when they happened to raise their heads and look at one another they were choked with sobs on discovering the horrible ravages made in their faces some had ceased to suffer and to while away the hours told of the perils which they had escaped death was certain and imminent to all how many times had they not tried to open up a passage as to implore terms from the conqueror by what means could they do so they did not even know where hamilcar was the wind was blowing from the direction of the ravine it made the sand flow perpetually in cascades over the portcullis and the cloaks and hair of the barbarians were being covered with it as though the earth were rising upon them and desirous of burying them nothing stirred the eternal mountain seemed still higher to them every morning sometimes flights of birds darted past beneath the blue sky in the freedom of the air the men closed their eyes that they might not see them at first they felt a buzzing in their ears their nails grew black the cold reached to their breasts they lay upon their sides and expired without a cry on the nineteenth day two thousand asiatics were dead with fifteen hundred from the archipelago 
eight thousand from libya the youngest of the mercenaries and whole tribes in all twenty thousand soldiers or half of the army Oteritus, who had only fifty golds left was going to kill himself in order to put an end to this state of things when he thought he saw a man on the top of the mountain in front of him owing to his elevation this man did not appear taller than a dwarf however Oteritus recognized a shield shaped like a trefoil on his left arm a carthaginian he exclaimed and immediately throughout the plain before the portcullis and beneath the rocks all rose the soldier was walking along the edge of the precipice the barbarians gazed at him from below spendius picked up the head of an ox then having formed a diadem with two belts he fixed it on the horns at the end of a pole in token of pacific intentions the carthaginian disappeared they waited at last in the evening a sword belt suddenly fell from above like a stone loosened from the cliff it was made of red leather covered with embroidery with three diamond stars and shaped in the centre it bore the mark of the great council a horse beneath a palm tree this was hamilcar's reply the safe conduct that he sent them they had nothing to fear any change of fortune brought with it the end of their woes they were moved with extravagant joy they embraced one another they wept spendius oteritus and zaxas four italiotes a negro and two spartans offered themselves as envoys they were immediately accepted they did not know however by what means they should get away but a cracking sounded in the direction of the rocks and the most elevated of them after rocking to and fro rebounded to the bottom in fact if they were immovable on the side of the barbarians for it would have been necessary to urge them up an inclined plane and they were moreover heaped together owing to the narrowness of the gorge on the others on the contrary it was sufficient to drive against them with violence to make them descend the carthaginians pushed them and at daybreak they projected into the plain like the steps of an immense ruined staircase the barbarians were still unable to climb them ladders were held out for their assistance all rushed upon them the discharge of a catapult drove the crowd back only the ten were taken away they walked amid the clinabarians leaning their hands on the horses croups for support now that their first joy was over they began to harbour anxieties hamilcar's demands would be cruel but spendius reassured them i will speak and he boasted that he knew excellent things to say for the safety of the army behind all the bushes they met with ambushed sentries who prostrated themselves before the sword-belt which spendius had placed over his shoulder when they reached the punic camp the crowd flocked around them and they thought that they could hear whisperings and laughter the door of a tent opened hamilcar was at the very back of it seated on a stool beside a table on which there shone a naked sword he was surrounded by captains who were standing he started back on perceiving these men and then bent over to examine them their pupils were strangely dilated and there was a great black circle around their eyes which extended to the lower parts of their ears their bluish noses stood out between their hollow cheeks which were chinked with deep wrinkles 
the skin of their bodies was too large for their muscles and was hidden beneath a slate-coloured dust their lips were glued to their yellow teeth they exhaled an infectious odour they might have been taken for half-opened tombs for living sepulchres in the centre of the tent on a mat on which the captains were about to sit down there was a dish of smoking gourds the barbarians fastened their eyes upon it with a shivering in all their limbs and tears came to their eyelids nevertheless they restrained themselves hamilcar turned away to speak to some one then they all flung themselves upon it flat on the ground their faces were soaked in the fat and the noise of their deglutition was mingled with the sobs of joy which they uttered through astonishment doubtless rather than pity they were allowed to finish the mess then when they had risen hamilcar with a sign commanded the man who bore the sword-belt to speak spendius was afraid he stammered hamilcar while listening to him kept turning around on his finger a big gold ring the same which had stamped the seal of carthage upon the sword-belt he let it fall to the ground spendius immediately picked it up his servile habits came back to him in the presence of his master the others quivered with indignation at such baseness but the greek raised his voice and spoke for a long time in rapid insidious and even violent fashion setting forth the crimes of hanno whom he knew to be barca's enemy and striving to move hamilcar's pity by the details of their miseries and the recollection of their devotion in the end he became forgetful of himself being carried away by the warmth of his temper hamilcar replied that he accepted their excuses peace then was about to be concluded and now it would be a definite one but he required that ten mercenaries chosen by himself should be delivered up to him without their weapons or tunics they had not expected such clemency spendius exclaimed ah twenty if you wish master no ten will suffice replied hamilcar quietly they were sent out of the tent to deliberate as soon as they were alone Oteritus protested against the sacrifice of their companions and zaxas said to spendius why did you not kill him his sword was there beside you him said spendius him him he repeated several times as though the thing had been impossible and hamilcar were an immortal they were so overwhelmed with weariness that they stretched themselves on their backs on the ground not knowing at what resolution to arrive spendius urged them to yield at last they consented and went in again then the suffet put his hand into the hands of the ten barbarians in turn and pressed their thumbs then he rubbed it on his garment for their vicious skin gave a rude soft impression to the touch a greasy tingling which induced horripilation afterwards he said to them you are really all the chiefs of the barbarians and you have sworn for them yes they replied without constraint from the bottom of your souls with the intention of fulfilling your promises they assured him that they were returning to the rest in order to fulfil them well rejoined the suffet in accordance with the convention concluded between myself barca and the ambassadors of the mercenaries it is you whom i choose and shall keep spendius fell swooning upon the mat the barbarians as though abandoning him pressed close together 
and there was not a word not a complaint their companions who were waiting for them not seeing them return believed themselves betrayed the envoys had no doubt given themselves up to the suffet they waited for two days longer then on the morning of the third their resolution was taken with ropes picks and arrows arranged like rungs between the strips of canvas they succeeded in scaling the rocks and leaving the weakest about three thousand in number behind them they began their march to rejoin the army at tunis above the gorge there stretched a meadow thinly sown with shrubs the barbarians devoured the buds afterwards they found a field of beans and everything disappeared as though a cloud of grasshoppers had passed that way three hours later they reached a second plateau bordered by a belt of green hills among the undulations of these hillocks silvery sheaves shone at intervals from one another the barbarians who were dazzled by the sun could perceive confusedly below great black masses supporting them these rose as though they were expanding they were lances in towers on elephants terribly armed besides the spears on their breasts the bodkin tusks the brass plates which covered their sides and the daggers fastened to their knee-caps they had at the extremity of their tusks a leathern bracelet in which the handle of a broad cutlass was inserted they had set out simultaneously from the back part of the plain and were advancing on both sides in parallel lines the barbarians were frozen with a nameless terror they did not even try to flee they already found themselves surrounded the elephants entered into the mass of men and the spurs on their breasts divided it the lances on their tusks upturned it like ploughshares they cut hewed and hacked with the scythes on their trunks the towers which were full of phalaricas looked like volcanoes on the march nothing could be distinguished but a large heap whereupon human flesh pieces of brass and blood made white spots grey sheets and red fuses the horrible animals dug out black furrows as they passed through the midst of it all the fiercest was driven by a numidian who was crowned with a diadem of plumes he hurled javelins with frightful quickness giving at intervals a long shrill whistle the great beasts docile as dogs kept an eye on him during the carnage the circle of them narrowed by degrees the weakened barbarians offered no resistance the elephants were soon in the centre of the plain they lacked space they thronged half rearing together and their tusks clashed against one another suddenly narhavas quieted them and wheeling around they trotted back to the hills two syntagmata however had taken refuge on the right in a bend of ground had thrown away their arms and were all kneeling with their faces towards the punic tents imploring mercy with uplifted arms their legs and hands were tied then when they were stretched on the ground beside one another the elephants were brought back their breasts cracked like boxes being forced two were crushed at every step the big feet sank into the bodies with a motion of the haunches which made the elephants appear lame they went on to the very end the level surface of the plain again became motionless night fell hamilcar was delighting himself with the spectacle of his vengeance 
but suddenly he started he saw and all saw some more barbarians six hundred paces to the left of the summit of a peak in fact four hundred of the stoutest mercenaries etruscans libyans and spartans had gained the heights at the beginning and had remained there in uncertainty until now after the massacre of their companions they resolved to make their way through the carthaginians they were already descending in serried columns in a marvellous and formidable fashion a herald was immediately dispatched to them the suffet needed soldiers he received them unconditionally so greatly did he admire their bravery they could even said the man of carthage come a little nearer to a place which he pointed out to them where they would find provisions the barbarians ran thither and spent the night in eating then the carthaginians broke into clamours against the suffet's partiality for the mercenaries did he yield to these outbursts of insatiable hatred or was it a refinement of treachery the next day he came himself without a sword and bareheaded with an escort of clinabarians and announced to them that having too many to feed he did not intend to keep them nevertheless as he wanted men and he knew of no means of selecting the good ones they were to fight together to the death he would then admit the conquerors into his own bodyguard this death was quite as good as another and then moving his soldiers aside for the punic standards hid the horizon from the mercenaries he showed them the one hundred and ninety-two elephants under narhavas forming a single straight line their trunks brandishing broad steel blades like giant arms holding axes above their heads the barbarians looked at one another silently it was not death that made them turn pale but the horrible compulsion to which they found themselves reduced the community of their lives had brought about profound friendship among these men the camp with most took the place of their country living without a family they transferred the needful tenderness to a companion and they would fall asleep in the starlight side by side under the same cloak and then in their perpetual wanderings through all sorts of countries murders and adventures they had contracted affections one for the other in which the stronger protected the younger in the midst of battles helped him to cross precipices sponged the sweat of fevers from his brow and stole food for him and the weaker a child perhaps who had been picked up on the roadside and had then become a mercenary repaid this devotion by a thousand kindnesses they exchanged their necklaces and earrings presents which they had made to one another in former days after great peril or in hours of intoxication all asked to die and none would strike a young fellow might be seen here and there saying to another whose beard was grey no no you are more robust you will avenge us kill me and the man would reply i have fewer years to live strike to the heart and think no more about it brothers gazed on one another with clasped hands and friend bade friend eternal farewells standing and weeping upon his shoulder they threw off their curses that the sword points might be thrust in the more quickly then there appeared the marks of the great blows which they had received for carthage and which looked like inscriptions on columns they placed themselves in four equal ranks after the fashion of gladiators and began with timid engagements some had even bandaged their eyes and their swords waved gently through the air like blind men's sticks 
the carthaginians hooted and shouted to them that they were cowards the barbarians became animated and soon the combat as general headlong and terrible sometimes two men all covered with blood would stop fall into each other's arms and die with mutual kisses none drew back they rushed upon the extended blades their delirium was so frenzied that the carthaginians in the distance were afraid at last they stopped their breasts made a great hoarse noise and their eyeballs could be seen through their long hair which hung down as though it had come out of a purple bath several were turning around rapidly like panthers wounded in the forehead others stood motionless looking at a corpse at their feet then they would suddenly tear their faces with their nails take their swords with both hands and plunge them into their own bodies there were still sixty left they asked for drink they were told by shouts to throw away their swords and when they had done so water was brought to them while they were drinking with their faces buried in the vases sixty carthaginians leaped upon them and killed them with stilettos in the back hamilcar had done this to gratify the instincts of his army and by means of this treachery to attach it to his own person End of chapter fourteen part two Chapter fourteen part four of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter fourteen part four. In this way they lingered for three months along the eastern coast, and then behind the mountain of Selum, and as far as the first sands of the desert. They sought for a place of refuge, no matter where utica and hipposeritus alone had not betrayed them but hamilcar was encompassing these two towns then they went northwards at haphazard without even knowing the various routes their many miseries had confused their understandings the only feeling left them was one of exasperation which went on developing and one day they found themselves again in the gorges of cobus and once more before carthage then the actions multiplied fortune remained equal but both sides were so wearied that they would willingly have exchanged these skirmishes for a great battle provided that it were really the last matho was inclined to carry this proposal himself to the suffet one of his libyans devoted himself for the purpose all were convinced as they saw him depart that he would not return he returned the same evening hamilcar accepted the challenge the encounter should take place the following day at sunrise in the plain of rades the mercenaries wished to know whether he had said anything more and the libyan added as i remained in his presence he asked me what i was waiting for to be killed i replied then he rejoined no be gone that will be to-morrow with the rest this generosity astonished the barbarians some were terrified by it and matho regretted that the emissary had not been killed he had still remaining three thousand africans twelve hundred greeks fifteen hundred campanians two hundred iberians four hundred etruscans five hundred samnites forty gauls and a troop of nafurs nomad bandits met with in the date region 
in all seven thousand two hundred and nineteen soldiers but not one complete syntagmata they had stopped up the holes in their cuirasses with the shoulder-blades of quadrupeds and replaced their brass cotherni with worn sandals their garments were weighed with copper or steel plates their coats of mail hung in tatters about them and scars appeared like purple threads through the hair on their arms and faces the wraiths of their dead companions came back to their souls and increased their energy they felt in a confused way that they were the ministers of a god diffused in the hearts of the oppressed and were the pontiffs so to speak of universal vengeance then they were enraged with grief at what was extravagant injustice and above all by the sight of carthage on the horizon they swore an oath to fight for one another until death the beasts of burden were killed and as much as possible was eaten so as to gain strength afterwards they slept some prayed turning towards different constellations the carthaginians arrived first in the plain they rubbed the edges of their shields with oil to make the arrows glide off them easily the foot-soldiers who wore long hair took the precaution of cutting it on the forehead and hamilcar ordered all bowls to be inverted from the fifth hour knowing that it is disadvantageous to fight with the stomach too full his army amounted to fourteen thousand men or about double the number of the barbarians nevertheless he had never felt such anxiety if he succumbed it would mean the annihilation of the republic and he would perish on the cross if on the contrary he triumphed he would reach italy by way of the pyrenees the gauls and the alps and the empire of the barcas would become eternal twenty times during the night he rose to inspect everything himself down to the most trifling details as to the carthaginians they were exasperated by their lengthened terror narr havas suspected the fidelity of his numidians moreover the barbarians might vanquish them a strange weakness had come upon him every moment he drank large cups of water but a man whom he did not know opened his tent and laid on the ground a crown of rock-salt adorned with hieratic designs formed with sulphur and lozenges of mother-of-pearl a marriage crown was sometimes sent to a betrothed husband it was a proof of love a sort of invitation nevertheless hamilcar's daughter had no tenderness for narr the recollection of mato disturbed her in an intolerable manner it seemed to her that the death of this man would unburden her thoughts just as people to cure themselves of the bite of a viper crush it upon the wound the king of the numidians was depending upon her he awaited the wedding with impatience and as it was to follow the victory salambo made him this present to stimulate his courage then his distress vanished and he thought only of the happiness of possessing so beautiful a woman the same vision had assailed mato but he cast it from him immediately and his love that he thus thrust back was poured out upon his companions in arms he cherished them like portions of his own person of his hatred and he felt his spirit higher and his arms stronger everything that he was to accomplish appeared clearly before him if sighs sometimes escaped him it was because he was thinking of spendius he drew up the barbarians in six equal ranks he posted the etruscans in the centre all being fastened to a bronze chain the archers were behind and on the wings he distributed the nafurs who were mounted on short-haired camels covered with ostrich feathers 
the suffet arranged the carthaginians in similar order he placed the clinabarians outside the infantry next to the velites and the numidians beyond when day appeared both sides were thus in line face to face all gazed at each other from a distance with round fierce eyes there was at first some hesitation at last both armies moved the barbarians advanced slowly so as not to become out of breath beating the ground with their feet the centre of the punic army formed a convex curve then came the burst of a terrible shock like the crash of two fleets in collision the first rank of the barbarians had quickly opened up and the marksmen hidden behind the others discharged their bullets arrows and javelins the curve of the carthaginians however flattened by degrees became quite straight and then bent inwards upon this the two sections of the velites drew together in parallel lines like the legs of a compass that is being closed the barbarians who were attacking the phalanx with fury entered the gap they were being lost mato checked them and while the carthaginian wings continued to advance he drew out the three inner ranks of his line they soon covered his flanks and his army appeared in triple array but the barbarians placed at the extremities were the weakest especially those on the left who had exhausted their quivers and the troop of velites which had at last come up against them was cutting them up greatly mato made them fall back his right comprised companions who were armed with axes he hurled them against the carthaginian left the centre attacked the enemy and those at the other extremity who were out of peril kept the velites at a distance then hamilcar divided his horsemen into squadrons placed hoplites between them and sent them against the mercenaries those cone-shaped masses presented a front of horses and their broader sides were filled and bristling with lances the barbarians found it impossible to resist the greek foot-soldiers alone had brazen armour all the rest had cutlasses on the end of poles scythes taken from the farms or swords manufactured out of the fillies of wheels the soft blades were twisted by a blow and while they were engaged in straightening them under their heels the carthaginians massacred them right and left at their ease but the etruscans riveted to their chain did not stir those who were dead being prevented from falling formed an obstruction with their corpses and the great bronze line widened and contracted in turn as supple as a serpent and as impregnable as a wall the barbarians would come to reform behind it pant for a minute and then set off again with the fragments of their weapons in their hands many already had none left and they leaped upon the carthaginians biting their faces like dogs the gauls in their pride stripped themselves of the sagam they showed their great white bodies from a distance and they enlarged their wounds to terrify the enemy the voice of the crier announcing the orders could no longer be heard in the midst of the punic syntagmata their signals were being repeated by the standards which were raised above the dust and every one was swept away in the swaying of the great mass that surrounded him hamilcar commanded the numidians to advance but the nephurs rushed to meet them clad in vast black robes with a tuft of hair on the top of the skull and a shield of rhinoceros leather they wielded a steel which had no handle and which they held by a rope and their camels which bristled all over with feathers uttered long hoarse cluckings 
each blade fell on a precise spot then rose again with a smart stroke carrying off a limb with it the fierce beasts galloped through the syntagmata some whose legs were broken went hopping along like wounded ostriches the punic infantry turned in a body upon the barbarians and cut them off their maniples wheeled about at intervals from one another the more brilliant carthaginian weapons encircled them like golden crowns there was a swarming movement in the centre and the sun striking down upon the points of the swords made them glitter with white flickering gleams however files of clinabarians lay stretched upon the plain some mercenaries snatched away their armour clothed themselves in it and then returned to the fray the deluded carthaginians were several times entangled in their midst they would stand stupidly motionless or else would back surge again and triumphant shouts rising in the distance seemed to drive them along like derelicts in a storm hamilcar was growing desperate all was about to perish beneath the genius of mato and the invincible courage of the mercenaries but a great noise of tambourines burst forth on the horizon it was a crowd of old men sick persons children of fifteen years of age and even women who being unable to withstand their distress any longer had set out from carthage and for the purpose of placing themselves under the protection of something formidable had taken from hamilcar's palace the only elephant that the republic now possessed that one namely whose trunk had been cut off then it seemed to the carthaginians that their country forsaking its walls was coming to command them to die for her they were seized with increased fury and the numidians carried away all the rest the barbarians had set themselves with their backs to a hillock in the centre of the plain they had no chance of conquering or even of surviving but they were the best the most intrepid and the strongest the people from carthage began to throw spits larding pins and hammers over the heads of the numidians those whom consuls had feared died beneath sticks hurled by women the punic populace was exterminating the mercenaries the latter had taken refuge on the top of the hill their circle closed up every fresh breach twice it descended to be immediately repulsed with a shock and the carthaginians stretched forth their arms pall-mall thrusting their pikes between the legs of their companions and raking at random before them they slipped in the blood the steep slope of the ground made the corpses roll to the bottom the elephant which was trying to climb the hillock was up to its belly it seemed to be crawling over them with delight and its shortened trunk which was broad at the extremity rose from time to time like an enormous leech then all paused the carthaginians ground their teeth as they gazed at the hill where the barbarians were standing at last they dashed at them abruptly and the fight began again the mercenaries would often let them approach shouting to them that they wished to surrender then with frightful sneers they would kill themselves at a blow and as the dead fell the rest would mount upon them to defend themselves it was a kind of pyramid which grew larger by degrees soon there were only fifty then only twenty only three and lastly only two a samnit armed with an axe and mato who still had his sword the samnit with bent hams swept his axe alternately to the right and left 
at the same time warning matto of the blows that were being aimed at him master this way that way stoop down matto had lost his shoulder pieces his helmet his cuirass he was completely naked and more livid than the dead with his hair quite erect and two patches of foam at the corners of his lips and his sword whirled so rapidly that it formed an aureola around him a stone broke it near the guard the samnite was killed and the flood of carthaginians closed in they touched matto then he raised both his empty hands towards heaven closed his eyes and opening out his arms like a man throwing himself from the summit of a promontory into the sea hurled himself among the pikes they moved away before him several times he ran against the carthaginians but they always drew back and turned their weapons aside his foot struck against a sword matto tried to seize it he felt himself tied by the wrists and knees and fell narr havas had been following him for some time step by step with one of the large nets used for capturing wild beasts and taking advantage of the moment when he stooped down had involved him in it then he was fastened on the elephants with his four limbs forming a cross and all those who were not wounded escorted him and rushed with great tumult towards carthage the news of the victory had arrived some inexplicable way at the third hour of the night the clepsydra of Carmon had just completed the fifth as they reached malqua then matto opened his eyes there were so many lights in the houses that the town appeared to be all in flames an immense clamour reached him dimly and lying on his back he looked at the stars then a door closed and he was wrapped in darkness on the morrow at the same hour the last of the men left in the pass of the hatchet expired on the day that their companions had set out some zuaeks who were returning had tumbled the rocks down and had fed them for some time the barbarians constantly expected to see matto appear and from discouragement from languor and from the obstinacy of sick men who object to change their situation they would not leave the mountain at last the provisions were exhausted and the zuaeks went away it was known that they numbered scarcely more than thirteen hundred men and there was no need to employ soldiers to put an end to them wild beasts especially lions had multiplied during the three years that the war had lasted narr havas had held a great battue and after tying goats at intervals had run upon them and so driven them towards the pass of the hatchet and they were now all living in it when a man arrived who had been sent by the ancients to find out what there was left of the barbarians lions and corpses were lying over the tract of the plain and the dead were mingled with clothes and armour nearly all had the face or an arm wanting some appeared to be still intact others were completely dried up and their helmets were filled with powdery skulls feet which had lost their flesh stood out straight from the nimites skeletons still wore their cloaks and bones cleaned by the sun made gleaming spots in the midst of the sand the lions were resting with their breasts against the ground and both paws stretched out winking their eyelids in the bright daylight which was heightened by the reflection from the white rocks others were seated on their hindquarters and staring before them or else were sleeping 
rolled into a ball and half hidden by their great manes they all looked well fed tired and dull they were as motionless as the mountain and the dead night was falling the sky was striped with broad red bands in the west in one of the heaps which in an irregular fashion embossed the plain something rose up vaguer than a spectre then one of the lions set himself in motion his monstrous form cutting a black shadow on the background of the purple sky and when he was quite close to the man he knocked him down with a single blow of his paw then stretching himself flat upon him he slowly drew out the entrails with the edge of his teeth afterwards he opened his huge jaws and for some minutes uttered a lengthened roar which was repeated by the echoes in the mountain and was finally lost in the solitude suddenly some small gravel rolled down from above the rustling of rapid steps was heard and in the direction of the portcullis and of the gorge there appeared pointed muzzles and straight ears with gleaming tawny eyes these were the jackals coming to eat what was left the carthaginian who was leaning over the top of the precipice to look went back again End of chapter fourteen Chapter fourteen part three of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caroline. Chapter fourteen part three. The war then was ended, at least he believed that it was. Matu would not resist. In his impatience, the Suffet commanded an immediate departure his scouts came to tell him that a convoy had been descried departing towards the lead mountain hamilcar did not trouble himself about it the mercenaries once annihilated the nomads would give him no further trouble the important matter was to take tunis he advanced by forced marches upon it he had sent narhavas to carthage with the news of his victory and the king of the numidians proud of his success visited salambo she received him in her gardens under a large sycamore tree amid pillows of yellow leather and with tarnach beside her her face was covered with a white scarf which passing over her mouth and forehead allowed only her eyes to be seen but her lips shone in the transparency of the tissue like the gems on her fingers for salambo had both her hands wrapped up and did not make a gesture during the whole conversation narhavas announced the defeat of the barbarians to her she thanked him with a blessing for the services which he had rendered to her father then he began to tell her about the whole campaign the doves on the palm trees around them cooed softly and other birds fluttered amid the grass ring-necked glareolas tartessus quails and punic guinea fowl the garden long uncultivated had multiplied its verdure coloquintidas mounted into the branches of cassias the asclepias was scattered over the fields of roses all kinds of vegetation formed entwinings and bowers and here and there as in the woods sun-rays descending obliquely marked the shadow of a leaf upon the ground domestic animals grown wild again fled at the slightest noise sometimes a gazelle might be seen trailing scattered peacock's feathers after its little black hoofs 
the clamours of the distant town were lost in the murmuring of the waves the sky was quite blue and not a sail was visible on the sea narr havas had ceased speaking salambo was looking at him without replying he wore a linen robe with flowers painted on it and with gold fringes at the hem two silver arrows fastened his plaited hair at the tips of his ears his right hand rested on a pike-staff adorned with suckles of electrum and tufts of hair as she watched him a crowd of dim thoughts absorbed her this young man with his gentle voice and feminine figure captivated her eyes by the grace of his person and seemed to her like an elder sister sent by the baals to protect her the recollection of matto came upon her nor did she resist the desire to learn what had become of him narr havas replied that the carthaginians were advancing towards tunis to take it in proportion as he set forth their chances of success and matto's weaknesses she seemed to rejoice in extraordinary hope her lips trembled her breast panted when he finally promised to kill him himself she exclaimed yes kill him it must be so the numidian replied that he desired this death ardently since he would be her husband when the war was over salambo started and bent her head but narr havas pursuing the subject compared his longings to flowers languishing for rain or to lost travellers waiting for the day he told her further that she was more beautiful than the moon better than the wind of morning or than the face of a guest he would bring for her from the country of the blacks things such as there were none in carthage and the apartments in their house should be sanded with gold dust evening fell and odours of balsam were exhaled for a long time they looked at each other in silence and salambo's eyes in the depth of her long draperies resembled two stars in the rift of a cloud before the sun set he withdrew the ancients felt themselves relieved of a great anxiety when he left carthage the people had received him with even more enthusiastic acclamations than on the first occasion if hamilcar and the king of the numidians triumphed alone over the mercenaries it would be impossible to resist them to weaken barca they therefore resolved to make the aged hanno him whom they loved a sharer in the deliverance of carthage he proceeded immediately towards the western provinces to take his vengeance in the very places which had witnessed his shame but the inhabitants and the barbarians were dead hidden or fled then his anger was vented upon the country he burnt the ruins of the ruins he did not leave a single tree nor a blade of grass the children and the infirm that were met with were tortured he gave the women to his soldiers to be violated before they were slaughtered often on the crests of the hills black tents were struck as though overturned by the wind and broad brilliantly bordered discs which were recognized as being chariot wheels revolved with a plaintive sound as they gradually disappeared in the valleys the tribes which had abandoned the siege of carthage were wandering in this way through the provinces waiting for an opportunity or for some victory to be gained by the mercenaries in order to return but whether from terror or famine they all took the roads to their native lands and disappeared hamilcar was not jealous of hanno's successes nevertheless he was in a hurry to end matters he commanded him to fall back upon tunis and hanno who loved his country was under the walls of the town on the appointed day for its protection it had its aboriginal population 
twelve thousand mercenaries and in addition all the eaters of uncleanness for like matto they were riveted to the horizon of carthage and plebs and skaliskim gazed at its lofty walls from afar looking back in thought to boundless enjoyments with this harmony of hatred resistance was briskly organized leathern bottles were taken to make helmets all the palm trees in the gardens were cut down for lances cisterns were dug while for provisions they caught on the shores of the lake big white fish fed on corpses and filth their ramparts kept in ruins now by the jealousy of carthage were so weak that they could be thrown down with a push of the shoulder matto stopped up the holes in them with the stones of the houses it was the last struggle he hoped for nothing and yet he told himself that fortune was fickle as the carthaginians approached they noticed a man on the rampart who towered over the battlements from his belt upwards the arrows that flew about him seemed to frighten him no more than a swarm of swallows extraordinary to say none of them touched him hamilcar pitched his camp on the south side narhavas to his right occupied the plain of rades and hanno the shore of the lake and the three generals were to maintain their respective positions so as all to attack the walls simultaneously but hamilcar wished first to show the mercenaries that he would punish them like slaves he had the ten ambassadors crucified beside one another on a hillock in front of the town at the sight of this the besieged forsook the rampart matho had said to himself that if he could pass between the walls and narhavas's tents with such rapidity that the numidians had not time to come out he would fall upon the rear of the carthaginian infantry who would be caught between his division and those inside he dashed out with his veterans narhavas perceived him he crossed the shore of the lake and came to warn hanno to dispatch men to hamilcar's assistance did he believe barca too weak to resist the mercenaries was it a piece of treachery or folly no one could ever learn hanno desiring to humiliate his rival did not hesitate he shouted orders to sound the trumpets and his whole army rushed upon the barbarians the latter returned and ran straight against the carthaginians they knocked them down crushed them under their feet and driving them back in this way reached the tent of hanno who was then surrounded by thirty carthaginians the most illustrious of the ancients he appeared stupefied by their audacity he called for his captains every one thrust his fist under his throat vociferating abuse the crowd pressed on and those who had their hands on him could scarce retain their hold however he tried to whisper to them i will give you whatever you want i am rich save me they dragged him along heavy as he was his feet did not touch the ground the ancients had been carried off his terror increased you have beaten me i am your captive i will ransom myself listen to me my friends and borne along by all those shoulders which were pressed against his sides he repeated what are you going to do what do you want you can see that i am not obstinate i have always been good-natured a gigantic cross stood at the gate the barbarians howled here here but he raised his voice still higher and in the names of their gods he called upon them to lead him to the skaliskim because he wished to confide to him something on which their safety depended they paused some asserting that it was right to summon matto 
he was sent for hanno fell upon the grass and he saw around him other crosses also as though the torture by which he was about to perish had been multiplied beforehand he made efforts to convince himself that he was mistaken that there was only one and even to believe that there were none at all at last he was lifted up speak said matto he offered to give up hamilcar then they would enter carthage and both be kings matto withdrew signing to the others to make haste it was a stratagem he thought to gain time the barbarian was mistaken hanno was in an extremity when consideration is had to nothing and moreover he so execrated hamilcar that he would have sacrificed him and all his soldiers on the slightest hope of safety the ancients were languishing on the ground at the foot of the crosses ropes had already been passed beneath their armpits then the old suffet understanding that he must die wept they tore off the clothes that were still left on him and the horror of his person appeared ulcers covered the nameless mass the fat on his legs hid the nails on his feet from his fingers there hung what looked like greenish strips and the tears streaming through the tubercles on his cheeks gave to his face an expression of frightful sadness for they seemed to take up more room than on another human face his royal fillet which was half unfastened trailed with his white hair in the dust they thought that they had no ropes strong enough to haul him up to the top of the cross and they nailed him upon it after the punic fashion before it was erected but his pride awoke in his pain he began to overwhelm them with abuse he foamed and twisted like a marine monster being slaughtered on the shore and predicted that they would all end more horribly still and that he would be avenged he was on the other side of the town whence there now escaped jets of flame with columns of smoke the ambassadors from the mercenaries were in their last throes some who had swooned at first had just revived in the freshness of the wind but their chins still rested upon their breasts and their bodies had fallen somewhat in spite of the nails in their arms which were fastened higher than their heads from their heels and hands blood fell in big slow drops as ripe fruit falls from the branches of a tree and carthage gulf mountains and plains all appeared to them to be revolving like an immense wheel sometimes a cloud of dust rising from the ground enveloped them in its eddies they burnt with horrible thirst their tongues curled in their mouths and they felt an icy sweat flowing over them with their departing souls nevertheless they had glimpses at an indefinite depth of streets marching soldiers and the swinging of swords and the tumults of battle reached them dimly like the noise of the sea to shipwrecked men dying on the masts of a ship the italiotes who were sturdier than the rest were still shrieking the lacedaemonians were silent with eyelids closed zaxas once so vigorous was bending like a broken reed the ethiopian beside him had his head thrown back over the arms of the cross oteritus was motionless rolling his eyes his great head of hair caught in a cleft in the wood fell straight upon his forehead and his death-rattle seemed rather to be a roar of anger as to spendius a strange courage had come to him he despised life now in the certainty which he possessed of an almost immediate and an eternal emancipation and he awaited death with impassibility 
amid their swooning they sometimes started at the brushing of feathers passing across their lips large wings swung shadows around them croakings sounded in the air and as spendius's cross was the highest it was upon his that the first vulture alighted then he turned his face towards oteritus and said slowly to him with an unaccountable smile do you remember the lions on the road to sicca they were our brothers replied the gaul as he expired the suffet meanwhile had bored through the walls and reached the citadel the smoke suddenly disappeared before a gust of wind discovering the horizon as far as the walls of carthage he even thought that he could distinguish people watching on the platform of eskmoun then bringing back his eyes he perceived thirty crosses of extravagant size on the shore of the lake to the left in fact to render them still more frightful they had been constructed with tent-poles fastened end to end and the thirty corpses of the ancients appeared high up in the sky they had what looked like white butterflies on their breasts these were the feathers of the arrows which had been shot at them from below a broad gold ribbon shone on the summit of the highest it hung down to the shoulder there being no arm on that side and hamilcar had some difficulty in recognizing hanno his spongy bones had given way under the iron pins portions of his limbs had come off and nothing was left on the cross but shapeless remains like the fragments of animals that are hung up on huntsmen's doors the suffet could not have known anything about it the town in front of him masked everything that was beyond and behind and the captains who had been successively sent to the two generals had not reappeared then fugitives arrived with the tale of the rout and the punic army halted this catastrophe falling upon them as it did in the midst of their victory stupefied them hamilcar's orders were no longer listened to mato took advantage of this to continue his ravages among the numidians hanno's camp having been overthrown he had returned against them the elephants came out but the mercenaries advanced through the plain shaking about flaming firebrands which they had plucked from the walls and the great beasts in fright ran headlong into the gulf where they killed one another in their struggles or were drowned beneath the weight of their caresses narr havas had already launched his cavalry all threw themselves face downwards upon the ground then when the horses were within three paces of them they sprang beneath their bellies ripped them open with dagger strokes and half the numidians had perished when barca came up the exhausted mercenaries could not withstand his troops they retired in good order to the mountain of the hot springs the suffet was prudent enough not to pursue them he directed his course to the mouths of the Makaras. tunis was his but it was now nothing but a heap of smoking rubbish the ruins fell through the breaches in the walls to the centre of the plain quite in the background between the shores of the gulf the corpses of the elephants drifting before the wind conflicted like an archipelago of black rocks floating on the water narr had drained his forests of these animals taking young and old male and female to keep up the war and the military force of his kingdom could not repair the loss the people who had seen them perishing at a distance were grieved at it men lamented in the streets calling them by their names like deceased friends ah the invincible the victory the thunderer the swallow on the first day too there was no talk except of the dead citizens 
but on the morrow the tents of the mercenaries were seen on the mountain of the hot springs then so deep was the despair that many people especially women flung themselves headlong from the top of the acropolis hamilcar's designs were not known he lived alone in his tent with none near him but a young boy and no one ever ate with them not even excepting narhavas nevertheless he showed great deference to the latter after hanno's defeat but the king of the numidians had too great an interest in becoming his son not to distrust him this inertness veiled skilful manoeuvres hamilcar seduced the heads of the villages by all sorts of artifices and the mercenaries were hunted repulsed and enclosed like wild beasts as soon as they entered a wood the trees caught fire around them when they drank of a spring it was poisoned the caves in which they hid in order to sleep were walled up their old accomplices the populations who had hitherto defended them now pursued them and they continually recognized carthaginian armor in these bands many had their faces consumed with red tetters this they thought had come to them through touching hanno others imagined that it was because they had eaten salambo's fishes and far from repenting of it they dreamt of even more abominable sacrileges so that the abasement of the punic gods might still be greater they would fain have exterminated them End of chapter fourteen part three Chapter Fifteen of Salambo by Gustave Flaubert. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Fifteen, Mato. There were rejoicings at Carthage, rejoicings deep, universal, extravagant, frantic. The holes of the ruins had been stopped up the statues of the gods had been repainted the streets were strewn with myrtle branches incense smoked at the corners of the crossways and the throng on the terraces looked in their variegated garments like heaps of flowers blooming in the air the shouts of the water-carriers watering the pavement rose above the continual screaming of voices slaves belonging to hamilcar offered in his name roasted barley and pieces of raw meat people accosted one another and embraced one another with tears the tyrian towns were taken the nomads dispersed and all the barbarians annihilated the acropolis was hidden beneath coloured velaria the beaks of the triremes drawn up in line outside the mole shone like a dike of diamonds everywhere there was a sense of the restoration of order the beginning of a new existence and the diffusion of vast happiness it was the day of salambo's marriage with the king of the numidians on the terrace of the temple of Kamon there were three long tables laden with gigantic plate at which the priests ancients and the rich were to sit and there was a fourth and higher one for hamilcar narhavas and salambo for as she had saved her country by the restoration of the zaimph the people turned her wedding-day into a national rejoicing and were waiting in the square below till she should appear but their impatience was excited by another and more acrid longing Mato's death has been promised for the ceremony. 
it had been proposed at first to flay him alive to pour lead into his entrails to kill him with hunger he should be tied to a tree and an ape behind him should strike him on the head with a stone he had offended tanith and the cynocephaluses of tanith should avenge her others were of opinion that he should be led about on a dromedary after linen wicks dipped in oil had been inserted in his body in several places and they took pleasure in the thought of the large animal wandering through the streets with this man writhing beneath the fires like a candelabrum blown about by the wind but what citizens should be charged with his torture and why disappoint the rest they would have liked a kind of death in which the whole town might take part in which every hand every weapon everything carthaginian to the very paving-stones in the streets and the waves in the gulf could rend him and crush him and annihilate him accordingly the ancients decided that he should go from his prison to the square of carmon without any escort and with his arms fastened to his back it was forbidden to strike him to the heart in order that he might live the longer to put out his eyes so that he might see the torture through to hurl anything against his person or to lay more than three fingers upon him at a time although he was not to appear until the end of the day the people sometimes fancied that he could be seen and the crowd would rush towards the acropolis and empty the streets to return with lengthened murmurings some people had remained standing in the same place since the day before and they would call on one another from a distance and show their nails which they had allowed to grow the better to bury them in his flesh others walked restlessly up and down some were as pale as though they were awaiting their own execution suddenly lofty feather fans rose above the heads behind the mappalian district it was salambo leaving her palace a sigh of relief found vent but the procession was long in coming it marched with deliberation first there filed past the priests of the pataic guards then those of eskmoun of melkarth and all the other colleges in succession with the same insignia and in the same order as had been observed at the time of the sacrifice the pontiffs of moloch passed with heads bent and the multitude stood aside from them in a kind of remorse but the priests of rabetna advanced with a proud step and with lyres in their hands the priestesses followed them in transparent robes of yellow or black uttering cries like birds and writhing like vipers or else whirling around to the sound of flutes to imitate the dance of the stars while their light garments wafted puffs to delicate scents through the streets the kedeskim with painted eyelids who symbolized the hermaphrodism of the divinity received applause among these women and being perfumed and dressed like them they resembled them in spite of their flat breasts and narrower hips moreover on this day the female principle dominated and confused all things a mystic voluptuousness moved in the heavy air the torches were already lighted in the depth of the sacred woods there was to be a great celebration there during the night three vessels had brought courtesans from sicily and others had come from the desert as the colleges arrived they ranged themselves in the courts of the temples on the outer galleries and along double staircases which rose against the walls and drew together at the top 
files of white robes appeared between the colonnades and the architecture was peopled with human statues motionless as statues of stone then came the masters of the exchequer the governors of the provinces and all the rich a great tumult prevailed below adjacent streets were discharging the crowd hero duels were driving it back with blows of sticks and then salammbo appeared in a litter surmounted by a purple canopy and surrounded by the ancients crowned with their golden tiaras thereupon an immense shout arose the cymbals and crotala sounded more loudly the tabourines thundered and the great purple canopy sank between the two pylons it appeared again on the first landing salammbo was walking slowly beneath it then she crossed the terrace to take her seat behind on a kind of throne cut out of the carapace of a tortoise an ivory stool with three steps was pushed beneath her feet two negro children knelt on the edge of the first step and sometimes she would rest both arms which were laden with rings of excessive weight upon their heads from ankle to hip she was covered with a network of narrow meshes which were in imitation of fish scales and shone like mother-of-pearl her waist was clasped by a blue zone which allowed her breasts to be seen through two crescent-shaped slashings the nipples were hidden by carbuncle pendants she had a head-dress made of peacock's feathers studded with gems an ample cloak as white as snow fell behind her and with her elbows at her sides her knees pressed together and circles of diamonds on the upper part of her arms she remained perfectly upright in a hieratic attitude her father and her husband were on two lower seats narhavas dressed in a light simar and wearing his crown of rock salt from which there strayed two tresses of hair as twisted as the horns of ammon and hamilcar in a violet tunic figured with gold vine branches and with a battle sword at his side the python of the temple of eskmoun lay on the ground amid pools of pink oil in the space enclosed by the tables and biting its tail described a large black circle in the middle of the circle there was a copper pillar bearing a crystal egg and as the sun shone upon it rays were emitted on every side behind salammbo stretched the priests of tanith in linen robes on her right the ancients in their tiaras formed a great gold line and on the other side the rich with their emerald sceptres a great green line while quite in the background where the priests of moloch were ranged the cloaks looked like a wall of purple the other colleges occupied the lower terraces the multitude obstructed the streets it reached to the housetops and extended in long files to the summit of the acropolis having thus the people at her feet the firmament above her head and around her the immensity of the sea the gulf the mountains and the distant provinces salammbo in her splendour was blended with tanith and seemed the very genius of carthage and its embodied soul the feast was to last all night and lamps with several branches were planted like trees on the painted woolen cloths which covered the low tables large electrum flagons blue glass amphoras tortoise shell spoons and small round loaves were crowded between the double row of pearl bordered plates bunches of grapes with their leaves had been rolled around ivory vine-stalks after the fashion of the thyrsus 
blocks of snow were melting on ebony trays and lemons pomegranates gourds and watermelons formed hillocks beneath the lofty silver plate boars with open jaws were wallowing in the dust of spices hares covered with their fur appeared to be bounding amid the flowers there were shells filled with forcemeat the pastry had symbolic shapes when the covers of the dishes were removed doves flew out the slaves meanwhile with tunics tucked up were going about on tiptoe from time to time a hymn sounded on the lyres or a choir of voices rose the clamour of the people continuous as the noise of the sea floated vaguely around the feast and seemed to lull it in a broader harmony some recalled the banquet of the mercenaries they gave themselves up to dreams of happiness the sun was beginning to go down and the crescent of the moon was already rising in another part of the sky but salambo turned her head as though some one had called her the people who were watching her followed the direction of her eyes the door of the dungeon hewn in the rock at the foot of the temple on the summit of the acropolis had just opened and a man was standing on the threshold of this black hole he came forth bent double with the scared look of fallow deer when suddenly enlarged the light dazzled him he stood motionless a while all had recognized him and they all held their breath in their eyes the body of this victim was something peculiarly theirs and was adorned with almost religious splendour they bent forward to see him especially the women they burned to gaze upon him who had caused the deaths of their children and husbands and from the bottom of their souls there sprang up in spite of themselves an infamous curiosity a desire to know him completely a wish mingled with remorse which turned to increased execration at last he advanced then the stupefaction of surprise disappeared numbers of arms were raised and he was lost to sight the staircase of the acropolis had sixty steps he descended them as though he were rolled down in a torrent from the top of a mountain three times he was seen to leap and then he alighted below on his feet his shoulders were bleeding his breast was panting with great shocks and he made such efforts to burst his bonds that his arms which were crossed on his naked loins swelled like pieces of a serpent several streets began in front of him leading from the spot at which he found himself in each of them a triple row of bronze chains fastened to the navels of the Pataic guards extended in parallel lines from one end to the other the crowd was massed against the houses and servants belonging to the ancients walked in the middle brandishing thongs one of them drove him forward with a great blow Mato began to move they thrust their arms over the chains shouting out that the road had been left too wide for him and he passed along felt pricked and slashed by all those fingers when he reached the end of one street another appeared several times he flung himself to one side to bite them they speedily dispersed the chains held him back and the crowd burst out laughing a child rent his ear a young girl hiding the point of a spindle in her sleeve split his cheek they tore handfuls of hair from him and strips of flesh 
others smeared his face with sponges steeped in filth and fastened upon sticks a stream of blood started from the right side of his neck frenzy immediately set in this last barbarian was to them a representative of all the barbarians and all the army they were taking vengeance on him for their disasters their terrors and their shame the rage of the mob developed with its gratification the curving chains were overstrained and were on the point of breaking the people did not feel the blows of the slaves who struck at them to drive them back some clung to the projections of the houses all the openings in the walls were stopped up with heads and they howled at him the mischief that they could not inflict upon him it was atrocious filthy abuse mingled with ironical encouragements and imprecations and his present tortures not being enough for them they foretold to him others that should be still more terrible in eternity this vast baying filled carthage with stupid continuity frequently a single syllable a hoarse deep and frantic intonation would be repeated for several minutes by the entire people the walls would vibrate with it from top to bottom and both sides of the street would seem to matto to be coming against him and carrying him off the ground like two immense arms stifling him in the air nevertheless he remembered that he had experienced something like it before the same crowd was on the terraces there were the same looks and the same wrath but then he had walked free all had then dispersed for a god covered him and the recollection of this gaining precision by degrees brought a crushing sadness upon him shadows passed before his eyes the town whirled round in his head his blood streamed from a wound in his hip he felt that he was dying his hands bent and he sank quite gently upon the pavement some one went to the peristyle of the temple of melkarth took thence the bar of a tripod heated red-hot in the coals and slipping it beneath the first chain pressed it against his wound the flesh was seen to smoke the hootings of the people drowned his voice he was standing again six paces further on and he fell a third and again a fourth time but some new torture always made him rise they discharged little drops of boiling oil through tubes at him they strewed pieces of broken glass beneath his feet still he walked on at the corner of the street of sartip he leaned his back against the wall beneath the penthouse of a shop and advanced no further the slaves of the council struck him with their whips of hippototamus leather so furiously and long that the fringes of their tunics were drenched with sweat matsu appeared insensible suddenly he started off and began to run at random making a noise with his lips like one shivering with severe cold he threaded the street of boots and the street of sopo crossed the green market and reached the square of carmon he now belonged to the priests the slaves had just dispersed the crowd and there was more room matto gazed around him and his eyes encountered salambo at the first step that he had taken she had risen then as he approached she had involuntarily advanced by degrees to the edge of the terrace and soon all external things were blotted out and she saw only matto silence fell in her soul 
one of those abysses wherein the whole world disappears beneath the pressure of a single thought a memory a look this man who was walking towards her attracted her excepting his eyes he had no appearance of humanity left he was a long perfectly red shape his broken bonds hung down his thighs but they could not be distinguished from the tendons of his wrists which were laid quite bare his mouth remained wide open from his eye sockets there darted flames which seemed to rise up to his hair and the wretch still walked on he reached the foot of the terrace salambo was leaning over the balustrade those frightful eyeballs were scanning her and there rose within her a consciousness of all that he had suffered for her although he was in his death agony she could see him once more kneeling in his tent encircling her waist with his arms and stammering out gentle words she thirsted to feel them and to hear them again she did not want him to die at this moment matho gave a great start she was on the point of shrieking aloud he fell backwards and did not stir again salambo was borne back nearly swooning to her throne by the priests who flocked about her they congratulated her it was her work all clapped their hands and stamped their feet howling her name a man darted upon the corpse although he had no beard he had the cloak of a priest of moloch on his shoulder and in his belt that species of knife which they employed for cutting up the sacred meat and which terminated at the end of the handle in a golden spatula he cleft matho's breast with a single blow then snatched out the heart and laid it upon the spoon and shahabarim uplifting his arm offered it to the sun the sun sank behind the waves his rays fell like long arrows upon the red heart as the beatings diminished the planet sank into the sea and at the last palpitation it disappeared then from the gulf to the lagoon and from the isthmus to the pharos in all the streets on all the houses and on all the temples there was a single shout sometimes it paused to be again renewed the buildings shook with it carthage was convulsed as it were in the spasm of titanic joy and boundless hope narhavas drunk with pride passed his left arm beneath salambo's waist in token of possession and taking a gold patera in his right hand he drank to the genius of carthage salambo rose like her husband with the cup in her hand to drink also she fell down again with her head lying over the back of the throne pale stiff with parted lips and her loosened hair hung to the ground thus died hamilcar's daughter for having touched the mantle of tanith end of chapter fifteen end of salambo by gustave flaubert read by caroline in oslo norway and groningen the netherlands begun in april two thousand twelve and finished on the third of august two thousand thirteen thank you for listening